And welcome to the Theodore Roosevelt Center here on the campus of Dickinson State University. We're so excited you're here. I'm Clay Jenkinson. I'm the host and moderator of our events. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, uh, as my mother would say, give it time. Uh, we're so glad you're here. All the events tomorrow will be here until the evening when we will be back over uh, in May Hall and Stickney Auditorium for this spectacular recreation of sport circa 1905. You're going to love this. Uh, women's basketball game. It just feels like it's in super slow motion. But it's really, really interesting to see the evolution of basketball from the time of Theodore Roosevelt until now. So we're eager to get started tonight. I want to do just two things before I invite the president of the university to come up. First, Mary Massett, would you just come forward with the retirement of our dear, 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 dear friend, Sharon Kilzer. We've had this scramble because Sharon keeps in her head thousands of things that none of us know enough to enumerate. And Mary Massett stepped in and has really taken up the slack for all the extraordinary details that make this thing work. Mary, we so appreciate you. Sharon Kilzer, the great and powerful, uh, has redirected her life in an astonishing and beautiful way, is moving down to the borderlands on the boundary between Texas and Mexico and serving those people in need there. It's one of the most extraordinary revelations I've ever seen, and we're going to miss you so much, but we know that this is going to be a great, great new chapter in your life, and you're going to make even more of a difference there than you have here. So thank you, Sharon Kilzer. We love you. And now, the president of Dickinson State University, Stephen Easton. Oh, it's so good to see you here. Uh, it really, uh, it, it, in so many ways. Uh, uh, I'm also an alum of Dickinson State University, and I am myself uh, a confessed and proud Ted Head. I've, uh, uh, like many of us from southwestern North Dakota, I have been interested in Theodore Roosevelt for a long, long time, and spent about 14 years of these symposia saying, I've got to go next year, uh, but was so busy in life it didn't happen. And then I got here in this, other, in this other realm, and then COVID hit, and then we had two straight um, um, uh, online-only versions. By the way, to our friends uh, who are seeing us online, we, we're, we're, we're very excited that you're, that you're with us in that form too, but it's great to, great to have you back here uh, in, uh, in Dickinson. Uh, it's a really remarkable place. Uh, for those of us that are from this area, it's a remarkable place that we, uh, that we live. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little, a little quick story about uh, uh, a trip I took yesterday. Uh, my uh, friend and former boss, uh, Dr. Richard Skay. Dick, could you stand up and, and, and show, say, say hi to everybody? Uh, so so I, talked, uh, I talked Dick into coming to the seminar last year. Uh, to the symposium last year, uh, and then of course it went online only, and uh, uh, and he was able to talk into talk the airline into some partial refund, and he came this year. And I said, "Your plane's getting in when?" And he said, five o'clock." And I said, "I think if we get lucky, we'll have just enough time to to drive out uh, to the Elkhorn Ranch site." Uh, I I did a quick calculation in my head. Uh, uh, and we did have just enough time. Just about at dusk, we, uh, we got to the parking lot. Then there's a little bit, uh, three-eighths of a half a mile walk. Uh, and when we got to the end of the walk, we got to, uh, to the, uh, the Elkhorn Ranch site. And our new friend, Joe, was there. Joe, can you, can you uh, stand up? Uh, we had never met Joe before. Uh, and Joe's out, uh, and he's camping uh, somewhere, uh, somewhere near there. And we got to talking to Joe. Uh, and, and as my wife says, Steve, it takes you long to get, too long to get to the point. There is a point at the end of this story. Uh, Joe's working on a big, uh, a big Theodore Roosevelt project of his own. Uh, it's a really exciting project. I'll let you talk to Joe about it over the next two days because it's not my story to tell. It's really exciting. Find Joe sometime and, and talk to him. Uh, but he said, uh, and we were sort of getting to know each other. Um, uh, 
And he basically said, uh, you know, did you say you were with Dickinson State? I said, yes. And she said, there's this thing, the Theodore Roosevelt Center there. And I'm on, their, on the website all the time. Uh, I am reading the documents, uh, the digital documents, all the time uh, on his own, who instantly loved me because I had a connection uh, to work that I don't personally do, but I'm very proud of. The Theodore Roosevelt so Symposium is a project of the Theodore Roosevelt Center at Dickinson State University. The Theodore Roosevelt Center, I just want to, before we get on with the program, just want to pause and we should all note what a what an incredible thing it is, the Theodore Roosevelt Center. They took on, a decade and a half or so ago, this amazing project that was unheard of, of an attempt to, uh, and, and uh, Johnson Chair Jeff Wells told me the right words to use, to reunify and annotate, digitally annotate the documents of Theodore Roosevelt to make them available to the world. Uh, and people are out there using it. Uh, those of you online or those of you here that aren't aware of this resource, tonight, go home, Google search Theodore Roosevelt Center, and you will find our site, and you can do research about Roosevelt, and you will very quickly get amazing documents back. That audacious project, let's try to make the documents of an analog president, a pre-digital president, available to the world. That idea is the Theodore Roosevelt Center's idea. There are people out there who have taken that idea now and are talking about doing it for other presidents. Stanford University is talking about doing it for Herbert Hoover, for example, to the tune of, I saw an estimate once, I think it was $48 million that they're going to, uh, that they think they're going to just spend. When something becomes part of our life, it becomes ordinary. That should never become ordinary. Any of you have any connection, and all of you do because you're here, to the Theodore Roosevelt Center, you should be proud of that. That is an amazing thing that the Theodore Roosevelt Center is doing, and uh, 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 it's just very cool. And now that we've noted it, we can move on, uh, move on to our uh, to our program. Uh, I just want to have a quick reminder: at the end of our program today, we're going to have some book signing here, and then you're all invited to come down to the Heritage Foundation down the hill. We'll have a little march so that everybody can find it. It's about a one-block walk downhill uh, for a reception this evening. We hope you'll all, uh, you, all of you will join us. Uh, but uh, to those of you who actually do the work of the Theodore Roosevelt Center, I'm proud of you. We're all proud of you. It's an amazing thing that you do. I'm going to turn it back to Clay. I've been at this now for 20 years, um, until now always with Sharon. And we've had several presidents at this institution, and none of them has been as extraordinarily excited about Theodore Roosevelt as Stephen Easton. We wander into the Badlands together. Now you're taking your innocent guests out there on your own. Um, this is really thrilling, and so we so appreciate your leadership and what you've been able to bring to this project. So 48 million for Herbert Hoover. You know, so if you have 37 million five, we'll take it so we can catch up. <laughs> Uh, our goal is not to stop until we have digitized every scrap of Roosevelt's papers, broadly defined. And it's not just scanning them, it's then processing them and adding metadata and descriptors and making them searchable anywhere on earth at any time of day or night, free. And we then publish them to the world. And if we can finish this in the next decade, and we think we can, or close, then we will be the first comprehensive presidential digital library in the world. How about that? Oh, Dickinson State University. <laughs> you know, um, when a previous president and I went to Harvard to get them to agree to digitize their papers for us, we had a meeting with five or six of their most eminent deans of libraries, and all of them were in $1,000 suits and, and well-trimmed beards. And that president and I walked in and sat there nervously like two people in front of the Wizard of Oz. And they finally said, what brings you here? 
who are you? And Dr. McCallum punched me in the ribs and said, you talk. And so I said, well, we're from Dickinson State University. And they said, and I quote, we haven't heard of that. I said, well, it's in North Dakota. They said, well, we have heard of that. <laughs> and we made our pitch to them, and we went away in ignominy, thinking we had failed utterly and that this would you know, stall out the project. About six weeks later, they wrote us a letter saying, we're going to do it. We're going to digitize all of our Harvard papers for you. We wanted to say no, but we couldn't think of a good enough reason. <laughs> and so that's the kind of cooperation and success we've had, that everyone realizes how important this is. And if ever a president deserved a full-on digitization, it's Theodore Roosevelt, who read a book a day, wrote 40 himself, um, and wrote 155,000 letters that we know of. And the number of things that you can call Rooseveltian goes off in every direction. Um, and at some point, you just have to say, enough. We're immensely proud of what we're doing. And we're glad you're here because your being here helps because we want an outreach arm of all of this. And we've been able to bring the best scholars in the world here including our keynote tonight, to talk about this extraordinary, problematic, gifted, boisterous, sometimes crazy fellow, Theodore Roosevelt. And by the way, to all the people who are picking us up on streaming around the country, including Tweed and students of Long Island University, welcome. We're glad you're here. We wish you were physically here. But we're glad to reach you through this great electronic outreach that we've developed. So I want to welcome Chris O'Brien as our new Director, um, Chris, just please stand up and take a bow. <laughs> just three quick other mentions. Amy McCann is here from the Presidential Library. Valerie Naylor is here, the former superintendent of Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Claudia Berg is here from the State Historical Society of North Dakota. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here. And Joe Wigan is here. The Roosevelt himself is in our midst tonight. So please stand up and say something squeaky. So, all right, so let's get started, shall we? To introduce our um, keynote tonight, uh, one of the things we take joy in is that our, our honors students, we have an extraordinary pride in our honors program, the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Program here, and the students have agreed to do the introductions and to introduce Michael Cullinane is Ronnie Nakota. Ronnie? Welcome, everyone. On behalf of myself, Dickinson State University, and the Theodore Roosevelt Foundation, and Dr. Michael McCullinane, it is a great pleasure that I'm here to introduce Dr. McCullinane. Before I get started with that, I would like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Veronica Nakota, but my fellow colleagues know me as Ronnie. I am a second year here at Dickinson State University, and it is also my second year in the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Program. I have experienced many new ideas of leadership with my time in the program. I have also had many new experiences like today, my very first in-person Theodore Roosevelt Symposium, and getting the opportunity to best interview, introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Michael McCullinane. We want you to listen to a few of his own words. I provided, a, I provided the following questions to Dr. McCullinane, and these were his thoughtful responses. The first set of questions was, why history? Why can people find the value in their own lives from learning more about key figures such as Theodore Roosevelt? Dr. Cullinane explains, it was a high school teacher that encouraged me to interview my grandfather on video, which was then later showed to my class. My grandfather came to the United States from Italy in the 1920s from, through Ellis Island. His father never spoke English and, and resented uh, assimilation. Whereas my grandfather never wanted to speak Italian and joined the war efforts in 1941 in order to become American himself. He lived through the Great Depression and the so-called American century that followed. His life is still, faci still fascinates me, but because in his hindsight many of his views were at that time, and I disagreed with many of them, but I can say how they have developed and took shape, which is in real, real insight into the past. 
To summarize, real value probably starts at home for most people. It did for me anyway. The next set, set of questions is, what, what's a fact about Theodore Roosevelt that speaks to you personally and why? Dr. Cullinan shares, Theodore Roosevelt managed to make friends in, with political foes. My first book is about American anti-imperialism and the, and the fight to limit American power in the world. Roosevelt was the antithesis of this idea. And yet many of the anti-imperialists worked with him on other aspects of public policy. That seemed foreign to us today. Where mentally, where the mentality of politics is them versus us. If we're drawing lessons from Theodore Roosevelt's time, this perhaps is one of the greatest potential, p potential to heal divisions. Let's give a nice warm welcome to Dr. McCullinane. Thank you very much, Ronnie. That was lovely, and uh, uh, thanks for asking such thoughtful questions. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have uh, a student introduce uh, a, a lecture. I think it's, it's wonderful. And, uh, and I'm so pleased to be here, and I hope you'll bear with me for a few more minutes while I thank a few more people. One of the problems with introducing people, and I suspect President Eason will know this, is that no one thanks him. Uh, and yet, uh, President Eason has been at the forefront. One second, Mary. Uh, <laughs> President Eason has been at the forefront of uh, driving a lot of change over the last three years, and uh, well, I'll explain more why, why, why he needs a, a thank you, but maybe we'll give him the, the applause now and I'll, I'll get to that. <laughs> so, in terms of thanks, there's two other people that deserve some thanks, and that's Robin Melanie Walton, who have made a generous donation to DSU, and I know there'll be more, more talk about the Walton's contribution, uh, especially uh, later in the program, but what I want to say is that they've made, they've brought a step change to DSU in terms of historical scholarship, and scholarship more generally, because uh, the TR Center is really interdisciplinary in many ways. So I think that's really important, and, and they are recognizing that education and public engagement are critical to advancing our human knowledge. And, and at this moment, that's really important. The humanities sometimes don't get that attention. And the fact that it's getting it here is, is wonderful, and it should be celebrated. Um, Professor Stacy Cordry is here. Um, Steve Eason is a native. Um, Professor Cordry is not. And she is the best ambassador for DSU. She's the reason why I am here, as well as all of the generosity of other people. Uh, and she, she deserves a major round of thanks as well. <clears throat> and there's the team at the TR Center, and I think many of them have been mentioned already, but I have to give my personal thanks to Chris O'Brien, who has taken over from Sharon Kilsner. And Sharon, you are going to be missed. Um, and Chris, you are a wonderful replacement. Uh, Eric Johnson, uh, Kelly Highland, I don't know where you are, but um, you are incredible. There you are. And William, yeah, William, you as well. I'm going to get to you in a second, actually. But the, the TR Center is an incredible resource. Uh, Professor East, or Dr. Easton has said that already, and everyone else has mentioned it, but I just want to reinforce that point here today. Um, okay, so one, one last thing about the people that are here. Uh, Professor Jeff Wells is back there, and he's joining me as the Johnson Chair here. Uh, two historians, three actually. William Hansard is back there as well. He's also a historian. We have three historians of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, which I'm going to talk about today. So I'm sweating up here, wondering what my colleagues are going to think. <laughs> about my presentation, but I'm delighted to be here with a team of scholars which have expertise in this period. Jeff Wells is a scholar of populism and journalism in the Midwest. William is a scholar of labor and, and the circus, which is a really exciting topic as well, and I'm delighted to be here with them. Right, now on to the presentation. I'm told there's a clicker. Hang on. Okay, I'm, I, so I've been tasked with setting the scene today, which is not normally what I do. Normally I talk about all the research I've been working on, but uh, what I'm going to do is try and set the scene and explain what the Gilded Age and Progressive Era is. And the period of Roosevelt's life fits into that quite neatly. I'm also here to deliver a lot of puns. We're talking about the field of play. I've talked about a team of scholars. Uh, there's going to be a lot of puns. Please forgive me for them now. But just like the rules of a sporting game, the Gilded Age and Progressive Era has boundaries. 
politics, business, society, culture, all of that fits into this period kind of within those white chalk lines of a, of a sports pitch. They mark out the borders, and I've been thinking a lot about this context for a long time now. Recently, I started a podcast. Uh, I'll admit it was largely because I was lonely during the pandemic. We were all there. The four walls of my home office were, were closing in, and I, I wanted to talk to my colleagues, my friends, and meet new people. So to do that, I started a podcast called The Gilded Age and Progressive Era, which asks scholars about their recent research, but also asks them, what is this thing called The Gilded Age and Progressive Era? Does it, if we took the chains out to measure, would it match reality, right? And uh, I'm not sure we've gotten to the bottom of that yet. The Gilded Age and Progressive Era is less studied than the Civil War. It's less, it's less studied than World War II. However, I firmly believe that it is the most transformative moment in American history. Now, I would say that because I'm a scholar of that period. But I'm going to try and convince you today that it is critically important to how we understand our world today. That was the purpose of the podcast, to try and connect the past to the present. It's the purpose, I think, of history in many ways, and there's a big debate raging in, in the world of historians about that that Theodore Roosevelt actually wrote uh, quite a bit about. I should say that historians typically refer to the period, let's see if this works, there we go, the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, uh, largely between the years 1865 and 1920. Some go back to 1860, uh, when the Civil War begins. Some stretch as far as 1929, to when, the, uh, to when Wall Street collapsed and the, the Great uh, Depression occurred. But broadly speaking, this period that's presented on the board there, that is the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. We might quibble about the boundaries, but largely that's, that's, a, that's a consensus. Coincidentally, or interestingly, I suppose, if you add Theodore Roosevelt's lifetime to the span of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, it quite neatly overlaps the broad parameters. He's born in 1858, two years after Charles Darwin write, writes The Origin of Species, and he's dead in 1919 just months before the ink is dry on the Treaty of Versailles. That ends, of course, World War I, officially. And I should clarify that the Gilded Age and Progressive Era is a confusing term, and this might be an opportunity for some questions or some debate about whether this is an appropriate term to use for a period in American history. Gilded and progressive, or is it gilded, or is it two periods? Gilded and progressive, or is it gilded and progressive one period? Well, I'll let you decide, but the term itself was coined by Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner. They wrote a book of the same name that parodied the excesses of the period. Popularly, the idea of a Gilded Age refers to something that's coated in gold, right? So this image up here of someone who is taking gold leaf, applying it to a wood frame, and covering it up so it looks like it's worth more than it is. It's not solid gold, it's just covered in gold. Is that, is that what... Mark Twain and Charles Dudley Warner meant about Gilded Age, uh, gilded, uh, gilded anything? Or did they mean gilded gold? That you actually took gold and put gilding or gold leaf around that, making it doubly uh, valuable and completely excessive. You don't need to gild gold. Turns out it's a Shakespearean term that they were drawing from, from and I can speak to that a little bit more maybe as we go on. But the term itself is complicated. It's not that easy to understand what they meant by gilded. I've gone back to read the book recently. It's not a great book. It's not Twain's best work. Um, and it, it's extremely confusing to understand what they actually meant. And I think that is a great opportunity for us to investigate the period. The Progressive Era, on the other hand, is quite straightforward. It simply refers to a period of reform. And actually, in many ways, that could be any time, because reform is happening always. But it has multiple meanings as well in some ways because reform isn't one type of reform. There's reforms to American democracy in this period, like the direct election of senators, or there's reforms to the way we vote, most notably the, uh, the, that women get the vote in this period, or at the very tail end of this period, at least anyway. And reform also comes in a number of ways like consumer reforms. So there is the Pure Food and Drug Act, or there's corporate reforms, like the implementation and regulation of corporate monopolies. And there's sweeping social reforms, like the advent of settlement houses, which bring people of different communities into the same urban environment, in the same housing area. Or you can think about the, the way that taxation changed America, whether we're thinking about Henry George's single tax movement, or we think about the progressive income tax that eventually does come in and that we're familiar with. Now, I could go on about reform endlessly, and I'm sure that um, everyone in the room will have some idea of 
what reform sticks out in their mind during this period? It's maybe it's women's suffrage, or maybe it's civil rights, or maybe it's the way that these reforms don't really match the reality of today, that either we've come very far or we haven't come far enough uh, in terms of reform. But why separate the terms? The Gilded Age of excess or obfuscation happens alongside the progressive era. They are happening together. And because of that, historians more typically now use those two terms together. Not everyone, and I'm sure there'll be some debate amongst historians how it's used, but more and more I'm talking to historians that say that they use the term as a collective one, gilded and progressive, not two separate terms. And who knows, maybe you might have a better name altogether. I would love to hear them tonight. Uh, the British call this, of course, the Victorian Age, right, uh, because of the monarchy. The French call it the Belle Epoque, or the fin de siècle. The Japanese also have a, a monastic term, uh, which is the, the Meiji Restoration. So the United States is not alone in this period having a name, but maybe there's something global that we could come up with as well. But I wanted to get back to this idea of time, the, the, the very idea of time, actually. The Gilded Age and Progressive Era, what defines it is the shrinking of time and distance much in the same way uh, that we experienced it in the 20th and 21st centuries. So let me explain what I mean by that. For the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, it was the railroads and telegraphy that made shrinking possible. A journey from coast to coast before the 1860s took roughly six weeks. So if you look at the map on the left, that's the rate of railroad travel just after the Civil War. To go from New York to San Francisco roughly took four weeks. If you wanted to go further to Seattle, it would take you six weeks. The one on the right is the dramatic change after the 1880s when there's the transcontinental railway and then there's further development. It takes only six days to get, sorry, three days to get from coast to coast by 1930 and it hasn't changed since. If you want to get from New York to San Francisco, it still takes three days today. So that's a remarkable change and you can man imagine the, the, the revolution that that wrought, that that wrought. And I guess today if we're thinking about things, we might think about air travel. And we might dream about what comes next. How fast can we get to Australia, maybe in 20, 50, 100 years from now? But that change is quite dramatic for the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. <laughs> telegraphy also shrinks the world. The mail, before telegraphy, required a, a human, an individual to deliver mail. The telegraph allows messages to transcend human space and time by way of electricity. Correspondence and news traveled at the speed of light. And it transforms business, politics, and society in much the same way, I would say, that the cell phone or the internet has done in our time today. The revolution that we understand today in our own lives with jet travel or with uh, the internet is very comparable to the life that, and so if you, if you can straddle those ages, if you know what it was like before jet travel and before the iPhone, then you'll know what a revolution this is to time and space in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. There's several other changes that I'll talk about, but beyond travel and communication, the other most important change is mass production. And I think we might take this idea for granted today, or this, this transformation for granted today. In the early 19th century, consumer goods were in short supply. Most food, energy, and other materials, generally speaking, were created in home or localities. The rise of mass production in the factory transforms the country, and not, not only does it lead to the vertical integration of the advent of corporations and factories, it leads to a completely new marketplace as well. And the best example of this that I can give you is the Sears catalog, which is the sort of Amazon of its time, right? Uh, Americans could buy mass-produced goods from any location. Sears offered everything from cradle to grave, literally everything from cradles to graves and tombstones. Eventually, this leads to lines of credit and, uh, and, and other schemes to get buyers, uh, uh, you know, to buy, and it reshapes demand in the country. So we're not just talking about supply here, we're talking about demand and the rise of consumerism as well. And mass production transformed jobs. Factories obviously replace farms, not entirely of course, but people are moving from rural areas to urban areas to, to get jobs in factories. And I think I could probably spend the, the whole, you know, lecture here talking about those changes and how it made uh, a, a revolutionized class and society, uh, urban development, health. Uh, but I hope that some of the other speakers, I think other speakers will talk about how cities changed with sports becoming a, a major feature in cities and how a lot of that stems from this period's growth and development. 
All right, but I'll move on and I'll just talk about internal migration as well and, and migration as well. During this period, millions of, uh, of people moved around the United States, but also many people, many millions of people moved to the United States. We might think about the first wave of immigration in the early 19th century. Uh, uh, it's a smaller wave than the second wave, but we're talking about Irish and Germans and Swedes coming to the United States and moving to places like North Dakota eventually, right? The second wave is larger and it, it, it includes Southern and Eastern Europeans, Italians, Poles, uh, Russian Jews, and also Mexicans as well. The United States is demographically changing during this period, and it's closing its doors to some people as well. The Chinese are excluded almost entirely, and the Japanese are being excluded uh, largely based on class, I would argue. These decisions on who to let in and who to exclude derive from racial ideologies that would forever transform the demographics of our country. And ideas about who is an American became a vicious issue by the end of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era that culminated in the end of unregulated migration to the United States, or immigration, I should say. And race relations uh, are not a matter for immigrants only. African Americans endure the Jim Crow laws that disenfranchise voters and segregated society in this period. The very idea of separate but equal comes about in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era when the Supreme Court allowed New Orleans to segregate its streetcar uh, trolleys in 1896. And also lynching becomes common practice, not only in the South, but in many Northern cities as well. Although it, the South is, there's much more in the South. Um, and if we think about the geography of the United States at this time as well, it is changing dramatically. Literally, the states are changing dramatically. What is the United States? Well, if we think about it in 1861, there are 23 states in the Union. By the time Grant is president, there are 33 states. And by the time Roosevelt is president, there are 45. There is also a growing list of territories in the United States that are, as one Supreme Court justice said, domestic in a foreign sense. These include places like Alaska, Hawaii, Oklahoma, Arizona, and New Mexico, all of which would become states. And it also includes places like Washington, D.C., and territories in the Caribbean and Pacific, like the Guano Islands and Samoa. And it also includes conquered territories as well, places like the Philippines, Guam, Puerto Rico. The United States, any way you measure it by this time, looks like a colonial empire. Now, why go over this history that I suspect many of you will, will know or, 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 or have some idea of to a greater or lesser extent? I think it tees up Theodore Roosevelt's idea of a strenuous life. In his 1899 eponymous speech, Roosevelt preached about strife, toil, work, labor, danger, hardship. He makes the speech in Chicago. Now, if any city in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era knew about those things, it was Chicago. The city was made by industrialization. It was created by the railroads and settlement houses, by urban sprawl, immigration, and activism. Chicago also knew about unrest and about violence, about empire, poverty, about duty and thrift. Sport offers a metaphor for Roosevelt. To strive for an end in sport demonstrates the strenuous life. A strong performance on the pitch or in the court or in the ring symbolized the American spirit and exhibited one's willingness to struggle for an end. As Roosevelt says in the speech, if we're worth our salt, we will be glad of the chance to do it. Struggle was made for the sake of being in the arena, to quote an oft-quoted uh, speech of Roosevelt's. But in sport, we might say it's for the love of the game. It's no wonder why we see stars like LeBron James write man in the arena on his sneakers, or Tom Brady names his uh, documentary, his retrospective documentary, in the arena. Or why, I don't know if you saw recently, but Jordan Spieth, when he was announcing his comeback to golf, uh, put a promotional video out there where he quotes verbatim much of that speech that Roosevelt makes about the man in the arena. And while I say that sport's a metaphor for life, it was also a real tangible part of Roosevelt's existence, at least some sports were anyway. And I hope we'll hear later on about those sports that TR doesn't like, like baseball, he's not crazy about. Uh, and he's not, he's not crazy about golf either. In fact, he tells Taft, he, you know, he shouldn't be playing golf on the campaign trail. Um, TR's favorite sport was tennis, and I was delighted to see out in the, the, the hall that there's a picture of the tennis court. I'm going to share one, but the one in the hall is far better, so I would encourage you to take a look at that later on. TR doesn't play tennis like Rafael Nadal. He doesn't, he doesn't glide across a clay court like a swan, not at all. 
He plays like a rhino, and he charges at his prey. And just like a rhino, and just like TR, they couldn't see very well. So they often run into things. Rhinos are known for running into trees and, and rocks. TR would run into doubles partners, and sometimes the net. He didn't play with skill. He played with enthusiasm. And I think that says a great deal about how he approached life. Athleticism equaled enthusiasm. Sport was for the sake of it, and winning was nice, but it hardly mattered as much as exercise. Now, to round the bases and bring this full circle, how did sport and the idea of strenuosity lead to the political reformation that we call the Progressive Era? How did Roosevelt bring reform to the excesses of the Gilded Age? Well, he surrounded himself with men that would do this for him, and they were, I'm sorry to say, all men. Uh, they all had the, the same enthusiasm for sport and reform as TR did. Let me begin at the end of his administration. So you, you may have seen this photo before. It's a picture of the last day that TR is in office, March 3rd, 1909. And on his last day, he invites, I think it's roughly 35 of his sporting chums to come to the White House and have lunch. Each man played sport in some way with Roosevelt. Not all of them can make it. So sadly, there's a few that aren't in this picture. But each of these men also tackled some part of the president's political agenda as well. It wasn't just all about sport. This is his so-called tennis cabinet. In the summer of 1902, the White House underwent a complete restoration, or complete renovation, I should say, uh, which was the first time in more than a generation that the White House undertook this uh, redesign. It created the West Wing, which is pictured there on the left. The West Wing was the first time that the president had a distinct working space that also brought in other elements of, uh, of the office of the president. So the cabinet office, for example, is right next to the, the president's office. The president's office, in, the, in this West Wing anyway, is not the Oval Office. It's a, quite, it's a modest room. It's about 15 by 15 feet. And all it has in it is the president's desk, a library, a chair. It's very modest. It's not what we would associate today with the Oval Office. It's pretty nice. It's got high windows and a fireplace. It's not, you know, you, you, you would like it as your office, but it's not that grand uh, oval office that we think of. Roosevelt could easily access the cabinet office just next to the, his office. There was two sliding doors and he could enter the cabinet office uh, to meet largely secretaries and Congress people there. And in the afternoons, Roosevelt spoke with the press for about an hour. And of course, having the press core in the West Wing, that was the first time that that had ever happened. So he's circulated largely around these three rooms until the tennis court. The tennis court was put there by Edith because she wanted her husband to get exercise and not just spend the whole day working. The tennis court became a really important place for business, though. Invitations went out to those that the president found interesting, and guests found that repeat invitations only went to those that played with the same enthusiasm that he had. One visitor remembered that the president played all the faster when rain set in. He insisted that he could get just as much exercise playing water tennis as he could playing water polo. And, and this again speaks to that, the idea that enthusiasm and exercise, that's the ultimate object of the game. So there was no use in stopping. Just keep going. Just play a different game. If it's raining, if it's snowing, whatever it is, just keep going. And when they played tennis, they played six sets. So if you're familiar with the modern game, men play five sets. And the women's game, they played three sets. The tennis court played six sets. So they were often out there for two and a half, sometimes three hours playing tennis. And it was almost always doubles. Everyone admitted fatigue after the game was over. And those that sustained wounds on the tennis court or in Rock Creek Park or horse riding, were, uh, they won the president's admiration. Now, you might see this in the picture here, but you can also see it in the picture out in the hall, and it is fantastic. The one in the hall, you can see that there's a 20-foot high tarpaulin that prevented prying eyes and allowed players to only glimpse very little bit of the outside world. You could barely see the Washington Monument uh, from this, this tarpaulin. And the site did remind visitors that exercise was only part of the engagement. Roosevelt never allowed photos of the game, never allowed anyone to photograph him in a tennis costume. He believed the pub public would misconstrue the game as frivolity. But actually, the tennis court had a political purpose, and it was important to the administration as well. After the match, the players took tea in the president's office. And the moment Roosevelt finished his tea, one regular said that the president then began, began dictating letters. 
And then everyone noisily discussed whatever letter was being, uh, was being written. And it was the problems of the day being aired in an informal manner. The tennis court became a political forum and players had unique access to the chief executive. Now, on average, the players were roughly the same age as TR, but you'll remember TR was the youngest uh, American president. He was, when he took office, only 41. By the time the tennis court is there, he's 42. The average age of the players are 41 at the start. Some as young as 26, uh, some in their late 50s. I don't remember exactly, but most of them fall in around that late 30s, early 40s age. Now, let's compare that to William McKinley, who's 20 years older and took up gardening when he lived in the White House. What I'd like to do today is talk about one group within the tennis cabinet. So this is part of a wider project that I'm working on. I cluster the 35 uh, uh, members of this cabinet into five groups. There's diplomats, there's the green team, there's lawyers, there's special agents, and there's wonks. And today I'm going to talk about the wonks. I've purposely picked this group. You may have heard of Gifford Pinchot. You may have heard of Henry Stimson. They're in that picture as well. But I wanted to talk to you about people that you haven't heard of that you should have heard of uh, because they are really important. And we're going we're gonna to look at uh, five gentlemen that transformed the way the administration operated. Starting from left to right in the red circles is Lawrence O. Murray. Uh, then there is uh, Herbert Knox Smith. The gentleman just behind Roosevelt is James R. Garfield. The next one is uh, Charles Patrick Neal, and the third is James Bronson Reynolds. I suspect you haven't heard any of them except for James R. Garfield, whose name bears a resemblance to an assassinated president. That's his son, actually. Um, but most of those people you may not have heard of, and you should. So let's do a quick biography of each of them. James Garfield, as I mentioned, is the son of the assassinated president. He was there on the day that his father was shot. He was there comforting his father the day that he died. He's a lawyer, and he'll later be the Secretary of the Interior in Roosevelt's administration, but he's so much more than that. He's the first commissioner of the Bureau of Corporations. That is the forerunner of the Federal Trade Commission, and it is the first time that a bureau exists to, to take on corporate regulation and anti-monopoly lawsuits. It's Garfield that takes down Standard Oil, and he initiates the antitrust suits against many other companies. And Garfield was so adept at this that he, and, and, and learned on the job. His first, his first uh, attempt at regulating the meat industry was a complete failure, but he learned his lessons and then took on Standard Oil. And he had set his bureau up for success uh, by getting Herbert Knox Smith, this gentleman, uh, in the succession plan. So when he moves off to the Department of the Interior later on, Herbert Knox Smith comes in to take his place. He's another regular as well at the tennis court, and he takes over and continues to pursue anti-competitive corporation. Most weeks, these two uh, would spend about two hours uh, at the White House playing tennis, two hours a week, that is. Uh, and, and then they did many treks through Rock Creek Park or horse riding. Uh, during these adventures, they talk shop with Roosevelt. They develop bonds of affection and trust, which are intense in the diaries if you read them. And I would love any questions about any of these individuals. I'm not doing any of them justice by saying that they did this one thing. They did so many things during uh, the administration. I'm cutting it short to say that Garfield and Knox are just corporate regulators, but that's the most important thing that they do for Roosevelt. Others don't take to the tennis court as easily, and I have to thank Ryan Swanson for, uh, for sending me on some research that he had done on his book called The Strenuous Life, which includes uh, a story from Lawrence O'Murray and his first trip to the tennis court, which was not a pleasant one. He's a rather cantankerous per person, actually, as I found out, Lawrence O'Murray, uh, and he found himself embarrassed when he goes to Washington to play tennis with uh, Roosevelt because he was completely unprepared. When it starts raining, he, the, the president says, let's go for a walk in Rock Creek Park, and Murray cannot keep up. He loses a shoe, I think, and he's a mile behind, and he, he finally gets back to the White House, and, and Roosevelt's not really impressed. But he vowed after that moment never to fall short of Roosevelt's expectations uh, again, and he hires a personal trainer. Just think about that. The Gilded Age of Progressive Era, and you hire a personal trainer. Uh, I don't think that happened very frequently, but he builds his body in, in a way that Roosevelt might have said, I built my body, and he comes back again and again to the tennis court, and then he becomes quite a vigorous player. He also becomes one of the most influential and understudied bureaucratic revolutionaries in our nation's history. As a leading member of the Keep Commission, he investigated government waste and brought reforms to accounting, procurement, 
pensions, and structural organization. And I know everyone is like, ooh, <laughs> this sounds amazing. Tell me more about bureaucratic revolutions. Um, I know, it's not sexy, but um, it's transformative. And Roosevelt knows that this is, what he is doing is absolutely transformative. He's the best example in Roosevelt's administration of efficiency and modernization. And the period is known for the efficiency movement and modernization. After, uh, if we think about the Keep Commission as well, you may not know what the Keep Commission is, but it's designed to restructure American government. Every administration after Roosevelt's relies on the Keep Commission to restructure the government. In fact, the 9-11 Commission quotes the Keep Commission. So it's critically important to our nation's history. Charles Patrick Neal and James Bronson Reynolds, two figures that we have forgotten, and the, they're both pictured here. Neal is pictured on top. He's the commissioner for the Bureau of Labor before it becomes a distinct department in the cabinet. And he manages statistics that allow Roosevelt to make decisions about issues of the day, mainly around capital versus labor, but he's so much more than that as well. Reynolds, on the bottom there, is a New York settlement leader who joins forces with Neal to write a scathing report about Chicago meat packing houses. So you might know about um, Upton Sinclair and the jungle. Uh, Roosevelt doesn't entirely believe Upton Sinclair. Uh, Sinclair is a socialist, and Roosevelt sends two investigators to make sure that it's on the up and up. And that's Bronson. Uh, James Ronson Reynolds and Charles Patrick Neal. They go to Chicago. They find pig carcasses going into latrines. They find uh, uh, no sinks in, in abattoirs. And they report back to Roosevelt. And that's what leads to the Meat Inspection Act. So obviously critically important for consumer regulation. What follows is the Pure Food and Drug Act. When these two aren't playing tennis, they advise Roosevelt on all manner of other issues as well. Immigration, federal employment law, labor conditions in Panama. How is it that we don't know these men? Even the historians among us, I suspect, don't, and even historians of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, I'm looking at Jeff back there, and he's shaking his head, which is good, it means I'm onto something. Um, historians of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era don't know these people, and they should. Lawrence O. Murray alone, he's so obscure that his papers at the, at the office of the Comptroller of the Currency have never been accessed. This guy has been dead for 90 years and his papers haven't been accessed by researchers. I suspect that none of you know that we have an office of the Comptroller of the Currency, but we do. That's a thing. I don't know what it does either, so don't ask in the, in the questions. Now, the reason why I speculate why we don't know who these people are is because the office of the presidency overshadows all others. Journalist Nicholas Lehman, Lehman who was writing in The New Yorker, once said, that among the cruelties of popular political history is that almost everyone below the level of president winds up being forgotten. Now, I think that's an overstatement. We remember secretaries of state, and we remember presidential advisors, but we, we remember a few people in an administration, not all of them. And I think that with TR, his personality or celebrity is so huge that he's like a vacuum. He sucks all of the air out of the room, and we think about Roosevelt, and we don't think about the other people in the room. It's so loomingly immense that those people that are the closest to him during his administration, those that played tennis with him on a regular basis, that were in the White House daily, never got credit for their amazing achievements. And these are not faceless and nameless bureaucrats. They're charismatic personalities, big ideas. They have huge ideas about how to transform the United States. And they have the same energy and boundless enthusiasm as Theodore Roosevelt. And success hinged on athleticism. It hinged on going to the tennis court or going to the park or riding horses. That's what gave them access to the White House. These are the architects of the progressive era. They made reforms to government work, to economic regulation, conservation of natural resources, civil rights, Native American allotments, foreign policy, the armed forces, global trade, and American democracy. We let the aura of Theodore Roosevelt obscure them. Now, for some of the tennis court members, the reforms roll on after he leaves the White House. So I mentioned Henry Stimson. He's part of this group. You may know Henry Stimson is the architect of the American century. He's Taft's Secretary of War. He's the Secretary of State under Hoover. He'll be Secretary of War again under Franklin Roosevelt. Um, so he's there. He continues his work. And others as well, like the French ambassador, Jules Jusserand, who's pictured in, in here as well, he stays in Washington for many years to come. In fact, until he dies, I think, in around 1933. But others left politics after the access dried up to the White House. The tennis court lasts only six years. It's gone after Roosevelt. 
Uh, Taft, as I said, was a golfer, and he disliked tennis, so he just simply had the court removed. It was gone after Roosevelt left. And TR's friends, like James Garfield, or the conservationist Gifford Pinchot, they also uh, begin to wither after Roosevelt's departure. Um, Taft refused to give them access the way that Roosevelt had, and so the, the tennis cabinet is a rather short-lived thing. But within those six years, I would argue, the burst of strenuous activity, of sport, of enthusiasm and exuberance in the White House about what could be the prospect for America, the reforms that could be wrought, absolutely reshaped this country. Thank you. So, so interesting. Thanks for starting. So a couple of quick questions. I know the audience has questions for you too, but I just want to start with Henry Stimson. What an extraordinary human being that was. So in World War II, for example, he saved Kyoto. Uh, one of the targets for the atomic bomb was Kyoto. He had had a relationship with somebody who had been there, and he said, we're not going to bomb the most Christian city in Japan, and he saved it. And he was reluctant on atomic warfare altogether. He spans the whole century until almost, um, well, until Dwight Eisenhower. He doesn't sound to me like a strenuous man. So what happened to the advisors to Roosevelt who just didn't get on board with this strenuosity? Were they excluded? Were they marginalized? What happens? So that's a great question. There's, there's many people you'll, you might know from the, the administration that aren't pictured there. Elihu Root's not there, other secretaries from other departments, although there's not a lot of secretaries from departments there because they're political jobs. Some of these men are political. Stimson is. He ran for governor, uh, and, and he, you know, he was a district attorney before he comes to Roosevelt in, in the tennis cabinet. But these are sort of the, the, the next level below the secretaries. So there, you know, there's a postmaster general in there, but there's not a secretary of state or a secretary of war. Uh, these, are, these are young men that are getting their start in their career. In fact, another really good example of a man who's very similar to Stimson is William Phillips who you may or may not know, but was a really important figure in American foreign policy and diplomacy. He's the youngest member of the tennis cabinet. He's 26 years old, and uh, he goes on to reshape the State Department in 1909. And uh, so these, these th there are other people that are important, that are shaping policy, no question. But the wellspring of a lot of these ideas are coming from the tennis cabinet. Uh, the execution of those ideas is often coming from the secretaries or undersecretaries and, and the sort of official uh, jobs that are then, you know, Senate approved. These are not, most of these are not Senate approved jobs. They're really informal advisors. So in many senses, they're second tier people and they're young and ambitious. And, but, you know, you mentioned um, Murray mm -hmm. and Jusserand who both probably would have preferred not to be strenuous, but they determined to keep up with him and they were able to do it and they impressed him. There must have been people who were determined to do this who just didn't have the right stuff. So there's loads of stories, and I'm, I'm sure Ryan has read some of them because he shared that Murray story. Right. But th there are lots of stories like that where uh, people don't keep up with Roosevelt. They fall behind, and they don't get invited back. There's actually one person in the tennis cabinet that Roosevelt didn't like, but he was physically phenomenal. George Washington Woodruff, who was Gifford Pinchot's right-hand man. He was a lawyer for the, uh, for the, the, uh, the, uh, the Forest Service. Uh, and... Roosevelt disliked him. They met him and he said, I really don't like this guy. He said something out of turn and insulted Roosevelt somehow, but he kept on coming back because he was a former football player who coached UPenn and, uh, and was in phenomenal shape. So he could play tennis like no one else in the tennis cabinet. So there was, and, and also he was on board with the ideas that Pinchot had. So you didn't have to be, you know, Roosevelt's best friend. You had to have big ideas and you had to be fit. So you've written two previous books books on Roosevelt, mainly Theodore Roosevelt's Ghost, this extraordinary book on the legacy and how Roosevelt's place in American memory has evolved over time. You're writing a book on the tennis cabinet now. So this is part of why you, you chose this topic. I want to back you up a little bit. So our theme is the athlete in the arena, Roosevelt's role in the development of American sport. So what is that role exactly? And one quick question is how much did the public know we know all these things about him. Mm. How much did the public know about this sort of club and the strenuous testing of these people? 
I think Roosevelt writes at the end of his administration, I don't think anyone will know how important the tennis cabinet was to my administration. So they don't know. And the tarpaulin is a really good way of thinking about that metaphorically and literally, that there's this 20-foot high um, you know, obstruction that doesn't let you see. And there's no photographs. I mean, there's tons of photographs of Roosevelt, right? But there's none of him playing his favorite sport. So I'll leave the others that are going to speak about you know, how Roosevelt developed other sports. But in terms of obscuring the relationship that it has with politics, I think that's, that's the best example I can give you. So Roosevelt is known as a cowboy. I mean, that metaphor really played out for the rest of his life as a rough rider. He's known as a horseman. Does the public know that he boxes in the White House, that he does jiu-jitsu in the White House, that he does stick fighting in the White House? How much of this is general knowledge and how much of this is an inner world that we know because you're a historian? And because he wanted the world to know that too. Right. So it's partly because you, you can find that stuff easily. He did want people to know that he boxed because it was masculine and, he, and wrestle and you know, bring sumo wrestlers into the White House and that sort of thing. But this doesn't, this doesn't speak to masculinity. It's not the public image that he wanted to promote. And so that's part of him building his own legacy. Um, and, and part of it is knowing his audience, I suppose, being a politician. I mean, you and I have talked about this a little bit before. TR, as Elihu Root said in his eulogy, he was a preacher, first and foremost. So if it played with the public, then he was going to do that. And the things that happened behind closed doors, of which we know as historians, digging into the archives and understanding what Theodore Roosevelt was all about, is somewhat different. I mean, one last question, then I'll turn to the audience. But I know we're talking about Roosevelt and philosophy. So one way of looking at this is that Roosevelt was just a really active, strenuous guy who loved sport, and he made everyone around him conform. And there is that side to it. But not to get in the way of, of Simon Cordery's talk, but this was an era of urbanization. Uh, the frontier was officially declared closed. There was widespread anxiety about what this meant for the American character. So was Roosevelt self-consciously pursuing the strenuous life as an antidote to what he took to be the effeminization of the American population and so on? Well, I think you said that better than I could say it. Yeah, I, what I would agree with you, and I think Simon will probably speak to some of that, but the idea of strenuosity and, and duty, uh, dare I say, is also uh, part and parcel of his entire life. So you can read that in early speeches, you can read it in The Strenuous Life, or, or you can read it in The Man in the Arena when it's 1910 and he's, he's out of the presidency. The idea of over-civilization is an idea that, um, that we had become, that we had lost our energy or our vigor, or that we could, even if we hadn't, that we could lose our energy and our vigor as a, an individual or as a nation was part and parcel of Roosevelt's idea about evolution, uh, about uh, nationhood and civilization. It's, it's part of his foreign policy as well as his domestic policy. I guess just one last bit. Did, did Edith turn him on to tennis or did he already like tennis and Edith gave him a court? Oh, that's a good idea. I, I, that's a good question. I don't know. Because, you know, tennis then wasn't what tennis is now. Oh. It's a little bit like lawn tennis or badminton then. It wasn't the heroic thing we see today. Just off the top of your head, you might have thought that Roosevelt would despise tennis as a sissy sport the way he despised golf. But he didn't. As you said, he, he, he was a violent tennis player, <laughs> uh, not particularly a graceful one. But you would he might have condemned tennis, and he didn't. He got right into it. So the best story I have about TR playing tennis is the surprise of a young boy playing tennis with him. So this is one of Kermit's friends, a guy called Barkley Farr, uh, whose sister is actually a really important uh, uh, person in, in American history. But uh, Barkley is a teenager, and he goes to the White House uh, to visit Kermit, and he gets roped into playing a tennis game, and he's, he's, he's paired with Roosevelt. He's, he's paired with the president. And so he's got to serve, and Roosevelt is ducking down in doubles. You know, you duck down so that the other player can serve. And, and Barkley's losing it because he's thinking, I'm going to hit the president with the ball. And so he just keeps on, he keeps on faulting, you know? And the president yells at him, and, you know, then they switch, and the president nearly runs into him. But he left that, you know, obviously feeling quite close to Roosevelt because he nearly got run over by him, but also feeling like uh, that he had learned something about the character of the man as well. And he talks about it throughout his life, actually, that that sort of was an a, a inspirational moment for him. Don't hold back. Don't hold back. And the point that Ryan makes in his terrific book is that Ethel, the daughter, was a terrific tennis player and was often a better tennis player than some of the men that she played. Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah.
Perhaps. And 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 so all, all of these men are differing uh, differing levels of you know, and some of them some of them don't play tennis that often. Like Seth Bullock is in that picture. He doesn't play tennis. Well, which really. one is Seth? Uh, you can't miss the mustache. He's three in from Roosevelt on the right. Yeah. Excellent. And Question, questions for our scholar Michael Cullinane. <laughs> yes, here. Uh, please, there's uh, another man sixth in from the right. William Sewell, down from the north woods of Maine. Yep, yep. And uh, all the way on the left, we know of what occurred on this day and how Seth Bullock teared up and when he pulled the flowers away from the eight Minister Proctor statue of the Panther below. All the way to the left, Archibald Buck from the University of the South, also known as Suwannee, uh, died on the Titanic April 15, 1912. Uh, can you speak just quickly to the 50-mile uh, uh, ride to Warrington and the 50-mile ride back on which Archibald Button, Admiral Rixey, accompanied the president in a blizzard and an ice storm? Probably not as eloquently as you can, but, uh, <laughs> but what, I, what I will say about both of those characters is, uh, so Seth Bullock first, um, you're right, he wells up. He's, he's actually tasked with gifting that cougar or puma, we're not entirely sure what it is, a cat of some sort, uh, to Roosevelt. He tears up and he, he, can't, he can't give it to him. So someone else, I think Juceron in the end, presents the, the... So it was an emotional moment. And it wasn't the only moment where all of these, or nearly all of these men met up that day. They went to, uh, later on, they went to uh, Garfield's uh, house in Washington. And there's a model of the tennis court there. Uh, that they, and they, Roosevelt can't come because it's the end of his presidency. But the rest of the tennis cabinet go and meet there. Archie Butt is interesting because he's really the social secretary for Roosevelt towards the end of, uh, end of his term. And so he does, along with the, the man standing on the far right, William Loeb, who Edith used to call William Loeb, um, he was the secretary for Roosevelt. And the two men on the extremes of this picture are basically Roosevelt's uh, social secretaries. And they, they're the only, Roosevelt said, they're the only two that could keep up with me. And they didn't play tennis that frequently, um, but they were able to keep up dictating letters and organizing Roosevelt, which was a task in itself, a sport in itself. Yeah, and, and Archie Butt is a tragic figure twice because he was gallant on the Titanic um, then went down and died with it, but he also was caught between Taft and Roosevelt and felt deep loyalty to both, and it tore him apart to see the two of them at odds with each other. Uh, so, and Seth Bullock is sort of the Forrest Gump of this time. I just read today, because I'm looking at the funeral of Edward VII, which TR attended on behalf of Taft, Seth Bullock was there. Yeah. Seth Bullock turns up in London for the funeral of Edward VII. That's a long way from Deadwood. <laughs> I don't know why Roosevelt wanted him there, but he insisted about, on having Seth Bullock there. And Bullock plays an interesting role here. So he's one of the he's one of the Greens. I class him as a conservationist, which he is. He's largely on board with Roosevelt's plans. But in this period, why he's important is he's arguing to Roosevelt about how to get rid of the, this pest in the Black Hills. There's a, a, a beetle that bores into trees and leaves a blue path destroying the timber. Uh, and the, the forest rangers couldn't figure out how to get rid of this. And Bullock uh, begins to, he's a, he, at that time, he is the superintendent of the Black Hills Forest. And he, he figures out a way to stop the infestation, mainly by stripping the bark off the trees. So that's, that's the role that he plays there. He doesn't frequently go. Uh, to play tennis, but he's he's part of that club. Other questions here? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your inside revelation. But it's interesting when you say you don't know on some of these questions. Who in the devil would try to know why on a wedding in date or an anniversary he would climb the Matterhorn? Yeah, so he climbed the Matterhorn on his uh, honeymoon. Do you have any explanation for that except um, it was possible? I mean, he does lots of things. His wife is sick, and he goes off to war. You know, he, he said he would have left her deathbed to right. go off to Cuba. I mean, there's, you know, there's, uh, this is, uh, this is a man that's got a determination that I can't understand because myself. Yeah. But the other thing, the photo, there were no photographs of that, or uh, I'm not sure if there were yeah. in boxing. We don't have a boxing photo. We have him in boxing attire, but but not wearing gloves. Or in the screen up, so they don't see him in stylish. So, so as to the 
to the Matterhorn, it's also the case that he was one of the first 20 people ever to climb it. The age of mountaineering was just beginning, and so it's even more astonishing that he climbed it on his honeymoon when it wasn't a routine thing the way it would be in our own time. I mean, clearly he was testing himself constantly through his life, pushing himself, um, taking his father's challenge seriously, my son, you must make your body, and it mattered to him in every possible way to prove that he, was, that he had the right stuff. Yes, but let's take this with a grain of salt, too. Theodore Roosevelt also dies at 60. He has immense health problems as a result of pushing himself this far, whether it's in Brazil, you know, or, or getting malaria twice, or, you know, there's, there's, there's lessons to take from this, that, you know, duty and strife and toil and labor are important if we want to accomplish anything. But we also don't want to take that to the extreme either, which in some ways we can see that Theodore Roosevelt does. So I think this is, this is a good example of, of, you know, learning lessons from the past, both uh, as what to do and what to avoid. But if he were here, and in some sense he is, uh, he would punch you in the snout. I mean, if you gave him the choice, you can live to be 90 and take it easy, or you can live to be 60 and lead a crazy, reckless, heroic life. There's no question in his mind. Would you cheer if Theodore Roosevelt punched me in the nose right now? I would, I would hope we've gotten beyond that. I would hope that someone would get up and tackle Theodore Roosevelt if he punched me in the nose. Joe? Uh, yeah. I won't take the bait, but <laughs> I believe I've read that Theodore Roosevelt explained in a letter that the reason he climbed the Matterhorn was because at the hotel they were staying at, there were some English chaps who had climbed the mountain the day before. Right. And he wanted to show that a Yank could climb just as well as they could. Absolutely. Um, could you speak to the use of sport and the presidency? Some fellow coined the phrase the bully pulpit. Um, as sport as a, as a way to communicate to the American people, I'm thinking of hosting John L. Sullivan at the White House for a quasi-exhibition of boxing because Sullivan had become, uh, uh, he went drop, he went sober. And secondly, never to have thrown out a first pitch, we really do credit Archibald Butt with getting tapped to do that for the Washington Senators. But what about hosting, for example, the Cleveland Nats, the Washington Senators, the New York Highlanders, the White House, hosting the, the championship teams. Do we know, did that originate under Roosevelt? I don't. Showcasing, Showcasing at, uh, successful, successful athletes, athletes and teams in the White, White House. House. I mean, he certainly showcases athletes um, by promoting them and promoting their sports. I can't speak to the, you know, to, to how far and vast or what specifics around what sports. I mean, we know that he didn't like baseball, but and that he supported reforms in football. I mean, those things I, I can tell you, but I know we've got three. Ryan in the morning. We've yeah. got three other scholars that are going to tell us much more, and I'm I'm hoping to learn a lot from that. Answer some of those questions that I, I just don't know. Let's do a few more. Yes. Uh, yes, please. Yes, you. To what extent was he setting precedents for presidents exhibiting sportingness? I, I think he's probably the reason why we call him our first modern president. There's a lot of reasons, but one of them is because he uses the press to his advantage. So he's conscious. Just the reasons why he's not showing himself playing tennis is the same reason why he allows photos taken of him climbing rocks in Rock Creek Park. Um, so he's conscious of that. Just are all of the others. It's why Boris Johnson running is really awkward to watch. So he just, you know, he hops out of a car and then he runs like, you know, two feet to the front door. You know, the press are there to capture that. And he looks like a buffoon. Um, Roosevelt was manufacturing that. Ronald Reagan was, you know, George Bush. The reason why he only showed some of his mountain biking was because some of it was incredibly dangerous. And if you had seen it as a, as a citizen, you would have thought, uh, well, is my president going to die on a mountain bike trail? Um, so a lot of this is manufactured. And I think TR is the first modern president not to harness public opinion, but to start to, to manage it in a, in a contemporary way, or one that we're, so we can think of today in our own time. But even more than that, he became the first cowboy president. And he was a cowboy, I mean, a genuine cowboy in a certain sense. And then we have Ronald Reagan self-consciously following in that mold. Mm -hmm. G.W. Bush clearing a little brush down in Texas. Mm. 
Um, we have LBJ doing much the same thing, and, and they all figured out that being a cowboy president works. So her question is sort of, did Roosevelt think of this as a way to connect more broadly than in his political focus? Oh, absolutely, and it is the same as that. I mean, it's, it's the reason why presidents talk about growing up in log cabins, is that it creates an image of, of, of them being relatable, uh, of them being strenuous in this case. So it's all wrapped up in the public image, yeah. Couple more questions. Yes, here. Yes, please. Did sport to any degree have any relationship with uh, Congress and his relationship with the members of Congress with that branch of government? Sport and Congress, tennis and congressmen. I don't know if any Congress people were invited to play tennis. And I don't think there's any, there are no Congress people in that photo. So. It's a different kind of combat sport, the executive and legislative battles, but I don't think it's a sporting one, or at least to my knowledge. I'd have to check that if I'm honest. But there were non-government types in the tennis cabinet, Owen Wister. I mean, there were some that were kind of honorary members. Owen Wister's not really part of the tennis. He's, he's, you know, intellectually, Roosevelt and Wister, they're speaking about all manner of things, but he's not playing tennis with them, and he's not invited. Owen Wister's not invited to this party. You know, so when Roosevelt, at the end of his term, I think that's why it's important. This is where the research began, is why are these 30 people, most of which I don't know, why are they the ones that are invited to lunch? Why isn't Wister there? Why isn't Elihu Root invited to lunch? Why is it these 30? And he says, after he leaves the White House, I don't think anyone will know how important these people are. And, and they haven't been looked at yet. Last chance. Yes, in the back. Um, you talk about the Tennis Cabinet's relationship to Roosevelt. Was there any cross-pollination between the other members of the Tennis Cabinet within themselves? Did the Wonks talk, talk to the Greens? Yeah, yeah, when, when, when they, they worked with TR, TR, were they cross-pollinating? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's, there's kind of leaders amongst this group as well that are really tight. So the three leaders that I would point out are James R. Garfield, uh, Gifford Pinchot, who I didn't speak of, and Jules Jusseron. Jusseron becomes the dean of the diplomatic corps after uh, Julian Ponsfort dies, and you know the English sort of, they're, they're no longer the center of gravity in Washington, DC. It moves up to Adams Morgan, where the French are. Um, Gifford Pinchot and James Garfield used to wake up in the morning, walk out of their houses, find each other, walk to work together, uh, either at the executive office or nearby, and uh, then they would go together and play tennis with, with the president. They were constantly talking, constantly scheming about what could be done to make, uh, to make reforms, the things that they wanted to see reformed. And there's others too. There's other clubs that are involved. The Cosmos Club in, in Washington, D.C. is a a fertile ground for ideas that uh, Pinchot is found at, and many of these other people as well. James Bronson Reynolds in the New York clubs as well. There's uh, another guy up there called uh, Francis Ellington Layup or Loop, or we're not sure. Loop. Sh Loop. Uh, he, he's a New Yorker, and there's other New Yorkers that are meeting in New York when they're not in Washington. So there is a lot of things that are going on amongst these individuals that are helping them lead to uh, decisions made at the White House. Let's do one more question. Yes. I, I don't think people will know how important the tennis cap was. Do you think that was a regret? Do you think he wished he had let people know? Did he, he wish, wish that more people knew about the tennis cap? Well, that, 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 that kind of goes, goes back, back to Anne's question, question in a way, too. Is he queuing us up for something there? Is he saying that to reporters? Because he was very purposeful when he spoke to reporters. Is he, is he saying that because he wants us to know who these people are? And later on, actually, it's Pinchot and Garfield that write a mini biography of Roosevelt and the, how important the tennis cabinet is. Never been published uh, and, and should be because it's really it's quite good about the inner workings of the... So I think he might have been queuing this up, but it's, no one's taken the cue so far. Wait a minute. These two wrote a book about TR and tennis. With his approval. No, no, not about tennis, about the administration. And this has never been published? No. Well, we should publish it. <laughs> That's what the TR Center should it's, do. I would, okay, but it's not, it's not a biography and it's not refined. But, but it would be interesting, don't you think? It, w it would be interesting, yeah, yeah. It is interesting, I've read it. <laughs> let, let, let's get after this. Okay. <laughs> we can do that. This is fantastic. All right, so a great start. We are so glad that you are the Rob and Melanie Walton um, endowed chair of Theodore Roosevelt Studies here at Dickinson State University. You'll be with us all fall physically, in the spring metaphysically. 
Uh, we're hoping this is a long and fruitful association. Uh, we really are glad you've set the tone for everything that follows. There will be a book signing immediately following in the foyer. There are four books for sale here. This book, your other book of reminiscences, uh, Ryan Swanson's book, The Strenuous Life, which is one of the things that inspired this symposium. And then if you have nothing else to do in the world, my book, The Language of Cottonwoods, uh, Essays on the Future of North Dakota, I represented it before 150 Lutherans in Medora the other day, and it was like the humanities was a contact sport. <laughs> so we'll start in the lobby, but then let's go down to the alumni house and have a beautiful reception. Thank you, Michael Cullinane. Thanks. Good morning and welcome to our symposium on the athlete in the arena, uh, Theodore Roosevelt and the development of American sport. We're so glad you're here and greetings to all of those around the country and around the world who are participating by streaming and in particular we send our greetings to the students at Long Island University and Tweed Roosevelt um, who sends his best to all of us. So we have a lot to cover today. It's a big day. I think you're going to love it. Uh, towards the end of the day, we'll go over to Pulver Hall, and you'll have a chance to see the extraordinary uh, new uh, digs that the TR Center has there, um, and our first exhibit, which is on Theodore Roosevelt and the great photographer Edward S. Curtis. And then tonight, um, our extravaganza of period sport recreations over in Stickney Auditorium, and I know the President will have more to say about that here in a moment. I just want to say one thing about Roosevelt, you know, we're going to do some background on the Gilded Age here and sort of the social dynamics that led him to take the stands that he did and to promote sports, to exemplify and to promote sports in the way that he did. But it's always so important for us to re remember what an extraordinarily interesting and unusual human being he was. Um, for example, when he first met Gifford Pinchot, Roosevelt was the governor of New York. He had been the hero of San Juan Hill. He came back and was swept into the governorship of New York. He served for one two-year term and then was uh, advanced into the vice presidency of the United States. Pinchot wrote about his first meeting with Roosevelt. And he's, if you've ever been to the governor's mansion in Albany, it's a big sort of Victorian pile of several stories. And when Pinchot arrived, he said that there was a, some kind of an incident going on because the governor of New York was lowering his children by ropes from the second story windows because there was an Indian attack on the mansion. And so you automatically get this picture of Roosevelt. You know, that's probably the first governor uh, who played cowboys and Indians with his children by dangling them on ropes from the windows of the mansion. And that was just the beginning. So they have lunch, or as it was known then, luncheon, and they're talking about policy and forestry and uh, conservation and uh, how we can sustain the national forests of the United States, which Roosevelt thought were being um, denuded by um, really um, exhaustive extraction of, of timber. And so after lunch, then Roosevelt says to Gifford Pinchot, hey, you want, you want to wrestle? And they wrestled. I mean, imagine Barack Obama saying to a guest, hey, you want to wrestle? Or Bill Clinton, or Donald Trump, or Governor Bergam in North Dakota. This is a very, very, very unusual human being. And somehow, I was so surprised last night in listening to Michael Cullinane that not only that Roosevelt had a tennis cabinet, but people agreed to be part of it, that he would take them on these point-to-point -point walks in Rock Creek Park, often very dangerous walks, and they got muddy and dirty and sometimes injured. Um, and Roosevelt's manner of playing tennis was extremely intense and aggressive. And not only did he do this sort of thing, but he talked others into joining him in it. And they often did it with misgiving at first, but soon enough with great zeal and even delight. And so I think it's so important when we think of him that he's not William McKinley, and he's not William Howard Taft, and he's not Calvin Coolidge. He's Theodore Roosevelt, maybe the most unusual human being who was ever the president of the United States. 
So let's keep in mind um, that we're talking about someone who is sui generis. He's sort of one of a kind. And his interest in this subject, sport, athleticism, the strenuous life, taking risks, maybe even getting injured, was a central feature of Roosevelt's life. I'll just tell you one quick other story. There was a windmill at Sagamore Hill and Roosevelt, you know the old style windmill, and Roosevelt climbed up to fix it and one of the blades got, was caught by the wind and hit him in the, in the forehead and, and opened a vein and he was gushing blood. He climbs down and goes into the house and Edith is there and she says, Theodore, go outside, I don't want you bleeding on my carpets. And that was her only response, you know, it wasn't, oh no, let's rush to the hospital or this should never have happened. For her it was just, please. Do your bleeding somewhere else, would you? Extraordinary man. All right, so I want to bring up uh, President Stephen Easton uh, and ask you a question. So if you would join us, please welcome the president of this university, Stephen Easton. You know, president Easton, we've been at this now for 20 years off and on uh, in different ways. and. Uh, these symposia have been the centerpiece of what we do. But this year there is more news, more change, more development in the Roosevelt Center than in any previous year. And I thought since we have a little time here, it would be really good if you could tell us where we are and how we got to this new great moment. Uh, yeah, th uh, th uh, thanks, Clay. Uh, it is a, this is a very exciting time in our Theodore Roosevelt work here at Dickinson State. Um, uh, those uh, those efforts that have been going on for basically two decades uh, 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 are really uh, are really blossoming right now uh, through the generosity of the Robin Melanie Walton Foundation. Uh, we have a, a ten million dollar gift to support our Theodore Roosevelt efforts. A significant portion of that gift uh, will be used as an endowment. Uh, and, the, uh, and the funds that uh, once the market corrects itself and we get back to the, get back to the place where, uh, where, those, uh, where those things uh, uh, earn money, those, uh, the, that, those earnings will be used to support the efforts of the Theodore Roosevelt uh, Center. Uh, another portion of that gift is, is, a, is a starting uh, infusion of funds, uh, $2 million of that gift is, uh, is an infusion of funds to be used over the next four about four and a half years in the Theodore Roosevelt Center, uh, and so that's uh, that's going to going to boost uh, boost those efforts, uh, and then uh, and then a third portion of those funds uh, are for support of uh, the second endowed chair at Dickinson State University, the the, the Rob and Melanie Walton. Um, um, endowed chair in Theodore Roosevelt studies. You heard from our first, uh, our first occupant of that chair, Michael Cullinane, uh, last night. What an amazing addition he is uh, to, our, uh, to our faculty. The first, the first endowed chair at Dickinson State is also relatively new. Uh, that is the Dennis and Vaughn Johnson chair. Um, uh, those of you who are local recognize that name. Dennis was the, was the longtime and very successful mayor uh, of, of Dickinson, who managed uh, uh, Dickinson's growth during the uh, during the latest version of the oil boom in our part of the state, and and really managed it just marvelously. And he's also the chief executive officer at TMI, one of the manufacturers uh, in Dickinson. I was a, for people that aren't familiar with Dickinson, it's kind of interesting that we have a half a dozen manufacturing facilities in, in Dickinson. Very unusual among North Dakota cities. We have an agricultural element of our economy, the tourism element of our economy, education, of course, with Dickinson State and the local public schools and a very strong uh, private schools network in Dickinson, uh, but also manufacturing is a part of our uh, economy. And one of the leaders there is TMI, and that's, that's Dennis and Vaughn Johnson. So through their generosity, uh, we have Jeff Wells, uh, Jeff, we've been referring to you, but I don't know if you had a chance. To, can you stand up so people can, uh, can recognize you? All right, welcome, Jeff. Um, Jeff has some wonderful ideas about, uh, about things we can do to expand uh, our offerings in history. As, as Michael referred to yesterday, um, another, an, another element of that, uh, 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 of, of the of the expertise that we have in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era 
uh, is Dr. William Hansard, who is, uh, who is one of our, uh, and William's in the back. Uh, 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 William, thank, thanks for being here, too. He works, uh, he works uh, with the archiving work at the Theodore Roosevelt Center and also, uh, and also serves as our outreach uh, person at the Theodore Roosevelt Center and, and in particular does, uh, does social media work. And he's the person uh, who finds a lot of those great, uh, and, and, it, and Michael made reference to it yesterday, spend some time in the hallways because he's, uh, uh, William finds the most amazing things. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, our little uh, image that we used uh, that we used uh, for this symposium that has the the Roosevelt as a basketball player shooting a basketball, which if you look at the image, it says uh, it says Taft, uh, and then the and then the rim of the basketball says nomination. So it's obviously a statement about Roosevelt's boosting of Taft to the Republican nomination. And on Roosevelt's shirt, it says BSAC. Uh, uh, our amazing team at the Theodore Roosevelt Center cannot answer the obvious question, which is what does BSAC stand for? And if they can't answer it, it means it's lost to history. That's our standard. If William, uh, if, if, if William and Kelly and Eric uh, uh, can't find the answer, that means there is no answer out there. I think AC probably stands for Athletic Club. The mind wanders on what BS might stand for, uh, but we don't. We were not able to find an answer to that uh, to that question. It's an, it's. Uh, an, I don't know if, if anyone else. Uh, throughout the day, all of our speakers can can big advance stick. a theory. Pardon? Big stick. Oh, big stick. Joe's got. Oh, 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 oh it's a, it's a, it's a theory. Big stick. That, that, oh. Sure, that's a good guess. That's a great guess. That's a great guess, Joe. Um, also wanted to mention uh, Eric Johnson and Kelly Highland, who are here also for, or are working, uh, and, and they're also archivists at the Theodore Roosevelt Center. Um, uh, Dwayne Jont has joined us uh, for a special project that involves, uh, that involves the archiving of the Theodore Roosevelt Association's publication. Uh, just continuing the things that we have available. We got some support from the Theodore Roosevelt Association. Want to thank them for that, uh, for that support. Uh, and you know, a president of a university can't pass up an invitation to note that these things are possible because of private support from a whole bunch of people, from the Waltons, from uh, Dennis and Von Johnson, and other people that have supported those efforts. So we we appreciate that, and it makes a huge a huge difference. Um, we're a relatively small, we're not a relatively small university. By state university standards, we're a tiny uh, university, which is one of our strengths. Uh, uh, I don't say that with any shame. It's actually one of the things we're proud of is that we have a very, uh, very low faculty to student ratios. So our students get to know their faculty. Um, this is a, this is a, this is our thing at Dickinson State, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, the progressive era, we've made a major investment of resources. Uh, our Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Program, which also uh, should be mentioned. You've met uh, one of our students in that program. You meet another one in a couple of minutes. They have, I see Jake here who's going to, uh, who's going to introduce uh, Simon. Can you stand up, Jake, so that we can see your uniform? So everybody, if you haven't figured this out yet, he, that's actually... That uniform is like the modern women's basketball officiating uniforms. And our TRHLP students also have a whistle just to reinforce the message that uh, the athletics message. Find one of them over the next day and a half if, you, uh, if you're looking for help because they're, they're here to help you out and, and make your experience uh, a, a, a good one. Uh, it is not an accident that our honors program is named the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Program. The students in that program get a minor in leadership. And, and, and study the concept of, uh, of leadership uh, through the lens of, uh, of Theodore Roosevelt. Um, I don't know if Dr. Hack, Dr. Niles Hack is here today. Uh, he's the, head, the faculty head of that, uh, of that program. So we appreciate uh, uh, his work and uh, Mary Kovash. I know Mary was here this morning, but I, I can't see anybody from here. So lots of people doing these things. Uh, it's, it's our thing. Uh, we feel very... Uh, very blessed to be in a geographic position 
to make a, a, a significant claim on Theodore uh, Roosevelt, not the only one. Uh, Long Island University, our guests who are watching us, they also have, they also pay significant attention to Roosevelt as is, as is uh, appropriate because that's, that's the part of the country that he was from. Um, uh, we North Dakotans have a special affection for Roosevelt. Um, his actual number of days in North Dakota is not huge, but it clearly made a big difference in his life. Um, and he was always proud of us. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we uh, were a little state. Uh, what was Severide's quote? Uh, the blank spot in the consciousness in the, in the nation's mind. I mean, most people don't have an association with North Dakota. And so uh, to have someone like Theodore Roosevelt spend part of his time and a very important, it wasn't a large number of days, but it was a very important part of his life. You know, of course, I'm sure everybody here knows the story of, you know, coming out to North Dakota after his wife and his mother died on the same day. And he really basically healed his soul out in the Badlands. And um, it's always a big deal to us North Dakotans that Roosevelt was always proud and it was a big, a big part of his time here. That is, as is typical, a long answer to a short question, uh, Clay. Um, can I get into a couple of mechanical things for the people that are here? Absolutely. Uh, just, just a few things about, uh, about the day. We'll spend most of the day here. Uh, this afternoon, we'll be going over to Pulver Hall for a, a, a rededication of that, uh, of that space. As Clay mentioned, those of you here, please be sure to check out the Curtis exhibit. Those of you accessing, accessing us online, uh, we will have that exhibit up for approximately a year. Uh, when you're in our neighborhood, take an hour or an hour and a half or four, 45 minutes or whatever you have out of your schedule. And, and we'd love to have you stop and visit that, uh, that very interesting exhibit. Uh, um, uh, Claudia Berg and, and, uh, and Sharon and Clay, uh, Clay did, a, did the text uh, of that exhibit, uh, you'll learn some interesting things. Uh, one of the things that you will learn, uh, at, least, at least that many of us have learned going through that exhibit, you will see photographs that you have seen before, and you'll learn the story of how they of how they came about. And it's a it's a fascinating story, uh, and that'll be there for a year or so. Those of you that are in Long Island or Europe or elsewhere. You've got most of a year to come out and see that exhibit until we change it to another one. So we hope you'll do that. It's, 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 Clay did a wonderful job with that. Oh, a couple of other mechanical things. Tomorrow, yes, it is true that there are some weather, you know, we may have some rain. Uh, worry not. Uh, we, if we have to spend the entire day indoors tomorrow, Medora is now a day where you can, you can profitably spend, uh, an entire day inside. Uh, there are, there are things that we can, we can adjust the schedule. Uh, if it's, I asked, uh, somebody asked Clay if, if the hikes, the hike would still happen tomorrow if, uh, uh, if it was raining and he said, if it's drizzling, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not, yeah. I mean, I. Highly likely we'll still do that. It would take thunderstorm type activity. We don't want to put you out in a thunderstorm. TR would have gone in a thunderstorm, but, uh, but we've learned some things about that. So, uh, but tomorrow is, uh, those of us in suits will not be in suits tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's an outdoor, you know, we hope it will be uh, a largely or partly outdoor day. So uh, uh, all of us will be in, in more informal uh, clothing. I don't know if we'll be able to match uh, Roosevelt's tennis clothes. Um, uh, we'll, we'll probably hear about that later in the day. He did not have classic tennis uh, outfits, but, uh, but wear Rooseveltian outdoor clothes tomorrow. Uh, mostly here today, then we're over at Pulver Hall the, this afternoon, and then in the evening, uh, in the evening we'll be uh, uh, in Stickney Auditorium watching what basketball uh, looked like only a few years after its existence, or after, after its invention, uh, and, and very different than it does today. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. We're glad you're here. Thank you, President Easton. Uh, so this is this great growth moment. Uh, we've been challenged to accelerate the pace of the digitization of the Roosevelt Papers, and of course, we've been 
desperate to do that all along. And you want these projects to have a life so that you begin and end. Uh, and, and as I said last night, our goal is to, is to create an absolutely comprehensive digital archive of everything Rooseveltian, everything that he wrote, all the letters in and all the letters out, cartoons, photographs, uh, such limited films as exist. There's a small amount of Roosevelt audio. Then, of course, there are the children, um, his administration, cabinet ministers. It's a huge and growing project, and you have to somewhere put the boundaries on it. Otherwise, it just grows and grows and grows. But our goal is to be a comprehensive, definitive Theodore Roosevelt digital archive that will be available to anyone in the world free 24 hours a day. Um, it's an extraordinary um, event of the digital revolution. And I want to say too that um, although we will greatly miss our colleague Sharon Kilzer, um, Chris O'Brien is the new director of the Theodore Roosevelt Center and we're thrilled to have you and we're eager to hear more from you in the course of, 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 of this symposium. So let us begin. Um, as I said last night, uh, we're so proud of the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Scholars, and we've asked them to do the introductions of our distinguished guests. And so today, Jacob Daniel, please come forward and introduce the great Simon Cordery. On behalf of myself, the entire Dickinson State University community, the Theodore Roosevelt Foundation, and Dr. Simon Cordery, I'm happy to welcome everyone to the second day of our annual TR Symposium. As Mr. Jenkinson mentioned, my name is Jake Daniel and I'm a sophomore at Dickinson State University. I'm currently majoring in health and physical education while minoring in coaching and leadership studies. I am a proud member of the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Program and the Blue Hawk men's basketball team. Upon hearing the theme of this year's symposium, the athlete in the arena, I became very excited about the outstanding speakers that we're gonna have this weekend. Among these wonderful speakers is Dr. Simon Cordery. Although I only met Dr. Simon Cordery for the first time yesterday, I feel as if I already knew him. And that's because I was fortunate enough to have Dr. Stacy Cordery as my director for the TRHLP last year. And I learned a lot from her in just one short year. I was very fortunate to be taught by her and be guided by her. And we're very lucky to have the Corderies here with us this weekend. Dr. Simon Cordery is the chair of the history department at Iowa State University. Prior to his current position, Cordery chaired the history department at Western Illinois University and at Monmouth College. At Monmouth, he taught for 18 years and served as the women's soccer coach for seven of those years. And an award-winning author and historian of the transatlantic modern world, Cordery has published three books and a collection of academic articles. <laughs> Cordery's most recent book, The Iron Road in the Prairie State, was named winner of the George W. and Constance M. Hilton Book Award from the Railway and Locomotive Historical Society. Cordery teaches in many areas, including the field of sports history, and he is responsible for introducing sports history courses to three different institutions. Cordery says, Theodore Roosevelt embodied a life of action and thoughtfulness. His ability to capture and live the ideal of a sound mind in a sound body resonates with me personally as it does with so many people today. We understand as TR and his father did, how and why physical exertion and clear thinking are connected. To enjoy a full life, a useful life, is to comprehend how the strenuous life is as much an intellectual ideal as it is a corporeal injunction. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Simon Cordery. Well, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. That was a fantastic introduction. Thank you, Jake. I really appreciate that. And thank you as well to everyone who has made our trip here possible. It's been so far marvelous, and I hope it stays that way. We'll see. Let me know in an hour and a half. I'd like to thank everyone at DSU who made my presence here possible, especially President Easton, Dr. Chris O'Brien, and Kelly, Eric, and William of the TR Center staff. 
I'd especially like to thank Clay Jenkinson. Clay is the visionary, the public intellectual behind the symposium now in its 17th year, and of course the guiding light behind the, well, the, the entire TR Center. So thank you, Clay, for everything that you do for this symposium and for Dickinson State University. I'm going to make a bold assumption, an assumption that everyone in this room has heard of the strenuous life. No doubt you associate the strenuous life. Uh -huh. There we go. No doubt you associate the strenuous life with Theodore Roosevelt, and you would be right to do so. No doubt you're also well aware of the famous injunction from Theodore Roosevelt's father to quote, make your body, because TR was not a strong boy. Growing up, he was racked by asthma, and he was physically something of a weakling. As he approached his teen years, he shot up in height, and he looked, according to Edmund Morris, something like a stork. Following a thorough physical exam in, 90, in 1870, when the boy was 12 years old, TR Sr. sat his son down and told him, Quote, Theodore, you have the mind, but you have not the body. And without the help of the mind, without the help of the body, the mind cannot go as far as it should. You must make your body. It is hard drudgery to make one's body, but I know you will do it. TR followed this advice, and whether because of it or because he was simply leaving his adolescence behind, he grew out of his asthma and for the rest of his life he believed, I think that's the key, he believed it was the strenuous life that allowed him to defeat asthma and to overcome his early beginnings. He, as we know, came to embody the strenuous life. Not quite so well known as Roosevelt's devout adherence to the strenuous life are the origins of that ideal and so my task this morning is to give you the big picture of sports during Theodore Roosevelt's lifetime to show the wider story of the strenuous life. I'm going to begin by exploring the development of ideas about and institutions promoting physical fitness. I'm going to show how TR and his quest did not emerge in a vacuum. I'm going to examine the commercialization of sport as the strenuous life became a source of profit for some and entertainment for many. But first, let me begin by talking about the era. And I'm going to follow Professor Cullinane's lead here and deal with the Gilded Age and the Progressive Era as one long single time period, approximately, it, as, as I'm dating it, from 1876 to 1917, though I do like the idea of mapping it onto TR's life. The Gilded Age and Progressive Era was a time of rapid industrialization, of the growth of cities, of new waves of immigration, and most ominously for America's self-perception, the decline of agricultural labor. The proportion of people working in agriculture fell continuously following the Civil War. The Jeffersonian ideal, the independent yeoman farmer, had met its match in the thick smoke and belching infernos that American businessmen had built to produce material goods that American consumers would learn to demand. The country was changing and Americans seemed to be growing lazy. Work for many people, especially in the middle classes, became ever more sedentary. In this context, a national conversation about physical fitness and health emerged. And needless to say, Theodore Roosevelt had something to say about it. He wrote, always in our modern life, a life of highly complex industrialism, there is a tendency to softening of fiber. He acknowledged that workers in railroads and fisheries and other physical pursuits did indeed lead the strenuous life, but he felt that those who led sedentary lives in urban settings needed, quote, hard and rough play. Strengthening that fiber, both physical and moral, contributed to an era of innovation democratization, and the professionalization of American sports. It was a period of increased leisure for middle and upper class families who enjoyed discretionary income that they would use to buy those commodities that American industry was producing. For wage earning Americans, the average working day dropped. 
it fell from about 12 to 10 hours. And the average working week fell from about six to five and a half days. This is also a time of changing fashions for women, a time when loosely fitting clothes, or at least more loosely fitting clothes, made participation in sports actually feasible. This is a period in which wealthy Americans were emulating the English athletic movement, and this helped to give sports social acceptability. It led to the investment in facilities and to equipment. This is also a period of the commercialization of sport. In 1876, of course, a new professional baseball league, the National League developed, the National League emerged as a group of joint stock companies owned by powerful individuals. But of course, many Americans continued to live in poverty, disease, and fear. Many of these were first generation immigrants who worked in dangerous jobs and inhabited substandard housing. The fear these new arrivals generated, especially among long settled Anglo-American families, also fed the craze for promoting the strenuous life. So let me talk about the ideology and the ideas that underpinned this new adherence to and promotion of physical exercise. One of the best known summarizers, one of the best known synthesizers of these ideas was G. Stanley Hall. G. Stanley Hall is someone that we would today call a genetic psychologist. He was a social Darwinist who believed that life was a struggle between different races, a struggle in which only the fittest would survive. Hall looked at everything through an evolutionary lens, including play and recreation. For Hall, play was important, and we had to understand it, according to him, because human beings evolve through stages of play. And these stages of play, according to G. Stanley Hall, are exact replicas of the stages through which human society has developed from hunting gathering societies to complex industrial urban societies. He argued that human society meant that because humans had to grow as society did, every individual person had to pass through the stages of growth that every society was, would pass through. Play, he argued, teaches those stages. So for Hall, every individual must progress deliberately through each stage of play. For Hall, team sports were the apex. They were the acne. For him, team sports were the highest form of play because they encouraged advanced motor skills and cognitive growth while simultaneously developing the cooperative reflexes, as he would call them, in human beings. In team games, according to Hall, we learn the key virtues of obedience, self-sacrifice, self-denial, teamwork, loyalty, self-control, moral discipline, these terms are central to my talk, and I'm going to be repeating them throughout the, 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 the lecture. In a team, under Hall's interpretation, the collective was more important than the individual. And this had several important ramifications for sports. Adults had to supervise play. Adults had to supervise play in organized settings because otherwise the evolutionary development might be perverted. It might, children might do the wrong thing at the wrong stage of their growth. Second, the idea of universal stages of maturation into adulthood was designed to erase ethnic, religious, and class differences, though moral and racial differences would survive. Third, Hall recognized that boys and girls, men and women, were different. He argued that this difference was a key to understanding both human evolution and also to organizing play. Boys and girls had to be segregated in the playground. And fourthly, athletic pursuits would replace intellectual activity as a socially acceptable form of individual and collective expression. So that meant run and jump, don't sit and think. Do, don't contemplate, be active. That's kind of the key here, be active. And that's where TR and the strenuous life come back in. So let's turn to the rich soil in which these theories emerged and their application to physical fitness. 
So Hall's theory is developed as part of a national conversation about the physiological state of Americans, and physical fitness became a topic of great concern in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era, leading to its creation as a school subject. So if you're taking a physical education class today, as I understand many of you in this audience are, you will be hearing about the origins of why you do what you do. Physical fitness gained international prominence through the creation of the Young Men's Christian Association. Founded in 1844 in London, the YMCA promised to combine spiritual guidance and material assistance to young men migrating from the countryside to the city in search of work. It was designed to defeat the mental and physically debilitating effects of urban life. The YMCA was an early proponent of muscular Christianity, and historian Clifford Putney, in his book on the topic, defines muscular Christianity as an attempt to revive Protestant churches to save Americans from the morally and physically debilitating effects of city life, and essentially to bring men back into the churches. The churches, people felt, men felt, had become too feminized. Muscular Christians proposed to build recreational facilities to create opportunities for exercise and to offer competitive sports and physical education, along with deliberately linking those activities with spiritual health. The phrase muscular Christianity is most closely associated with the book Tom Brown's School Days. Tom Brown's School Days, which appeared in 1857, is set at a boarding school in England. The author, Thomas Hughes, did not use that phrase. That phrase appears in reviews of his books and earlier books by another author, Charles Kingsley. Reviewers, however, by using that phrase, created a genre and helped to form an ideology. The book is set at a private school in England. Rugby, of course, private schools in England are perversely called public schools. It's a parable about the battle between good and evil, using sports to illustrate how physical strength does not necessarily equal moral strength and how sports can build moral character. At rugby, according to the novel, sports teach lessons, moral lessons, about fairness, about teamwork, about selflessness, and about self-sacrifice. This is part of the, the Christian element of the muscular Christianity brand. Hughes wrote that Christians should use their bodies to advance all righteous causes. That's the muscular component of muscular Christianity. Muscular Christians wanted to eliminate the idea of the suffering Christ, of Christ as the, as the advocate for the meek and the mild. They saw Christ as a soldier, a soldier fighting a just war against evil and temptation. Controlling the individual human body, making it fitter, was a metaphor for reforming and improving the social body. So you won't be surprised to learn that their favorite hymn, in fact, something of their theme, was Onward Christian Soldiers, originally written for a children's process, but, but appropriated by muscular Christians, and of course, in 1912, by the Bull Moose campaign for Theodore Roosevelt. <coughs> Influential Americans saw with dismay what they perceived as the contrast between vigorous, healthy Brits and their own puny urban Americans. The difference they believed arose from the sports that were played on each side of the Atlantic. Robust Englishmen stood in, st in stark contrast to frail Americans, at least according to these observers, one of whom was Theodore Roosevelt Sr. Theodore Roosevelt Sr. met Thomas Hughes, and this meeting opened his eyes to what he had been seeing, but not really interpreting in the cities around him, especially in New York City. The vehicle that brought muscular Christianity to the United States was the YMCA. The first YMCA was founded in Boston in 1851. And then soon afterwards, another one followed in New York City, funded in part by Theodore Roosevelt Sr. Roosevelt saw in the combination of barbells and Bibles, the path forward for America. Why the Y opened gymnasiums across the country. It was an earlier employer of physical education instructors, and it pioneered sports as a means to finding salvation, religious salvation through physical activity. A leading proponent of muscular Christianity and a leading member of the YMCA was Luther Halsey Gulick Jr. 
Gulick looked to England for inspiration. He saw sports in the 1870s and 80s developing as what he thought was a proving ground of a new Christian masculinity, masculinity exemplifying to his eyes pluck and courage, a healthy mind in a healthy body, the amateur sporting ideals of the British aristocracy, and notions of fair play, respectability, and sobriety. In the United States, adopting these ideals was a reaction against the perceived effeminacy of American men and against the perceived sedentary nature of work. This outlook, this fear, influenced Gulick, who was also influenced by G. Stanley Hall. Gulick was the son of missionary parents, and he found in the strenuous life compensation for his own inadequacies. He suffered from migraines, depression, nervous breakdowns. In 1887, following completion of his medical training, he joined the staff of the International YMCA Training School in Springfield, Massachusetts. This was a school that offered a two-year program training YMCA physical education instructors. It encouraged playing organized sports as a way to generate spiritual growth. Sport should always be a form of recreation, of physical empowerment, and of spiritual improvement, Gulick wrote and Gulick taught. Keeping score or maintaining records for any reason was far less important in the original YMCA than developing all-around skills and connecting physical activity with a robust spiritual life. Gulick and the YMCA, however, were not alone in promoting physical fitness and in training physical education teachers. Another leading advocate was Dudley Sargent. Sargent began his career working as an assistant professor of physical education at Harvard University. At Harvard, he administered the physical exams that every graduating senior had to undergo. One of the graduating seniors that he that, that he exa examined was Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt stood patiently as Sargent took measurements, as he asked about family members and their health history, and then made a diagnosis. His diagnosis, Sargent's diagnosis of TR, was that TR should just basically sit down and do nothing. He was going to have a heart attack at any moment unless he took things easily. No wrestling, no boxing, no physical life, no physical activity. Physical exertion, Sergeant told the young TR, would kill him. But of course, TR had had a life filled with physical exertion at Harvard. He had famously boxed and wrestled, and he did so in part because he enjoyed them, but also because, as he wrote, I do not intend that anyone should laugh at me with impunity. Oh, you can laugh at me, but I'm going to beat you up. TR also skipped rope as part of his physical fitness regime. He rode horses, he climbed mountains, and he almost challenged a fellow crimson to a duel. And the almost duel almost took place because he thought this other guy was a rival for the hand of Alice Hathaway Lee. Alice Lee of Boston was TR's first love. Alice Lee was herself an athlete. She was an excellent tennis player. She could compete with TR on even terms. She also could see the ball in a way that TR couldn't, so she had certain physical advantages there. But she could compete with TR on the tennis court. She was an excellent archer. Just before they married, she joined a tennis club in New York City to make sure she could continue with her avocation. Obviously, the perfect match for the man who would become the poster boy for the strenuous life. And needless to say, TR ignored Dudley Sargent's advice. He continued to rush upstairs to walk for miles at an end as fast as he could and to make his body. Sargent, however, despite this somewhat erroneous diagnosis, went on to create his own school, the Sargent School for Physical Education in 1881. And he did it because he believed that both boys and girls, men and women, should have physical training. That they should be physical education classes for everyone. Segregated, yes, according to G. Stanley Hall's dictates, but nonetheless, that there should be physical education for boys and girls. Dudley Sargent, the YMCA, and other fitness experts found a ready audience for their visions. But the growing popularity of competitive sports created a problem for the proponents of muscular Christianity. Competitive sports were great for recruiting 
people to the why. However, when the emphasis switched from Christian values to winning at all costs, the whys risked becoming little more than sports facilities shorn of their religious mission. They would be muscular, but not Christian. And yet the YMCA itself was partly responsible for this emphasis on competitiveness. Spurring the competitiveness was a sport invented at the YMCA, basketball. I'm sure that most, if not all of you, have heard of James Naismith, the Canadian physical education instructor working in Springfield at the International YMCA Training School, who was asked by Luther Gulick to create an indoor sport, create a sport that we can play in the winter. What Naismith created was a new and acceptable sport for women to play. There's no, in the original form of basketball, there was no dribbling or running with the ball. The only way that you could actually move the ball was to pass it. Women's sports, of course, were supposed to be neither as physical nor as competitive as men's sports. But it turns out that women really enjoyed playing basketball, in part because it freed them to do the sorts of things they were not supposed to do, like scream at each other and throw the ball at each other, and even in cases that uh, some observers record, kick and scratch each other. Women's basketball had to change, and women's basketball did so. In 1892, Senda Berenson, a physical education instructor, was hired by the elite East Coast Women's College, Smith College. She introduced basketball into physical education classes, and she observed that it was still too rough and too masculine. She decided, Berenson decided, to write her own set of rules. Basketball for women would be, relatively speaking, calm, as you'll see tonight. We're playing by the 1905 rules tonight, not the original 1891 rules. Basketball would be calm, and it would be ladylike. The court, Berenson decreed, would be divided into three equal sections. The players could only move in one of those sections. They were restricted to one of those three sections. There were five to ten players per team. There was no physical contact. You could, under her rules, dribble the ball, or bounce the ball twice. You couldn't move with it and then pass it. There was a time limit. And you were supposed to shoot with one hand, because shooting with two hands would cause health problems to your lungs, according to, well, <laughs> according to the early advocates of physical education. Berenson was not alone. Alternative rules emerged. There's a famous set of rules that emerged in New Orleans where the court was divided confusingly into nine different segments. All of these rules were slowly evaporated. In 1899, the sporting goods company Spalding & Co. published Berenson's rules. These rules became the official rules for women's basketball. Basketball proved that women could and should engage in physical exercise, that they could in avoid injury, and that they could avoid male assumptions and indeed contradict male assumptions about women as weak vessels who should not be allowed to run, to jump, or to bounce basketballs. And I know that Professor Anne Blaschke will have more to say about this later on this morning. So I'm going to move on to playgrounds. The facilities that we've been talking about, facilities at colleges, at YMCAs, were available to a small stratum of the American population. For the vast majority in towns and cities, playgrounds, open space for recreation and organized sports, were rare. This begins to change with the settlement house movement, but it takes a, a dramatic turn in 1903 when the Chicago South Park District funds the building of playgrounds using a $5 million bond. They build 10 new parks. Each park would have an enclosed gymnasium as well as outdoor space. And crucially, each park was going to be staffed by two physical education instructors. This inspired a national movement, and many of the playground instructors were, of course, disciples of G. Stanley Hall, and some of them had been trained at the YMCA schools around the country. They created age and sex-specific games to develop children from savages 
to cooperative team members. The freedom of the streets, however, seemed to be more attractive than structured play for many of the original targets of the playground movement, the children of immigrants who, according to those in power, needed to be Americanized. Professor Ryan Swanson, from whom we will hear later on this morning or this afternoon, brings us round to the strenuous life by characterizing TR's commitment to the strenuous life as an athletic crusade. That's a direct quote, an athletic crusade. For TR, physical competitive sports provided a path to creating healthy individuals living in a healthy society. This fits perfectly with the social Darwinism prevalent at the time, but as Professor Swanson points out, the phrase, the strenuous life, was ambiguous enough, sufficiently transferable, and delightfully memorable to serve multiple purposes. And one of the ironies of the strenuous life is how it encouraged its very antithesis, spectatorship. So let me turn to the creation of new sports and to talk about sports as a national spectacle. So what's the connection between those muscular Christians encouraging exercise and the development of professional sports? The answer lies in how sports supposedly embodied the virtues muscular Christians sought to teach. Those virtues included the amateur ideal, fair play, cooperation for the sake of the greater good. For TR, outdoor sports provided the greatest exercise of fine moral qualities such as resolution, courage, endurance, and capacity to hold one's own and stand up under punishment. And to understand the origins of these sports, let me begin with that quintessentially English game, cricket. Every summer, village greens and urban parks across the country of England reverberate to the thwack of the willow bat hitting a leather ball. That's the sound of cricket. The sound of cricket and the sport of cricket probably developed in the 16th century and came across the Atlantic Ocean quite early on. The first newspaper reports of a cricket match appeared in 1751 in the American colonies, and three years later, Benjamin Franklin brought a copy of the rules of cricket across the Atlantic Ocean with him when he was returning to, to uh, Pennsylvania. The game caught on. An 1844 match between the US and Canada was the first modern international sporting event. It became popular across the country, including in the new town of Pullman outside Chicago. The center of American cricket was Philadelphia, and they had some enormously influential and very aristocratic cricket clubs in Philadelphia with very fine facilities, but also a very rich social life. They had regular um, teas, music days, dances, and youth programs teaching cooperation, amateurism, and fair play. Cricket caught on because wealthy Gilded Age Americans sought to emulate British aristocrats. Cricket is a form of conspicuous consumption. In cricket, you play in white from your shoes to your caps, all in white. If you're playing in white clothes on a green field, you know that something's going to happen when you dive to catch the ball or when you fall over trying to hit it. But they didn't care. The aristocrats didn't care because they weren't concerned about the cost of their clothing. Cricket also conspicuously consumed time. Matches could last anywhere from one day to five days with lunch and a tea break thrown in. In 1909, the British, I'm sorry, the Imperial Cricket Conference was founded to govern the game, and it ruled that no country outside of the British Empire could join this new confederation. This obviously excluded the United States, but that was okay because Americans were developing a new game, the game of baseball. Now, baseball probably evolved from a girls' game that's still played in England today called rounders. Rounders mutated into baseball or something close to it in the 1840s in New England and made its way to New York City. The original baseball teams were, were drinking clubs. They were skilled working men and lower middle class clerks who wanted to go out and play. They would cross the river over to New Jersey and play the sport of baseball. Their matches ended in a feast for both sides and the winning team would take home the match ball. A year before the Civil War broke out, however, this publication, Beadle's Dime Baseball Player, was published in New York City and sold about 50,000 copies. 
These copies were sold in both the North and the South, and they wound up in the hands of both Confederate and Union soldiers. This sport explained how to play baseball, essentially baseball, as a sport faster than cricket, Baseball, which just needed very simple equipment, a stick rather than a bat. A bat requires elaborate joinery. A stick can be almost anything you pick up in a, in a forest. You just need a stick, a ball, and four shirts thrown on the ground, and you have a baseball pitch. After the war, after the Civil War, baseball players worked hard to show that their game was respectable. They wrote about how baseball encouraged a love of order, discipline, and fair play making it an ideal sport in the imagined universe of G. Stanley Hall. Entrepreneurs seized on the potential, the commercial potential of baseball. The first enclosed grounds in New York City attracted ticket buying spectators. The players became professionals. They had lots of spare time. They practiced, of course, but they also engaged in a lot of gambling and drinking. With gate receipts, the owners were able to themselves contribute to the growth of the sport. Here is the flip side of the strenuous life. As one uncomplimentary editorial called uh, baseball players, they were dissipated gladiators. Dissipated gladiators. Now that's really putting those drunken gambling baseball players in their place. Commercial sport encouraged spectators to sit and drink and gamble on the game, the very antithesis of the strenuous life. Fair play, admitting that you made a mistake or that there was a rule violation and that you didn't need a referee or an umpire to correct it, went out of the window. Winning at all costs became central to the sport of baseball. Cheating to win became acceptable. Gambling became commonplace. But to give baseball its due, baseball did give Americans a sense of place. It did offer Americans a, a, a local identity. People of all ethnic stripes would identify with local baseball teams. And in an age of rapid change, of mass migration, of urbanization, baseball teams came to represent groups of people. The allegiance to the team bound people together. And for the men who played the game, professionally or not, it was an opportunity to demonstrate their masculine qualities and to show off their skills. The tremendous popularity of baseball meant that Americans began talking of it as the national pastime. By 1903, two professional major leagues, the American League and the National League, were operating. And by 1908, baseball had its anthem, Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Commercial baseball had arrived, and for Theodore Roosevelt, this was a deplorable development. He wrote, commercialism, though sometimes inevitable, is always an unhealthy element in any sport. And when it becomes the chief factor in continuing the sport's existence, it is time for that sport to be brought to an end. Well, of course, baseball wasn't brought to an end. Baseball thrived. But if baseball is the epitome of middle-class American and working-class American sport, golf was emblematic of the upper class in the Gilded Age. Golf, along with swimming and tennis, the so-called country club sports, became a craze for wealthy Americans in the Gilded Age. Transplanted from Scotland, the first course was of course called St. Andrews after the famous Scottish Lynx. The first professionally designed course funded by William K. Vanderbilt was built on Long Island. Golf found a ready audience in the urban centers of the United States and even spread to the South when wealthy Americans went to places like Florida for winter. Golf was a way for rich men to imitate the British aristocracy they so admired. And of course it attracted an elite audience, but unlike cricket, women played golf. In 1894, the first women's tournament was held in New Jersey, and it was a woman, Isette Miller, who invented handicapping. But golf carried elitist connotations, and indeed, it was so much an elite sport that, of course, as you know, Taft was warned by Theodore Roosevelt to avoid playing golf, and certainly to avoid being seen playing golf, because for a public figure, golf is fatal to one's reputation. 
Nevertheless, middle-class Americans followed elites into the golf courses and the game grew in popularity as the number of country clubs expanded and their entry fees and the dues fell within the incomes, the discretionary income of middle-class Americans. But golf and baseball would pale in comparison compared to the sport of football. As the crusade for physical fitness represented by muscular Christianity and the strenuous life showed, Wealthy Americans were, by the 1880s, moving away from the idea that a life of luxury and ease was a life well lived. Instead, competitive sports became associated with character building, with teaching desirable traits such as respectability, integrity, and sportsmanship, and were seen to carry the strenuous life into college life. In football, it is the elite institutions who took the lead. If you think about basketball, basketball was born in the YMCA. Think about golf. Golf emerged on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Think about baseball. Baseball emerged in drinking clubs in the New York's metropolitan area. But football was a product of American higher education. It developed in elite institutions like Harvard and came to embody muscular Christianity. Football led the way for sports to become an integral part of higher education in a way that it simply is not in Europe or indeed in most of the rest of the world. Football originated as an unacceptable game. It originated in 1827 as a dangerous Harvard initiation rite, an initiation rite that often resulted in broken legs and noses and torn ears and all the rest of it. Yale students, loving a bit of fun, copied that Harvard initiation right. And those two universities would become the dominant universities in American football. Football, as it grew into a sport, resembled rugby. The sport of rugby was invented in the school of the same name back in England, supposedly when a player playing rugby by the name of William Webb Ellis got sick of the idea that you could only pass the ball backwards. He picked it up and ran with it forwards and created a new sport. They were playing soccer. He picked up the ball. He ran with it. Rugby was supposedly invented. That's like the origin myth of baseball, a myth, but it's a lovely story. What it offers, though, is the idea that private schools soon began, private schools in England soon began to play rugby as well. They emulated that game of rugby. In 1876, Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Princeton formed the Intercollegiate Football Association. And their football did indeed look like rugby with an emphasis on the kicking game. And one of the players in these early games at Yale University was a man by the name of Walter Camp. Walter Camp is justifiably remembered as the father of American football. As the coach at Yale University, he introduced rule changes that would forever alter American football. Camp did not like the unpredictable elements of rugby. So he developed the line of scrimmage. The line of scrimmage is the football equivalent of the scrum. In the scrum, you have players from both sides essentially locking horns and trying to push the football, which is put into the middle of the scrum, out to their end. In the line of scrimmage, one team automatically starts with the football. There's no chance about who's going to get the football. So Walter Camp decreed that you could have the football and you could keep the football as long as you could make five yards in three downs. Now, it's important to point out here there was no forward pass because there was no forward pass in rugby. Most important of all for the future of the game, camp replaced the power of the captains with the power of the coach. Because he was working full-time in a watch factory in New Haven, Connecticut, he sent his wife Alice to observe practices and take notes, and then he would call the captains over to his house, they would talk about the practices, they would read through the notes, and he would deliver his idea for the strategies for the practices and for the games. And his system worked. Between 1872 and 1909, when Walter Camp was the coach at Yale, Yale's football team won 324 games, they lost 17, and they tied 18. 
I wonder if Yale has won 324 games since Walter Camp retired. I don't know. Probably they have. Camp sent former players around the country. He sent them to spread the gospel of football and to coach college teams. He wrote coaching manuals. He invented the All-American team and chose it himself. He helped to publicize the game and he helped to create the sport as we know it today. Harvard and Yale, of course, no longer dominate the game of football, but we should not be surprised it developed at elite Ivy League colleges because the game, as Walter Camp and other prophets of football saw it, exemplified the values of muscular Christianity. As you know, TR attended Harvard, but he did not, of course, play football there. His son, Ted, eldest son, Ted, did, however. Most famously, Ted had his nose broken by opposing players and was often on the end of rough treatment because, well, you know, they're playing against the president's son, so why not beat him up a bit? This is a photograph taken at the end of his final game playing football. He was only a freshman. He only played for less than a full season. His, in his final game, he broke his ankle, and that was it. He was done. That injury ended the 130-pound Ted's football career. And while TR praised Ted for his fortitude and set about reforming football, football caught the mood of the elite precisely. Football taught obedience to authority, specialization at work, and cooperation with others. And for Theodore Roosevelt, it taught the virtues of a strenuous life. Of course, TR would find the college football of today unacceptable, and we know that because he gave a speech at Harvard in 1905 when he complained about college sports becoming too professional back then in 1905. He said, it is a bad thing for any college man to grow to regard sport as the serious business of life. It is a bad thing to permit sensationalism and hysteria to shape the development of our sports. And finally, it is a much worse thing to permit college sport to become in any way or shape tainted by professionalism or by so much as the slightest suspicion of professionalism. Well, in an age when the two highest paid public servants in many states around the country are the flagship university's head football coach and the flagship university's head basketball coach, you can imagine what TR would say about that development. So let me draw things to a close here and give you a chance to ponder possible questions. It's fair to say that though TR did not play football, he actually loved the sport. For him, football exhibited all the benefits of the strenuous life of self-sacrifice, of regular physical exercise, and of bravely confronting challenges. But this violent, brutal, and sometimes deadly sport had to be regulated. And as Professor Swanson will explain later today, TR took the lead in trying to make football a safer sport. Theodore Roosevelt himself, of course, was unafraid of physical activity. Um, anyone who dared to accept an invitation or a summons to meet him at the White House understood the risks involved that might involve a tennis match. It might involve a point-to-point -point walk through Rock Creek Park. There would undoubtedly be some kind of exercise involved if TR considered you uh, virtuous enough to engage with him. As Mike Cullinane reminded us last night, meetings in the president's office could easily become physical activities, and members of the tennis cabinet were, were chosen that way. Like many people, TR felt Americans, despite his love of tennis, were becoming lazy. He wanted to set an example, and he was unafraid to allow journalists to report on his horse riding, on his strenuous walks, and to report on, if not photograph, his tennis matches. Commerce and materialism had, critics at the time proclaimed, created a nation of weaklings, and the nation needed physical exercise. It had lost sight of physical fitness. <coughs> Workers sitting at their desks had become a nation of loafers, and instead of meeting the physical challenges and benefiting from the hard outdoor labor pre-industrial society offered the vast majority of people, America's industrial economy was fueled by paper as much as it was by coal. For TR and others concerned about the loss of physical labor, about the emphasis on materialism, and on the way men, and they were primarily worried about men, were pushed into meaningless lives of luxury and comfort, this tendency had to be arrested. As TR's friend and Navy expert Alfred T. Mayen wrote, contemporary society had become obsessed with, quote, worship of comfort, wealth, and general softness, 
And indeed, some argued, without a war to fight and without a frontier to conquer, Americans had indeed succumbed to Mayan's general softness. Hence, for TR and other advocates of the strenuous life, football was the perfect sport. It was a miniature, carefully controlled form of warfare inculcating martial values. The command structure, leading from coach on the sidelines to quarterback and captains on the field, all the way down to the lowliest of linemen, and I say that in quotation marks because I have heard that linemen are among the most intelligent players on the field, down to the lowliest of linemen, football taught obedience to those in authority. Teamwork was essential, the kind of teamwork that be carried, could be carried into a business hierarchy, into any kind of collective activity. Football was, if you like, the most obvious example of G. Stanley Hall's explanation for how humans develop through play. The cooperation vital to the efficient functioning of a football team could be translated into a myriad of settings across the country. It should be obvious by now that the strenuous life left its mark on the sporting landscape. From pastimes to commercial spectacles, sports became professionalized big businesses and adherents of a strenuous life for all watched helplessly as the number of desk jobs grew and as the number and reach of commercial sports also expanded. TR advanced the strenuous life but grew concerned about the power of commercial sport. In the fifth year of his presidency, he gave a speech at Harvard University in which he said, I think our effort should be to minimize rather than to increase that kind of love of athletics which manifests itself not in joining in the athletic sports but in crowding by tens of thousands to see other people indulge in them. And toward the end of his life, as war threatened in Europe, he worried about the physical state of American manhood. For him, for TR, preparedness meant being physically and mentally ready for war. He wrote in 1915 that the indispensable thing for every free people to do in the present day is, with efficiency, to prepare against war by making itself able physically to defend its rights. And yet, he and so many others feared that America was not prepared. The spiritual and physical values of muscular Christianity needed to be promotion, and TR, to the end of his days, promoted them publicly and privately. Thank you. Simon, that was splendid. That was a tremendous uh, foundation for our conversation. And I know the audience has questions, and we have ample time. We have about uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes here. So let me start by asking this question. Um, you know, you talked about class, golf and tennis at sort of the top echelon of America trying to imitate the Brits, and then baseball is more working class and middle class and so on. Can you talk a little bit about race and the development of American sport? Because there was heavy segregation, of course, and we all know uh, the recent history of this. But talk a little bit about what was going on with recent immigrants and with African Americans or Native Americans all, as these dynamics began to play out. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Clay. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, and luckily, I have 20 minutes to answer it, so I'll give it a go. Of course, for African Americans, this was a segregated society and sports were equally segregated, although baseball was something of an exception. There were African American athletes playing baseball at a professional level until, uh, and I can't remember the year, I think it was 1905, 1906, when a Chicago Cubs captain refused to take the field against an opposing team because that team had an African American player. And from that moment on, and the Cubs at the time were in the National League, of course, from that moment on, the, the color bar was erected. And so for African Americans, there were limited opportunities to play organized sports, certainly limited opportunities to play organized sports on fields that we would consider to be adequate. The gymnasiums and the playgrounds of the um, Chicago South Park District were also segregated. 
the, uh, the whole thrust of muscular Christianity was a racist thrust. It was a social Darwinistic thrust. It was an ideology that said, yes, we have to make sure that white Americans and in the UK, white Brits were physically able to demonstrate both the fitness to rule and then also to survive and climb to the top of the social ladder. As for um, Native Americans, the sport of lacrosse, of course, is becoming incredibly important today. And lacrosse was a sport that was documented by French missionaries as early as the early 17th century. And so um, uh, Native Americans have certainly contributed to the sporting landscape in a way that perhaps has become increasingly recognized. Another possible crossover sport is boxing. Um, boxing was incredibly popular in the United States in the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. And some of the most important fights and fighters, you mentioned Louis Sullivan yesterday, some of the fights and fighters were uh, both national events and the fighters themselves were national and sometimes international celebrities. And so boxing provides an example of a sport where if a white fighter was willing to enter the arena with an African-American fighter, then there was the possibility for that kind of contest. But it was very rare, especially in the Gilded Age. And could be controversial. So at the end, you talked about TR's admiration for football, but he didn't play it himself. And when you tried it, I was thinking while you were talking, well, what did he do? And his, he was not so much a team sport person as an individual or bipolar sportist. So judo, boxing, wrestling, uh, hiking, but these are more individualistic. You know, did he have theories of individual versus team? I can well imagine that, I don't know. The answer is I don't know. But I can imagine that, being an academic, I'm going to take a stab at it anyway. I can imagine that TR would have read and understood the theories of G. Stanley Hall, and so he would have appreciated the, um, the virtues of team sports as a, uh, not necessarily a higher form of sport, but certainly as a sport that, uh, that taught values that were important to the strenuous life and important to this industrializing nation. But even, say, in point to point, that's not a team activity. It's can you keep up with me? And under certain circumstances, if you're, if you're struggling up the cliff in Rock Creek Park, we might help you up. But it wasn't let's go out together and find a way up that hill. It's can you keep up with me? So that heavily individualistic nature of Roosevelt is really striking to me compared to the team sports that were beginning to develop all around him. Yeah. And he's in that, um, that famous puck image trying to get Taft through the hoop. But there's no evidence that he ever played basketball, is there? Not that I know of, no. Yeah. no. So, and that really made me also think during your talk about muscular Christianity. What, when was the high point of it and why did it, how did it fade and become less important in the 20th century? It was a victim of its own success and it was a victim of a secularizing society. Um, Muscular Christianity was always the ideology of a small proportion of the population as an overt ideology. It did influence sports, obviously, and it influenced the playground movement. And it had a tremendous impact on the way in which wealthy and influential Americans looked at life and looked at their society. Muscular Christianity was a slogan more than a movement. And the, the originators of muscular Christianity, Charles Kingsley and Thomas Hughes, initially rejected the term. They didn't think that what they were writing about, they were novelists, they weren't necessarily writing about some kind of great um, campaign or crusade. Certainly, the ideals of muscular Christianity influenced the YMCA, the YMCA as we know it today, to some extent still combines the, the ideals of a an active spiritual life with a competitive athletic landscape. Now, I suppose that most of us think of the Y as a place where you have a swimming pool and a field house and some uh, 
sport grounds, sports fields outside. Um, but it's still the Young Christian Men's Association, although of course they have uh, now admit women as well, and the YMCA, I suppose, is the longest lasting legacy of muscular Christianity. So I was struck by several of the quotations that you put up, um, which make it seem as if, if TR could observe us he'd be appalled. Um, 65,000 people in a stadium watching other professionals, some of them paid 12, 15, 30 million dollars per annum, play on their behalf, and then fantasy leagues which don't require any sweating, uh, gambling which is increasingly prominent now in all commercial sport, um, his anxiety about the professionalization of college athletes, imagine what he would say today. Uh, Talk about that. So is he just out of date or was he right and we've really failed to understand the meaning of sport? Yeah, that's a tough question because there is an intense physical fitness movement in the United States today. You can't go to any small town in the United States without seeing at least one uh, physical fitness exercise um, franchise. And so TR was, I think, both of his time, but also strangely ahead of his time. I mean, if you look at college football today, especially at Division I college football, and, and I enjoy watching the game as I'm sure most of us here do. Nonetheless, what we're watching are amateur athletes who are being paid with a college degree, a college degree, or at least with a college experience, which is incredibly constrained by the fact of their being members of these sports. They can't take classes at certain times because they have practices. They can't take times at classes at certain times because they have film. They can't do all sorts of things that other students can do to get to wring the full life out of college. And at the same time as these young athletes are taking the field, they're generating millions and millions of dollars in wealth. Well, in the United States, we like to say that those who generate the wealth should benefit from the wealth. Well, the only benefit that college athletes are getting is the scholarship that enables them to be students. And that scholarship is in many cases contingent upon their continuing to play the sport. They're generally one year renewable scholarships and that's a product of the 1970s before 1973 i think it was athletes were guaranteed four years of support whether they got injured and couldn't play or not anymore that's simply no longer the case and so as they're generating all this wealth as they're appearing on television and of course part of the attraction i get it for a 19 or 20 year old young man, part of the attraction is that you're going to be on ABC television on Saturday afternoon. You're going to be on ESPN virtually every time you play. I get that, I understand it. But nonetheless, TR would look at that and say, we have lost the idea of what education is about. When we are strangling the humanities, when, when we are avoiding the fact that higher education should be a place of critical education. When we are applauding for all the right reasons, Dickinson State University for making an incredible contribution to and commitment to the humanities and to history specifically, TR would say, yes, that's fantastic. Thank you, DSU. What about the rest of you? What are you doing? And the answer is, well, we're busy watching football and we're busy generating grants and we're busy worrying about things that are perhaps secondary to teaching young people how to think, how to see the world and how to mature. Not what to think, not what to see, but how to equip you with the tools you need to succeed. That would be, in an ideal world, the sole college outcome. Oh, wonderfully said. Thank you for that. So, Simon, apropos of that, it always strikes me as so ironic when you're watching some sporting event on television, a collegiate sport, and the announcer says, this coach is really an extraordinary man because he cares whether his students get a degree. You think that has to be 
extraordinary, but it is, of course, um, or it's often the case. So just one last question, and then the audience. Uh, so much of this originates in England. So we borrow from English sport, even baseball. Uh, rounders, right. Indigenous sport, basketball. Uh, what else have we done that isn't dependent in some way or other on British precedents? Jazz? No, I mean sport. <laughs> sport, my friend. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. What other American sports are there? Uh, hmm. Volleyball. Okay, yeah, badminton. volleyball, another YMCA sport. That's true. Yep, mm -hmm. that's right. And there are others. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry? Bowling. Bowling, yes. Ping pong. Well, we didn't do ping pong. <laughs> Is NASCAR a sport? Can you get in a car and drive fast? Well, now we're on sports? dangerous ground. Now you're, you know, let me remind you, you are in the state of North Dakota, my friend. Uh, so let's see what's on the audience's mind. Uh, yes, beginning here. It, I have the impression muscular Christianity is a, it's a, it's a very Protestant uh, set of ideals. So my question is, how did the Catholic Church respond to it? And with the rise of parochial Catholic schools, is there anyone within that who's kind of like an individual uh, community who embraces it or is there a tendency to reject it? How's the Catholic Church? Simon, we need to repeat the questions because of the people streaming. So, so uh, th he sees this as largely a Protestant movement. What about Catholics and, and the rise of parochial schools? How does this play a role in all of these developments? Uh, so for... Um, Yes, it is primarily a Protestant movement, and yes, Catholics initially rejected it as an ideology. In part, of course, because it's aimed at immigrants, especially Catholic immigrants. And so I hinted at it, but the primary, if you like, the primary targets of muscular Christianity in the United States avoided the muscular Christians. So where the playgrounds in Chicago found a ready audience among middle-class kids, not so, not so much amongst immigrant kids. Part of that, of course, was because of the pressures of work. I mean, we don't outlaw child labor in this country until the New Deal, and so immigrant families are reliant largely upon the entire family working, including children. In terms of who within the Catholic hierarchy would have either overtly rejected or perhaps quietly supported muscular Christianity or the ideals of physical education? I do not know the answer to that question. It's a good question because, of course, today, parochial schools have excellent, generally have excellent um, athletic facilities. One of the attractions of going to a parochial school can be precisely that. Catholic leagues are known for producing fine athletes across the country. And so... Yeah, I don't know. That's, a, that's an interesting one to ponder. And this is the first of many times I'll be saying I don't know today. Here's a question, yes. Hey, Dr. Carter, you, you mentioned uh, race and ethnicity in sports. And uh, when I think about James, uh, Jim Thorpe, who went to the Olympics in 1912, being a, a national sensation, did TR ever comment on that? Did TR ever comment on James Thorpe? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. See, there it is again. However, um, so of course, Thorpe would have represented an assimilated Native American. And so in that sense, he would have been seen as an success example story, of the yeah. success, yeah, of the success of, of, of Americanization. Uh, over in this, yeah. Does, Does the Roosevelt have opinions on the Olympics? Olympics? <laughs> the Olympic <laughs> movement was so close to the end of his time in, in, in office that no, I don't think he did. I mean, I don't. The Olympics were pretty disorganized in the United States. The, I mean, the, the, the first attempts by the United States to enter athletes into the Olympics were notable failures. Um, there was no system to choose athletes. There was no understanding of what those events might be over there in Europe. And so 
unlike today where the Olympics are an incredibly well-oiled machine and that every country has its Olympic committee that makes sure the facilities and the time are available to elite athletes, that simply wasn't the case in TR's lifetime. Yes, sir? Yeah, part of the answer, I think, to the uh, day and the uh, culture is how commercialism got both in trouble. And so the tragedy there, both Native American and commercialism and sport, it kind of is too bad. A real quick question, about, or not a question, but I love the story of the individual approach and the defense of Teddy towards Abe, the newspaper boy, and how he became a boxer and they took boxing into the Navy. It's a wonderful story. If you haven't read it, Rose out of the newspaper boy and taking boxing. Yeah. Yeah. Did you just have a question? Just a comment. So a comment on commercialization and James Thorpe and then uh, his advocacy of young people using boxing as a way up. Yes, let's go over here to Michael. Simon, thanks for That was wonderful. And I just wanted to ask you, uh, Robert Lee said this period was about a search for order. And I was wondering if you could uh, compare the idea of that search for order, all the rule books that you put up, I think the British uh, come up with the, the rule book for soccer in this time period. How does that compare with the idea of play that Dee Stanley Hall was talking about? What's the playoff between order and play? Order the play. play. Yeah, play and order go together exceptionally well in G. Stanley Hall's universe because, of course, he wants it to be structured. And so if you allow play to be completely free of any kind of rules or even any kind of direction, then you're going to lose mature adults, according to G. Stanley Hall. So the age of order is a perfect metaphor for what's happening in sports. I mean, that's one of the reasons, of course, that Walter Camp moved away from the scrum to the line of scrimmage was because it's more orderly because you can predict what's going to happen and that predictability is important and the rule changes that american football experiences in the early ages are to make it both more of an entertaining spectacle but also to make it somewhat more controlled so that the coach can keep command of what's happening on the field by sending in the plays, by training the players to perform certain plays. It's a, it's a very structured, orderly sport. Uh, Ryan? Uh, did TR or others kind of draw the line between a country's uh, participation in sports and their military prowesses, kind of like war game preparation for folks that would be in the infantry or the cavalry. And that's, that's a great, a great question. question. You know, the, where, where does this begin, begin to sort of lead into preparedness and Plattsburgh and so on? Yeah, yeah very, very much so. I mean, Plattsburgh is a great example because um, Archie went to, to Plattsburgh. Archie was, of course, um, uh, TR's second son. Mm -hmm. And TR looked down on Archie a little bit because he saw him as a physical weakling and forced him to take extra exams at Groton to get into Harvard. And um, Nonetheless, Archie matured and excelled at Plattsburgh. And so that, that fear of the lack of preparedness, that fear of the lack of readiness for war is one of the motivating factors for funding a sporting infrastructure. Now, of course, preparedness for war in an ideal world is preparedness for avoiding war. So you could argue that what TR is asking for is not so much a belligerent country as a, for a strong country that no other country would dare invade. And that was part of the concern. Lazy Americans, as, as they were seen, were a danger to the country because someone else, maybe Germany, maybe Britain, maybe France, would invade American territory secure in the knowledge that Americans couldn't fight back because they've been spending all their time um, watching football and reading books. But you... You will acknowledge that in addition to TR's belief that the best defense for the country is to be well prepared, there was a certain thirst for war in Roosevelt. He thought of war as cleansing, that uh, we need a war from time to time. We need to tune ourselves up. We need to challenge ourselves in the world's arena. It wasn't as if he thought in the ideal world there will be no war. Um, he just wanted wars that were manageable for success. 
Of, and yes, and that's part of the social Darwinism of the age, where, where wars are indeed seen as necessary in order to demonstrate one's fitness for survival, in order to make sure that countries that aren't fit don't survive. And so, yes, I would say that is an excellent counterbalance to my somewhat more <laughs> pacific tale. Go ahead. Given the obvious racism during the Gilded Age, what would TR think today of Majority of college basketball football teams being of African American. Yeah, calls for speculation, but today the great majority of, of athletes in, in collegiate sports are African American. Uh, would he have thoughts about that? I think TR would have no trouble with it, in part because he was open to African Americans. Um, I know he has some stains on his record there as well, but. You could argue that by the standards of the time, he was perhaps a little bit more progressive than most Americans. And you could also argue, I think, that he would understand that sports ultimately are an expression of merit. And so if you are good enough to become the starting quarterback or to become the center for a college team, then there's nothing wrong with that. I have a few more minutes here. Who has not asked a question? So yes, go ahead. Thank you very much for the stimulating conversation or your talk. But uh, uh, jumping around here, uh, year 2022, I, I will support and cheer for any land grant college before I will cheer for a church supports university. I do. I, uh, you just think of all the great church supported colleges, Notre Dame, Creighton, Gonzaga, Baylor, whatever, but I still love the land grant colleges, North Dakota State, Montana State, and that. Uh, and then, but then you drop it down to the NAIA level, and you get to the playoffs, and I believe it is the church schools that dominate that in the playoffs in football. So I'm, I'm not, not sure, sure what to make, make of that, except that. Um, yeah, I know. I, I'm off the wall. <laughs> <laughs> so that. The, the interplay and tension maybe between um, Notre Dame and Loyola and schools like that and then the land grant institutions that he prefers. So of course Notre Dame is an interesting example because we know Notre Dame in large measure because of its football team. It's quite a small school in an obscure corner of the greater Chicago area. And nonetheless, it has become a football powerhouse. Um, Notre Dame thanks in large measure to a coach by the name of Newt Rockney, was able to garner a tremendous amount of support from the Chicago area. And we talk about the subway fans or the, um, the fans who travel down to South Bend on the electric trains to watch Notre Dame games. For those universities, sports, as for every university, is a way to recruit students. And you could certainly understand that investing in sporting facilities, investing in the recruiting, would be central to universities that don't necessarily have um, a natural constituency outside of their particular faith, tradition, or their particular um, concerns. And s athletics becomes a way of gaining a tremendous amount of prominence and advertising. And it's a commercial bargain that I think that we are still reckoning with both in the land grant institutions, Iowa State, the school where I teach is a land grant, it's Iowa's land grant institution. In fact, it was the first land grant institution in the United States, the first charter land grant institution. And it is a place where we still deal with that tension between being a place where we want to train virtually anyone who wants to get and is, is, is qualified to earn a college degree, but also to become an elite sporting institution. And those two goals are perhaps not always um, compatible. And you can see the same tension in um, Catholic schools as well, in, in, in university, at the University of Notre Dame. And Baptist and so on. Let's do uh, two more questions, yes. Yeah, well, uh, Ryan may speak to this, but where does TR fit in the establishment of the NCAA? Yeah, he was one of the loudest voices calling for the regulation of, in this case, American football. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I will 
let Ryan talk about that this afternoon. But yes, he's there, definitely. One more. Yeah, yeah I just have a quick question. So 20-ish percent of the population in the target group uh, qualifies for military service right now. And a massive driver of that is still a low point right now. A massive driver of that is poor physical fitness. In our youth, we're missing recruiting roles, roles in the Army and the Air Force. So I, I guess the question is, what are we doing that's actually failing to prepare for future wars and to have a population that's ready to go fight um, versus what has been done in the past? And if what PR did was successful, or what he promoted was successful, but we're failing now to be prepared for our future wars physically. Yeah, let me just do it. It's about preparedness and, 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 and recruiting and how difficult it becomes when you have a um, population of people that are not physically fit enough really to pass muster. Let me just contextualize that a bit, Simon. You know, so TR institutes the 50-mile hike for people in the Army and does it himself. And he has a 100-mile horseback ride. And he very much wanted a more strenuous population and a more prepared population. Then the sort of goes down, and you hear again in, in John Kennedy's administration during the Cold War, an obsession with making sure we can compete with the Russians by being, and Kennedy called for physical fitness, and this became a pretty widespread movement today. The leader in that is your Fitbit, who says, get up out of your chair, you haven't stretched for a while. You know, it's, 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 it's commercial activity that's driving this, not government or policy. So can you speak to preparedness and the flabbiness of the American population? So I'm going to speak from a position of observation and ignorance rather than any position of strength and intelligence. But oh, good. From, my, <laughs> from my perception, nutrition might play a role here because I don't think we're eating perhaps as healthily as we ought to. And um, yeah, compared to much of the rest of the world, the American diet, and the American diet is spreading to the rest of the world, unfortunately, isn't the healthiest. And so my suspicion is part of that lack of energy, part of that... Um, failure to meet the physical standards of the armed forces is at least in part down to what people eat and drink. And how sedentary we are. One last question, and then I know the president has a gift for you. So for TR, there's a double anxiety, and anxiety is a, the term I want you to talk about. Um, he has personal anxiety that he was a uh, weakling, that he had to make his body, that he had to prove something, and he spent a lifetime doing that, often recklessly. But he also had social anxiety when he looked around and saw the urbanization of the country. Can you just talk about the, the you know, it's, it's not all positive. There's an anxiety element in Roosevelt. Oh, absolutely. Um, TR was worried for the future. He was incredibly concerned that the country that he saw developing around him was a country that was destroying people as much as it was perhaps enabling them to grow and to live and to survive. And so the materialist values that increasingly came to dominate American life were values that TR worried were getting in the way of, if not necessarily a spiritual life, at least an intellectual engagement with the world around you. TR was a great reader, a, 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 a prolific author. He was always engaged with his contemporary world. And much of that engagement was at the level of concern, at the level of we are destroying the very people that we need in order to thrive and grow as a society. Thank you so much. The president has a gift for you. I hope it's barbells. And the Bible. Simon Cordery. So Tyler Dewan is um, here to talk a little bit about muscular Christianity and Christian athletics and uh, leadership in athletics. And we're so glad because we wanted to include local people who are actually in the arena. And so please tell us uh, your view here. My name is Tyler Doonan and I serve the campus of Dickinson State University uh, for almost a decade um, through the Ministry of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And to be honest, when I got the call uh, to say, hey Tyler, would you be available to come and speak on muscular Christianity, I thought it was a setup. Because it's a female voice on the other end of the phone and I'm like, in today's day and age, like, am I being set up or is this like the real deal? Um, I'm thankful this is the real deal, uh, and I'm thankful uh, for the time served here at Dickinson State University. 
Uh, normally, this is the point where I would say welcome colleagues, fellow students, faculty. Well, none of that works for me because I'm, I'm neither. Um, so today you are all friends. Is that okay? And I've never had an enemy longer than one conversation. So at the end of this, you really are my friends. Um, today's invite is pretty special for me. We can go an entire lifetime without understanding the impact that we have during different seasons of our lives. And so to the coaches of DSU who thought that I would be a good fit for this, I thank you. Um, it was a joy and an honor to serve you and your teams for almost a decade. And who knows, I might come out of retirement once my future Hawks hit the campus. We might have to wait a minute since they are seven, five, and three, and one is due around Thanksgiving. So the athlete in the arena, we are all gathered here today around this topic because of one man, Theodore Roosevelt. And for obvious reasons, he cannot be with us today. But he doesn't have to be for us to walk in the impact that he made during his time here on earth. As I was thinking about today in my time of reflection, I settled on two topics, Teddy Roosevelt and trophies. And now almost three years removed from my position here at Dickinson State University, uh, I can reflect on my time, but when I was in it, the arena, my focus was to mirror, to mirror the one who saved my life. In case you're wondering, his name is Jesus. To live a life that attracted others to find their faith. You see, faith and athletics were the perfect fit for me, and they still are. My athletics now look more like watching dance recitals and soccer games teaching fundamentals to my children in the backyard, having to constantly remind myself that they're just kids. Every day, though, I can hear the invitation from the sidelines, the dugouts, the hardwood, the fairways, the wrestling mat, and the rodeo grounds. Our arenas come in many shapes and sizes, yet they all have the ability to transform a life. During my ministry with Fellowship of Christian Athletes here at DSU, I learned a lot about why we compete or get in the arena. In my almost decade of serving this campus, I never once heard of an athlete coming to DSU because they wanted to lose or just because they wanted to have fun. They said yes to being a Blue Hawk because they wanted to win. We have a rich history of winning. Just look around campus and you will find trophy, case, trophy cases full from top to bottom. And although trophies are nice to look at, um, they hold really no value at all. Most of them are made from cheap wood and fake metal, and I'm just being honest. But the real value is in what they represent. Every year this school honors a different team from the past and puts them in the Hall of Fame. Old teammates gather to be celebrated as they should. They reconnect and share stories. They catch each other up on life and family, and they say yes to relationship. One thing is missing though, the trophy. Not once have I seen a group of athletes huddled around talking and right there in the middle is this piece of metal and wood. You see, trophies represent relationship. As the leader of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, relationship with athletes and coaches was my goal. I wasn't coach or teacher, fellow student or roommate. I was neutral. I was a shoulder and an ear, as well as a voice of encouragement. My investment into someone's life was not dictated by wins or losses. And if I'm being honest, it was in the losses where we bonded on a deeper level. Some of our athletes at FCA did not win trophies, did win, but others did not. And it was a joy to watch men and women navigate the emotions of it all. I was not the one competing on the field or on the court, yet daily I had an opportunity to win. See, trophies represent relationship. There are two F words that come to mind when I think of Teddy Roosevelt, family, and football. We will start with the lesser of the two, football. Did you know that Teddy Roosevelt saved football? Shameless plug, if you haven't read the book, 
Go ahead and do it. It'll bless you. And yes, that sign out there says that he played a minor role, but this is about Teddy, so why not lift Teddy up a little bit? Um, we could also thank Mr. Camp for his contribution uh, into the sport that really changed my life. I would not have had the opportunity to compete at the collegiate level or be involved with FCA had it not been for Teddy Roosevelt hands involved with athletics. I believe that Teddy knew then what I know now. It's the inner development as well as the relationship building that mark the athlete. Every time Teddy looked at a boxing glove, I'm confident he didn't go, boy, that's a nice glove. No, Teddy would have been reminded that he did something that nobody thought that he could do. He pushed his body to limits that others said he would never achieve. The other F word that comes to mind when I think about Teddy Roosevelt is family. I think of a place not far away from here, roughly 32 miles, um, where I can take my family and enjoy God's creation. A place where we can go as a family and make memories, build our relationship as a family unit. And I think of all the athletes that have now transitioned from athlete to husband and wife to mom and dad. That family I created while serving DSU in the faith realm still has my ear, my shoulder, and my voice. My encouragement for them no longer is shouted from the stands, but it's around dinner tables, births of new children, buying homes, starting new careers, etc., etc., etc. And last but not least, when I think of Teddy, I think of DSU family as a whole. We are blessed with a smaller campus, which allows the opportunity for relationship. Just like Teddy was forever grateful for his time spent in North Dakota, I will forever be grateful for the time and investment into Dickinson State University. Muscular Christianity. I, I, I heard and I caught the glimpse of what muscular Christianity really is today. Um, and the story went like this. Teddy was lowering his children out a window by a rope. Muscular Christianity is an invested father and mother into parenting, right? Muscular Christianity uh, looks a little different, yet mimics and mirrors the same as what they were trying to portray, right? The athletic ministries that exist today, Fellowship of Christian Athletes, Athletes in Action, CAC, which is the Catholic ministry, speaking to the Catholic question earlier, um, they are seriously focused on developing the athlete, um, but I would say that that takes back seat to the faith of such athlete, um, because without faith, you're just a body. Um, but with faith, I've seen the athletes of Dickinson State University overcome tremendous odds. Muscular Christianity looks like me having a conversation with a fifth-year senior in the middle of the season wondering, am I supposed to continue playing? I said, I cannot answer that for you. Um, but God knows, and he'll answer your question. And so through prayer, through time spent together, they're making hard decisions. Muscular Christianity looks like a mob of people coming to arrest Jesus in the garden. And quick draw Peter cuts an ear off. And Jesus could have said, yeah, get him, Pete. But he did not. He grabbed an ear, he reattached it, and he healed the man. And one could say that, oh, he healed his ear so that he could hear the gospel. But it's deeper than that. The man's ear that was cut off was the servant of the high priest, which means that he is next in line to be the high priest. But according to the law, if you have any physical defect, you're not qualified. After Jesus touched him, he completely healed him. There was no defect, which saying, hey, I understand that you're here to harm me, but I still believe in you. And I'm choosing to forgive you and heal you. So muscular Christianity, the Apostle Paul said, I buffet my body, I beat my body. It's of some value. And, and, and where we're at in the U.S. today and, what would you say, the flabbiness of our country, uh, which is attributed mostly to diet. Abs are made in the kitchen. 
You could eat healthy and look like you work out seven days a week. This is a, just a truth and a reality. Um, but the faith and the athlete must coincide for there to be a whole human. And I believe personally, and this is my bias, to live our best life, to be the best athlete we can be, to be the best student that we can be. I don't regret one minute of that decade of my life. I know Coach Orton, when he walks past the hardwood, I know he can hear the echoes too of past games and moments. And, and that moment where we really come alive is in the arena. I had the privilege of spending time with your son through FCA here at Dickinson State University, championing, championing these kids uh, to be the best them that they could possibly be. Um, so muscular Christianity is important. Um, but I think we should look like what Jesus wanted it to look like. Um, so bless you. Thank you for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of the symposium. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to take a break in just a minute. Is Alyssa here? Come on up. I know you were going to introduce Tyler. We were worried about time, but please come up for a moment. My name is Alyssa Buckman. I am currently a freshman here at Dickinson State University, and I am a proud member of the TR uh, program, and I also do jazz band as well. I am going into English education, and I really love being a part of the program because of all of the amazing people I get to meet, whether it's through the program or through things like this. And one of these amazing people was Pastor Doan. To best, well, <laughs> give a wrap up of Pastor Doan, we, want, we wanted to listen to a few of his own words. We chose these questions in hopes that they would inspire everyone to learn more about Theodore Roosevelt, North Dakota, and the Southwestern North Dakota, uh, and Southwestern North Dakota. We have so much rich history in our own area, history just waiting for us to discover our, for ourselves. That discovery could involve a simple trip to Medora or to the new TR exhibit in former Pulver Hall. And these are P Pastor Doan's thoughtful responses to our questions. The first set of questions, why history? Where can people find value in their own lives from learning more about key figures such as Theodore Roosevelt? And Pastor Doan explains, history is the roadmap that leads us to the present and helps us prepare for the future. When we take time to learn about key figures such as Theodore Roosevelt, we have the opportunity to find ourselves in their stories. Every great man or woman in history has gone through adversity in order to find success. Relating to adversity brings about great courage and adds value to our life. And the second set of questions, what's a fact about Theodore Roosevelt that speaks to you personally and why? And Pastor Doan shared and actually spoke about this. Teddy Roosevelt saved football. I had the privilege of playing football at NDSCS and my experiences on the field and in the locker room helped prepare me for the rest of my life. So, um, Chris, take us to our break. We're going to take 15 minutes. So, I, it's long been said there's no more dangerous spot for a speaker than right before people go to food. So, I will always be brief, and whenever you see me stand here, there's food. So, the, uh, a couple of quick things for me. I want to thank, of course, the staff of the TRC, uh, President Easton and the staff here at Dickinson State for making this possible. Rob and Melanie Walton for the generous donation. I'd like to mention that one thing came up here that there's good news. Uh, we recently created a new partnership with the Simon Greenberg Collection. Uh, Grinberg, sorry, uh, I knew I would say that wrong. It is a collection of Pathé newsreels and about a hundred of them involving Theodore Roosevelt. So there was a little concern about not being able to find film about Theodore Roosevelt. We're, we're beginning the process of gathering the collection uh, and taking it through our process of adding metadata to it. Uh, it will begin posting on our website later this fall. So there are brand new films 
that are really, really old films but haven't seen, been seen in a long time of Theodore Roosevelt that will be available on the website. And just to repeat what President Easton said to all of you out in the world, we are always looking for ideas, not just for symposium, but for our collections. Uh, contact me, contact any of the archivists. We're always happy to talk, and occasionally things will just fly over the transom like that where our archivists hadn't seen many of the films. So one of the joys of these symposia is um, casting the net out to find extraordinary people to come and give talks, and I so wanted Ann Blaschke to come to speak to us today. We're really glad you're here. Um, her book is soon to be published entitled Foxes, Not Oxes, Women's Athletics in American Political Culture. That's going to be a joyous romp. But to introduce her is Hillary Moberg. Come on up, Hillary. Welcome, everyone, on behalf of Dickinson State University, the TR Foundation, Dr. Ann Blaschke, and me. My name is Hillary Moberg, and I am a senior in the Theodore Roosevelt Honors Leadership Program. I'm double majoring in human resource management and business administration with a minor in leadership studies. And I'm also in the master's program here, working towards master's degrees in business administration and entrepreneurship. I'm the student body president, a student ambassador, a host of two sports talk shows, Hawk Talk and Blue Hawk Game Day, a member of Phi Beta Lambda and the manager of the softball team. I'm excited to be here today and eager to introduce our next speaker to you all. Dr. Ann Blaschke is a historian of 20th century US political culture at the University of Massachusetts and MIT. She has published articles on political economy, diplomatic history, and athletes in history. She is revising her first book, Foxes Not Oxes, Women's Athletics in American Political Culture for publication. And she's deep in the middle of research for her second book, which is about the dramatic effect of Title IX on American athletics and society. When we asked Dr. Blaschke why history, she said, to study history is to gain essential context on the past by examining the conditions and factors that have shaped people's lives over time. While meticulous research is the baseline of any historical assertion, studying history also requires us to be creative and curious. As a research subject, Theodore Roosevelt is not only fascinating in his own right, but also as an entree to historical forces with present day implications, such as imperialism, corporate regulation, and racial discrimination. Please help me welcome Dr. Blaschke. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. All right, I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you all so much for having me. I'm just gonna make sure my pages are in order real quick. Sorry. Thank you. Okay, I think we're good. All right, so this way, right? Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, before I begin, I especially want to thank a couple people. So, Clay Jenkinson. Sharon Kilzer, Mary Massad, Dr. Chris O'Brien, and Dr. Stacy Cordery um, are hosting me here and played special roles in bringing me here, and I really appreciate that. So it's wonderful to be here with you all at this symposium, an event themed around the athlete in the arena, Theodore Roosevelt, and the development of modern sport. So for women, it's been a long process developing sport, I think, in the United States, and so that word really struck me. While TR and his mentality of the strenuous life will certainly be a lodestar in my talk today, I want to consider a group of people who have been historically received, or who have historically received a lot less attention as athletes in the progressive era, despite being half the population women. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, women claimed public space in which to move their bodies, suddenly becoming visible everywhere, from urban bicycle paths to swimming pools and shocked power brokers at home and abroad. Indeed, between the Civil War and World War I, female athletes became the embodiment of the assertive, confident new woman who demanded the vote, birth control, jobs, and social freedom. But political and social moralists didn't give these away willingly, and leaders like Roosevelt 
played a crucial role in dictating how women's physically active lives would develop. As a charismatic politician, Roosevelt served as a litmus test for how the nation should accept women athletes. There he goes. Roosevelt's approach mirrored, I think, that of civilized men and women. People like him and he himself chose to support female fitness rather than women's competitive sport. In practice, however, active women throughout their lives blurred these lines. So they constantly contested the boundary between fitness and sport from their earliest organized games in the 19th century. My paper is gonna explore this constant tension. So why in the Gilded Age might Americans celebrate women's fitness but fear their sport? Surely dominant athletes, regardless of their sex, fulfilled TR's goal of a strong civilized nation, right? Not exactly. Examining women's sport through the lens of gender enables us to understand this dichotomy. Fitness and sports meant different things in the Gilded Age. The former was appropriate for women while the latter was not. Fitness, as you can see, meant strong muscles, even temperaments, and hardy constitutions. Sport, on the other hand, you can see on the far side, meant the single-minded focus and passion of competition, as well as the hardened muscles associated with manly physiques of the late 19th century. For men of Roosevelt's standing and power, fit women epitomized normative roles as feminine wives and mothers, while serious competitive athletes disturbed these ideals of womanhood, abandoning their maternal responsibilities to push their physical limits for the chance to win. Female athletes then developed women's competitive sport in the US despite male power brokers' commitment to the dominance of men's manly cultural politics through World War I. So I wanna step back now to give some context on women's opportunities to be active before the Gilded Age. Few educational programs allowed exercise for children and any boisterous behavior allowed in boys was shunned in girls. As a result, female frailty was rampant. Social reformer Catherine Beecher, you can see here, lamented in 1855 that American children were feeble, sick, ugly or partially malformed due to lack of exercise. And she tells us that women suffered a terrible decay of female health all over this land, which could only be reversed with healthful exercise and amusements. By the mid 19th century, progressive reformers heeded her advice and created exercise programs for girls and women. Suffragist women also emerged from the Civil War, newly insistent on the right to vote, having endured violence and loss while running their homes alone, and in the cases of Southern black women, claiming their freedom from enslavement. While Congress locked all women out of the right to vote with the 15th Amendment, and working class women saw little respite from unhealthy workplaces, social reformers for the first time succeeded in helping women exercise their bodies at um, kind of the tail end of the Gilded Age, right around the year 1900. So social reformers reimagined healthcare for females in the progressive era. Their goal was to foster women's fitness for motherhood, which was women's ultimate service to the state. Yet the play and games they introduced overlapped with established sports and often inculcated in women a passion that concerned educators. In the late 19th century, reformers designed single-sex environments to protect women from accusations of impropriety and from leering men, mashers, as harassers might be known, who might approach women as they played sports. Wealthy women embraced new gymnasium clubs and country clubs where they fenced, practiced gymnastics, golfed, played tennis, and boxed, among other sports, at the collegiate level, 
educators introduced team sports like basketball. Female students flooded into gyms to play. Basketball illuminates the tension between intended fitness and the ecstatic competitiveness that sport nevertheless engendered. At Smith College, as I think folks heard about earlier, um, physical education director Senda Berenson lauded the strong physiques and teamwork the game inculcated, arguing that women's naturally self-involved personalities were subsumed by the group play. Yet she also worried that the roughness and undue physical exertion of basketball contained a strong influence for evil. Dividing the court into thirds ostensibly made basketball safe for girls while preserving the game's excitement. So the tension between fitness and sport went public in the late 19th century when women got access to the bicycle, a new invention adapted from the unsafe high wheel contraptions previously ridden only by men. When the level two-wheeler hit stores and women learned to ride, men eschewed cycling as effeminate. But they also lambasted women cyclists as manly, unnatural, unattractive, and sexually provocative all at the same time. <laughs> men began mocking what they described as bicycle face, a masculine grimace and glaring eyes developed from fast cycling. You can kind of see one woman who's um, got it going on over there um, in that political cartoon. So doctors, meanwhile, also predicted damage to women, um, but in this case to their reproductive organs, especially during menstruation. In that case, if they rode bikes, they could seriously damage their own chances to have children, in addition to putting themselves in mortal peril. So um, women happily disproved that notion and went on to ride bikes. But for their part, women thrilled to the joy of cycling. It brought them an unmatched degree of independence from men. Bloomers, the new split skirt garment, revolutionized women's active lives. Despite an initial stigma of indecency, professional cyclist Annie Londonderry swore in 1895 that during her bike trip around the world, I quickly saw that this despised garment was the only practical thing to wear, and they won for me everywhere the respect and consideration which a woman has the right to expect. Yet concern for her reputation as a feminine, heterosexual woman, it was very important to her that everyone knew these things, compelled her to add that she had received no less than 200 marriage proposals on her journey, on her journey while rocking the bloomers. And as women began blurring the line more frequently between competition and play, concern for their morality, sexual health, fertility, and purported masculinization grew among national power brokers. Roosevelt was one of those authorities. For Roosevelt, strong women were fit to bear children. Um, I'm sorry. For Roosevelt, strong women who were fit to bear children felt especially important at the turn of the century because of massive social upheaval caused by immigration of Asian and Southeastern European immigrants, all of whom were defined as non-white and therefore threatening to American society. Meanwhile, formerly enslaved blacks were moving north and Native, Native Americans posed a perpetual Western threat. TR, like many contemporaries, worried that the white population would dwindle due to race suicide if white women had trouble conceiving or carrying children, or far worse, refused to have children altogether <coughs> um, by using birth control, divorcing, or any number of other ways of controlling their fertility. So as historians have noted, Roosevelt held white women who he met on the frontier as real exemplars of hardy yet feminine motherhood. Certainly their daily lifestyles required a physical prowess that certainly could translate as athletic skill. So if you think of horse riding or roping, for example. But TR interpreted women's frontier tasks as gender appropriate physical activity that supported men's work. So Roosevelt defined the progressive era as a time of athletic martial manliness at home and abroad. He had an irrepressible zest 
for self-improvement and insisted throughout his political career that Americans adopt the same moralistic, adventurous, civic mindset forged on the frontier as his own. Sport was key, as we know, um, to Roosevelt's transformation from sickly boy to strapping political leader. As president, Roosevelt practiced numerous sports and pressured men nationwide to forge their manliness on the gridiron or in the boxing ring. To invest these rituals with masculine power, they needed to be performed by men in men's spaces. In the progressive era, as new women strode and biked into public spaces, men for whom sports served as a crucible met, therefore, in places just for men in new sex-segregated places. So few women, or few people of color, worked in the White House during Roosevelt's pre presidency, making it um, an ideal location to seamlessly blend work and sport. Mike Cullinane explained Roosevelt's tennis cabinet yesterday, and Roosevelt also brought in elite fighters to take him on in a sport he considered especially masculine, boxing. Innovating further, in 1904, he brought a famed jiu-jitsu master to the White House when numerous practitioners began beating American boxers. And in doing so, he countered anti-Japanese fears of the sport, even as he signed um, the racist gentleman's agreement with Japan two years later, um, ending, um, tacitly ending Japanese um, immigration to the US for decades. So you can see here um, an ad from the New York World um, newspaper um, sort of talking up and explaining how Roosevelt practiced jujitsu. Um, he wrote letters to his sons about it, but just what he got out of the practice in contrast to the ways that he appreciated boxing and how he considered them comparable arts in some ways. Um, and then you can see here the picture of his teacher who he hired to come to the White House. So, Although TR relied on the insular masculine space of the White House to compete with elite athletes, women demanded to participate on their own terms. So frustrated by Roosevelt's exclusion of the White House from the White House, I'm sorry, frustrated by Roosevelt's exclusion of women from the White House, jiu-jitsu demonstration, for example, wealthy women in Washington, D.C. hired the master jiu-jitsu's teacher um, hired his wife to teach jiu-jitsu to them and their daughters. So the girls got a demonstration and their moms did too. Elite women athletes also ran out of patience with game days and modified um, feminized sports contests. American women's steadily growing presence at the Olympic games in the progressive era demonstrates the ships in the night approach, I would argue, of Roosevelt to women's high level sport. So Roosevelt lobbied and was very interested in getting for the United States the third modern Olympic Games for the United States. So like many, he understood the Olympics to be a point of cultural diplomacy that could showcase manliness or supremacy of a country, especially in this time of um, rising European nationalism. So given the exclusive membership of the new International Olympic Committee, and the competition between different countries for the hosting um, position of the Olympic Games, um, Roosevelt and other diplomatic leaders understood the importance of hosting this event. Um, but Roosevelt, for a variety of reasons, did not attend the Games in St. Louis, and he sent his daughter, Alice, instead. So at the Games, American women competed and medaled in archery, and notably, women boxed in an exhibition event, really putting their bodies on display, um, performing this interesting sort of moment of violence as feminine women. So this is an interesting moment for sport, right? And each of these, each of these moments probably could have benefited from the enormous publicity and the kind of press corps bully pulpit that Roosevelt would have brought. All right, so in closing, I'll note that while elite power brokers like Roosevelt didn't embrace women's competitive sport in his lifetime, his continued support of women's fitness into the 1912 election, oh, I'm sorry, there we go, there's our Olympic Games. Um, his continued support of women's fitness into the 1912 election via Jane Addams' settlement house movement did give credence to new women who insisted on taking up space and demanding the vote. 
So Jane Addams' settlement house in Chicago for immigrant girls and women, Hull House, featured the city's first amateur girls basketball team. And as the US president, Roosevelt maintained a supportive relationship with Adams and touted his support for women's suffrage in correspondence with her, as well as on the stump. Fit women, he believed, would make responsible voters. All right, so women's fitness and sport, I think, have come a long way since Roosevelt's presidency. Probably most of you would agree. Competitive women athletes today are celebrated. High school girls' sports participation has increased 840%. This year, a woman is the winner of the NCAA's Theodore Roosevelt Award, known as the Teddy, despite Roosevelt's dislike of the nickname. The accolade honors an NCAA athlete who becomes a distinguished citizen of lifetime achievement in homage to Roosevelt's 1906 mobilization for the NCAA. But the Teddy Trophy, I think, also points up how much work is left to do toward women's equality in sport. Of the 47 women, um, or I'm sorry, of the 47 winners since 1967, only eight have been women, and it took 24 years for the NCAA to select any woman at all, former tennis champion Althea Gibson in 1991. As we considered how to fully support women and fully support women athletes, we'd probably do well to keep Roosevelt's strenuous life and his creative policies in mind. So thank you. Thanks for that. Um, I know the audience has questions, so I'm just a little puzzled about where TR is in this equation. So these dynamics are going on. Do we have evidence of his interest in this, or does he, is he, and most questions about Roosevelt and women, there's a certain ambivalence in Roosevelt. He sometimes is seen as a suffragist, sometimes not. He gave his senior thesis at Harvard about women's rights. Um, but he had certain reluctance on this question and, and largely saw women's fitness as preparing for the sacred business of motherhood. Can you illuminate that a little bit more? Sure. So one thing I was super interested in when I was doing... Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing I was really struck by moving through this project was just the extent to which, regardless of whether he encountered women on the frontier, you know, on bicycles, in the gym, um, it was really their sort of toning up their fitness um, and their sort of preparation for marriage and whether it was the sort of qualities of level-headedness, of the sort of bodily preparedness, um, sort of patience, kind of teamwork. But there are all these different qualities. Um, and I thought the example of women on the frontier was particularly interesting, um, just all the ways that they were doing these incredibly you know, physically challenging feeds um, and maintaining and in these stressful situations. But nevertheless, um, he understood their life's work as very much sort of subsumed in the process of supporting their husband and, you know, becoming, becoming moms. So in that light, I think competitive women or women who had no interest in, you know, childbearing and that's not why they were doing their sport they you know simply wanted to compete i think that that was alienating for many men in roosevelt's sort of position of his station and so you know he says often that women's highest purpose is being mothers and that spinsters as he would have called them and women who use horrors birth control should be socially discouraged and maybe socially punished yeah. It's pretty strong, um, and he also believed that there might be tax incentives for having many children, that we should celebrate mothers of five, six, eight children. Um, this doesn't sound like young women's basketball to me. It sounds like be fit enough to be <laughs> a good mother. You know, I mean, I think that in some ways it aligns with a lot of the, even I think the sort of intellectual training and shaping that went on at women's, um, like the Seven Sisters Colleges and women's undergraduate programs, you know, it's very much sort of shaping women to be, you know, like intellectual mothers, but very much to fit into a family dynamic um, in that time period, at least. 
So I don't know if any of them are planning on having eight children, <laughs> right? But, um, but nevertheless, I think that, um, that that idea of the family dynamic was absolutely at the forefront for most of these women who, you know, nevertheless rejoiced in being physically active. And someone like Berenson is, you know, encouraging them, but limiting their, their space on the court lest they have a problem with their ovaries or a heart attack or something or like that. Or sweat too much, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you continue this research, uh, somebody who's out on the frontier that you might want to look at is Margaret Roberts. Margaret Roberts' husband went away and never came back. She had six children, um, daughters. She raised them herself. She was one of Roosevelt's closest friends. Mm -hmm. And he celebrated her, but not just for having all those children, uh, being able to raise them without the help of her former husband, but also that she was a stalwart of the frontier, that she had the right stuff for building frontier. So he seems to have slightly distinguished the frontier woman from the woman mm -hmm. in Harvard or Boston. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I wonder if he dis distinguished the frontier woman from, you know, like maybe a working class woman who also, like if there were women who had multiple children, like five, six, seven, eight children who were living in more urban environments, like whether those women he would have sort of had the same veneration for, whether there's something about that frontier woman figure. It's like facing the West, you know, is in these unique trials um, and sort of challenging herself and the elements in this, this interesting way to him. Um, so I don't know if that would be a kind of like romanticization on his part um, or a sort of valorization of a woman like her. But yeah, I think that his, his sort of tracing that idealized motherhood um, back to the West is, is important and interesting. And there's also Medora von Hoffman, who was the wife of the uh, Marquis de Mores, and she was she rode side saddle, preserving her ladylike nature, but she also was a crack shot, a better rifle woman than her husband, the Marquis. And Roosevelt clearly admired this. He admired that, that she had the right stuff. And so I'm trying to figure out mm -hmm. how it, it's, it's a very complex subject, and I know it's not your main theme, but Roosevelt's over, all over the map on questions of gender, femininity, mm -hmm. women's role. I doubt that he was as interested in recent immigrants having eight children as he was in Anglo-Saxon yeah. women having them, for example. Absolutely. I mean, that's one thing that I found so fascinating and I'm enjoying hearing about it in other people's talks too, is that I think that he's a very nuanced person and it's impossible to I don't know, make any like vast blanket statement about how he felt about women or even a specific group of women. Um, so it's been really fun to sort of parse through primary sources and look at your guys' website, for example, and really spend time with these papers and just learn. But I think that also it seemed like he, you know, was a learner and as he put himself in these situations where he was exposed to jujitsu or he met women in new situations, like he wasn't afraid to change his mind, it seems to me. And that was something interesting about his views on women, that it was fun to sort of track and observe and try to figure out. Um, but I've, I found the jujitsu stuff around masculinity so fascinating. That was one of my favorite anecdotes. So you used the phrase in your talk, rocking the bloomers, <laughs> which I just loved. Um, but it reminds us that that was then and this is now, to think that there could be controversy over essentially a split skirt or slacks, Definitely. that this was regarded as scandalous and maybe morally appalling, tells us how much has changed, right? I think so. I mean, I'm not sure what others might, might argue. I think that women are still very much scrutinized for the way they present themselves in sport and in public space generally. But yeah, I mean, it's remarkable how much even like these massive pants, you know, <laughs> that basically look like a skirt on the one hand, just were a revolutionary experience for women. Um, you know, you can like straddle a bicycle, you can climb on things, you can, um, you know, go over a fence, you can chase your kids. Um, it completely changes your life when you're wearing pants. And this was their very first experience with that. And maybe the patriarchy wasn't that eager to see that mobility. You know, it was so interesting learning about um, this woman, Annie Londonderry, who became, um, she was just a regular woman, had never ridden a bicycle in her life, and um, learned about a bet that I think just a corporation had made um, anyone who could circumvent the earth on a bicycle. Um, 
I think it was $5,000, but it was this totally mercenary venture. She decided to take them up on it, but she had to earn her own money, um, basically by using her body and her bike as advertising as she went around the world. So she went through China, she went to Europe, she started and she ended in Chicago, but she wore these big billboards all along her bike and wore buttons on her clothes and um, handed out pamphlets in France and worked with the consulates all over the country, like all over the world. But um, she pointed out that um, people really respected her for adopting her bicycling costume and they took her almost more seriously when she was wearing these pants and had this authoritative attitude about, you know, being a writer um, as opposed to sort of being a lady along for the ride. It sounds like a very slow motion with billboards on your side and bicycles of that technology. It took her forever. <laughs> Try that in North Dakota. Yeah. Questions? Yes. Do we have any sense, sense of why TR did not attend, not attend those Olympics in St. Louis in 1903? Right. I mean, I'd love to, if other experts here also have thoughts on that, I'd love to. But I think just given the sort of volatile state of international politics, I think as well as um, the election, um, like being very interested in being elected sort of in his own right, I think, um, rather than just inheriting a term from McKinley. I think that was on his radar. But also with the Russo-Japanese War, the sort of growing nationalism in Europe. He's very concerned about Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany. So I think he had a lot on his plate, to be fair. <laughs> but, and he also, is, um, I think like many people, disappointed that the games were sort of stationed in like, very unglamorous St. Louis, Missouri, as opposed to Chicago, which is a little more chic and where they had been supposed to be. And the Olympics were just fundamentally different then. I mean, this, they, were. Uh, it was, they were just getting back into a new phase after a thousand years. Yeah. And it was all amateur then. And there weren't great costumes. There wasn't money behind individuals and teams. It was a very much different thing from today. Frank. So uh, we're going to move towards Title IX. What, what do yeah. you think that his opinion of Title IX might be? Uh, well, it's the 50th anniversary of Title IX this year, so I've had a lot of fun, a lot of fun thinking about that. Um, so, of course, we don't know. But, um, but, I mean, one thing that I admire about TR is the fact that I think he tried to take a very thoughtful approach to policy and to, to you know, regulating when he thought it was necessary and to making advancements to, to help people um, when he thought he could make a difference. Um, and I like to think that um, the argument for Title IX is an extremely practical one. And he was genuinely interested, I think, in the faith and fortunes of women and women's, um, you know, essential role in, like, the body politic. Um, as far as how he would have felt about utter equality in higher education, I'm not sure. But I like to think that he would have supported it. Yes, ma'am. So both you and Simon have talked about um, women's basketball as to the college, but I'm interested in knowing how long did it take collegiate women's basketball to move westward and to get out to the Midwest and the yeah, great, great question. question. How long did it take basketball to leave, leave the elite, elite east and move through mm -hmm. the heartland of the country? So it took... Um, you know, I would say within, um, let's say definitely by, um, I think after World War One, definitely by World War Two. I think more more state universities were starting to have women's teams, but even schools that did have women's sports teams, women's basketball teams, for example, um, like they're just monstrously underfunded, like shadows of the programs at, um, of the men's programs. So I think like with something like a women's specific school or a single sex women's school, um, it was a very different dynamic than, um, you know, like a large state university, for example, or a large private university where men's sport, um, you know, is basically going to be the only thing operating on campus. Still mostly tokenist. Yeah, go ahead here. <laughs> Did Alice Roosevelt's daughter Alice participate in sports? Do we have 
any sense of whether this is a Stacy question? Maybe did Alice yeah, participate in sports? The answer is no. No. Because she's Alice. Yeah, she, that was her dad's thing. Fair enough. Michael? Uh, go ahead, Michael. And what are the demographics of these teams of women? Um, just from around the country. But uh, uh, or at, all, at Whole House in particular. Well, Whole House, but also maybe more generally. Too. Right. So I think it's an interesting question. I mean, I think. Basketball was one of those sports that just um, kind of like girls' soccer today, but it just spread like wildfire, and I think for a number of reasons, but the team dynamic, the excitement of the play, um, the fact that it was relatively cheap to host a program and to get into, um, it's very exciting. Um, but I think HBCUs were one of the first places really to field seriously competitive women's um, basketball teams, um, ethnic and um, especially Jewish and Catholic. Polish programs had some of the strongest basketball and track and field programs in the country. And a lot of this was based, I think, in, and we see some of this at Whole House, like trying to sort of inculcate Americanism and mainstreaming of these women and children into, you know, a sort of national understanding of how to, how to be properly American. But, um, but because women of color or immigrant women were often seen as sort of less dainty or more naturally suited to harder work or to multiple social roles. Ironically, because of racism, um, it became pioneers in sport in certain specific ways, but especially basketball and track and field. And some of the echoes of that uh, continue to this day. Go ahead. Uh, on uh, women's basketball, the Indian schools, uh, Fort Shaw, Montana, uh, World's Fair, 1904, St. Louis. They won the world's title as they, at that time. Native uh, American women, women at the World's Fair. Fair. Uh -huh. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, there was quite a basketball tournament there for, in 1904. So, yeah. I love that. I think that story gets assumed to the, the 1904 Olympic story. So, okay, so uh, my friend is just coming out. I'm Montana. But, uh, <laughs> and state, state school. school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I'll bring the book tomorrow and let you see. Thank and, you. Yeah, it's, it's well documented. Mm -hmm. Native American basketball is a huge thing on the Great Plains. Uh, yeah. Men and, and women. In, in a later book, uh, book that me in about the 90s, uh, Counting Coup. Yeah, that's called the girls' basketball team at uh, Hardin, Montana. So do, do, do bring, bring that, that in tomorrow if you can. can. Yeah. Over here. Yeah. So first of all, the, the, the dramatic change in technology from the velocipede to the bicycle what do we know? Was, is, there, is there a gender factor of that? Was it redesigned to make it more accessible for women, or was that just a technological change in bicycle technology? So I think with the, with the original model, um, like they're so dangerous, they're so inefficient, um, they're so poorly suited to commuting streets, anything you might use a bicycle for, such as work, um, that in many ways it made sense to adapt and evolve the bicycle to something that actually works you know, and functions efficiently. But I think when they do that and, you know, begin marketing, like realize that there's this vast consumer potential um, in women, um, it is disturbing to men that women can also do it. And so then, you know, like that customer base on the men's side drops off a little bit, I think. But, um, but I think in some ways it's just for practical reasons and with women's skirts and the sort of, you know, the fact that they haven't had access to this technology before, I don't think it was a foregone conclusion that they would adopt the bike. It became almost a craze. And for working women who um, were moving from place to place in like large urban environments, I think it did help out with work 
But um, how about bicycle safety? These cities, which, which, when we see the photographs of them, there are no bike lanes, and even the streets are crowded with carts of vegetables and meat and so on. Um, I think it was pretty manic. <laughs> but I mean, from what I've read, I think it was, um, you know, other folks who are urban historians might, might have thoughts on this, but I think it was just exhilarating for, for what it was. Well, there was no special safety gear? Then. Not that I know. I mean, I think if anything, like the pants kept women from, you know, getting to like, and you know, the women's adapted bar mm -hmm. probably kept them from, you know, falling off. That was the only reason they could even ride or that it occurred to them to purchase the bicycles. But as far as helmets or anything like this, no, I don't Nothing think so. Nothing at the time. President no. Easton? Uh, so uh, this, this goes to your uh, book that's forthcoming, but how much of the Civil War was based on the How much more is there? We dare not let women do that. You know, I think it's a great question. Um, we've come so far. In 1928, um, women were banned from running any distance over 800 meters in the Olympics. And folks have probably seen those pictures, but after middle distance or a sprint, um, men and women tend to gasp and like, you know, be lactic and want to come up to air. And sometimes they lay on the ground and that happens regardless of sex. Um, when that happened after the 800, um, experts argued that there was something wrong with women and that they were too frail and that they might die if they kept running any event over 800 meters. And today, um, you know, we see those distances totally embraced and just eaten up by women. And at the recent world championships, there was this really striking photo that was taken last month of just every women's competitor like laid out gasping on the ground. And instead the commentary was, look how strong these women are. Like they absolutely just gave everything they had. Um, so I think that, um, you know, I don't, I don't know whether we'll start having, you know, more of a crossover almost, or just sort of pushing the boundaries of what women can do and how they can compete. But I think when you think of someone like Katie Ledecky or Simone Biles, um, people who um, are talented beyond measure and also, you know, can push, um, I think can do these unusual things. I think it would be interesting to see where women could go if we broke down some of the boundaries around sport and category and, um, and also made sport safer for women. I guess that's another thing. I think that if, um, you know, women like Simone Biles didn't feel unsafe in their sport, like where could we be in five years if she felt well enough to stay in gymnastics? So I think when we make sports safer for women, you know, who knows what they'll be able to accomplish. Sir. Uh, my daughter's a Division I uh, swimming coach. And they handed the women's training side by side, uh, not the same lane, but uh, in the next lane. Yeah. Uh, they swim the same sets, uh, depending on, you know, what, uh, what group that they're in and everything. How might uh, Theodore Roosevelt view that? Uh, it's one thing to uh, have some women's sports over here, some men's sports over here. But, but basically training together. What would, we're asking speculative, speculative questions. questions. What, what would TR yeah. think of women and men swimming in nearby lanes? Yeah. I think swim teams are somewhat unique in how closely they train together, just in that really intimate space. And a lot of, like, like D1 and D3 programs, like, the men and the women will be in the same lane, and the women keep up, and it's really fascinating. So um, I, again, this is a complete conjecture, and like we can't ask him, but I think that someone of that time period, and even people from not so long ago would probably say that um, given the size of the swimsuits and like the intimate space and how close people are and the goggles, like that that is, um, you know, that that would be inappropriate, that that would be a sort of invasion of personal space and, um, you know, sort of improper. I don't know about that, you know. It, <laughs> so, um, on the other hand, I think that, you know, the students in those situations like hyper perform and like the women do keep up with the men. And um, most of these programs have extremely high rates of success that have co ed practices. So, 
Um, we can't know, but TR loved people that had the right stuff. And if you, you know, he had to get over the late Victorian notion of women as, and domesticity and women and childbearing, but he would have. He would have grown with the country, surely. I can't imagine TR being the same TR today that he was then. I mean, wouldn't he be more likely to be fascinated by the vigor, the strength, the endurance, the gutsiness of these women athletes? I think that he'd, he'd have to back off a little, and he might be a little impressed slash threatened by all of that excellence. You know, maybe. I think of him as a modernizer, right? And I love the idea of that. Um, you know, maybe that now we don't just need women to be excellent at fitness or excellent at sports so that they can procreate, but, you know, because they add something dynamic and um, substantive to the national fabric and, you know, that they can be cultural diplomats or that they, like, sport hugely increases everyone's self-esteem, not just girls, um, or that boys can also benefit and be protected by Title IX. Like, I've had more men come to me and have Title IX issues that have been successfully resolved than I've had women. I think that all of these policies, all of these sort of orders, you know, can help different people and that someone like Theodore Roosevelt would hopefully recognize the expansiveness of women in sport and how that improves educational life and national life for not just women, but men as well and for everyone who plays. I want to turn to Title IX here in a minute. Jim. women equal opportunity on university campuses, uh, but they still haven't had equal opportunity in the professional, at least not in terms of pay. How would, and, and Theodore didn't like professional athletes being paid these big salaries, so how would he react today to the women trying to get their salaries up? Where they should be. Yeah, the, the Brittany Griner case, case, for example, example um, has raised, raised a lot, a lot of, questions of questions about women in sports. And we learned that the highest paid women in, in, in the WNBA are $200,000 per year, where the highest paid men are paying $40 million per yeah. year. The equity difference is appalling. Uh, so the pay scale, but you know, we're watching right now, I think, I don't know how many of you feel this, but the WNBA is kind of moving into a transitionary period where it's getting a lot more national attention. Um, I yeah. think this is, things are changing fast there, don't you? I think so. And um, I mean, I think that in some ways, when women get more attention and more funding and more support at the collegiate level and these programs like UConn is sort of the classic example, but you know, Stanford, any of these other places, Michigan, um, Dickinson, I think that wherever alumni are, they come back, they support those programs, the programs mean something to them, and when the athletes perform well, get a following, you know, it can be really good, and then um, when women have that credence, I think professional sport or women in professional settings, um, the society is more prepared to see them as deserving, but I also think, and I started off my talk this way, um, that like capitalist institutions and governments do not tend to offer women more money, um, you know, because they can see that women are talented. So women have had to fight and like litigate and protest and all kinds of things for most of the salary increases and safety protections that they have. Um, so I think that it's an, like a both and. I think that on the one hand, we need the collegiate support for women's sport to build that foundation and that the money will come. And with like the change in the NCAA rules, it's something really interesting to see like Paige Beckers at um, UConn being the first athlete in the United States that Gatorade has sponsored at the college level. Like she's a girl. Um, that's super interesting, right? Um, so I think we're seeing somewhat of a sea change there. Um, and she's already being recruited by professional teams. So um, in women's soccer, Trinity Rodman, um, Dennis Rodman's daughter, who doesn't actually like to be thought of that way, but um, she has a million dollar contract in um, the NWSL. And I think that's another league that um, the profile is getting raised and they just signed, the US national team just signed their first CBA um, with US soccer. And just one last thing to say is I think there's been a lot of sort of you know, charged conversation about something like that, about equal pay in the media, um, pitting the men and women against each other. But in fact, like the men of US soccer have been hugely supportive 
of the women's equal pay calls. And I think that's something to recognize, right? That this in many ways is a united front and um, that again, I think it benefits everyone when women are treated as full people. Yeah. There's a question back here, yes. Just a question, just a comment. Uh, in connection with the bicycle craze, uh, that was a main push for the Good Roads Movement. And Teddy Roosevelt strongly supported the Good Roads Movement even before the automobile came on the scene. So that's another connection with Roosevelt and so bicycles helped lead to the good roads movement before the automobile became the main thing on them. Oh wow! Oh, Thanks interesting. for that. That is interesting. Yeah, he's a car expert. Yes. I was lucky enough to play golf with Bobby Riggs several times. <laughs> no way. Important with Bobby Riggs is dances with Margaret Court and Billie Jean King. How important are those televised national matches in the? Bobby Riggs. Bobby Riggs. Well, I don't know how important do you guys think they were? Battle of the sexes, what do we think? Pivotal? Important? I think it's a groundbreaking moment, right? I mean, 40 million, you know, TV viewers, Houston Astrodome completely full. But um, I think he's a fascinating figure in some ways in pushing forward the story and being such a performer, such a ham. And I can't imagine getting to play getting to play golf with him, that's wild. But yeah, I think that in some ways he put Billie Jean King in a position where she was able to you know, advocate for Title IX, although she was too late to benefit from it by one year. And she was able to you know, really showcase the women's professional league she founded because women tennis players were paid so badly. Um, so yeah, I think he was super useful. <laughs> He's who, great. Who, who won? Sure, go ahead. <laughs> to go back a little ways, could you elaborate on that comment about team sports alleviating women's self involvement? Yes, you did that. <laughs> that odd phrase, self involvement. Yeah. No, um, so she, um, Senator Berenson, um, said, and a lot of coaches have said things like this, but um, she thought that women were kind of emotional and that they were sort of self-focused and like apt to be thinking about themselves on the court. And she said that they take, the women players took things very personally and they had a hard time getting out of their own heads and sort of deprioritizing themselves. And so she found, which was obviously her preconception about <laughs> like young girls. And she found though that team sport and basketball in particular um, really um, cultivated a team consciousness that um, that saw the the sort of vanishing of individual you know role playing and just a commitment to the team and I think that was very new to her as a coach and but the way that she describes it is very funny, I think, is in some inborn characteristic of all, all college women ev everywhere. I just have a couple quick more questions for you, and we'll, we'll just have a few more minutes here. One is your, the title of your forthcoming book, Foxes, Not Oxes. Interesting and gripping title. What's the source of that? Um, so the source of it is at historically black colleges and universities during the Cold War, again, as I mentioned earlier, because basically of prejudice, um, white women weren't allowed to compete in track and field really outside of like Catholic and Jewish um, ethnic clubs until Title IX um, because there was a kind of fear that they would course in or corrupt themselves and almost no universities um, even ran teams. Like you didn't have the option to run track I'm at Dickinson State probably. Um, because the team wouldn't exist, because it wouldn't be appropriate for a woman to do that. Um, but at historically black colleges, um, it did offer women those teams, and there was this source of support for women's competitive sport. And because of that, ironically, because um, many colleges didn't accept um, women of color, we have a lot of black students going to these historically black colleges, and once our pipeline really starts to develop, um, some of the best um, Olympic athletes in the world start coming out of a few feeder schools. And Tennessee State University, which is a historically black school, becomes one of those programs. So until Title IX basically creates college scholarships and begins to siphon off um, 
black women to major state programs like Jackie Joyner Kersey going to UCLA, for example, that never would have happened before Title IX. Um, the, the phrase talk, foxes not oxes comes from the coach at Tennessee State. Um, he always wanted his women athletes to be ladies. And again, this really shows, I think, in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, um, he was very concerned about the girls being taken as feminine, as straight, as um, another thing he often said was, my girls always have boyfriends, but just one boyfriend. You know, so there was a very particular impression. My girls are always in sororities. They're very scholarly. They don't stay out late. Um, and before they could give any interviews to the press, even if they had broken world records or they were on goodwill tours in Africa meeting with diplomats, um, they weren't allowed to talk to the media until they put lipstick on and combed their hair. So it was just this very specific policy um, of looking like foxes, you know, like looking slender, looking beautiful, looking sophisticated, and not like an ox, right? And it's that same idea of the images that I showed earlier, like almost looking fit as opposed to looking like an athlete's athlete, you know? Um, and so in some ways it's very limited, it's very mid-century, um, but I think for Ed Temple, the coach, that's how he thought that the track program would survive. Um, so much has changed and fast. We're in a time of enormous change on gender questions. And you see, especially in, the, in um, amateur athletics, some mingling of boys and girls in teams now, um, which is sometimes very controversial. We still have women's tennis and men's tennis, uh, men's basketball, women's basketball. Can you see a time in the future where these gender walls are no longer as strong or as um, heavily enforced as they are these days? Maybe. I think with some specific sports and in terms of the talent range of some folks, it could be an interesting idea. One thing that's always kind of bugged me, and I've seen it again this fall with Serena Williams' retirement, is I think that in some sports like tennis doubles, for example, um, sports that are co-ed or or double sex, or where men and women play together. Also in um, like the mixed relays, in um, like the 100, 200, 400 in track and field, I think those are almost taken as like novelty events. And I think it's very frustrating because those people are breaking world records and in some ways you're just subsuming this impossible, incredible combination of talent um, with women tend to have just incredible skill at you know endurance um, and just, this special, I think these special qualities that they bring to their races and the men the same thing. So why are we not taking, you know, Serena Williams as seriously as a male player um, when we're combining her with, you know, a doubles partner? So I would love to see more of that. So let me ask you one last question. It's the 50th anniversary of Title IX. Uh, your next book is on Title IX. Can you just uh, quickly walk us through how this came about and where things are? are now because it didn't solve all problems and it created a few too but please just give us a short history of title nine on its 50th anniversary okay so um probably i know we've all lived through or you know um, are involved with title nine touches us all right everyone who's here so um yeah title nine came to be because women um couldn't get into medical school and they couldn't get into law school so um they wrote a policy which became adopted in Congress and passed very uncontroversially. It was not thought to be a big deal. Um, it went through both houses. Richard Nixon signed it and a whole slate of just amazing, you know, really remarkable legislation in support of women and feminism as well as the environment went through under Nixon, who's this very conservative president. So it's this interesting dichotomy. But, um, but Title IX is one of those laws. So Title IX, um, just mandates that schools that receive federal dollars have to treat the sexes equally. So that could be in any capacity, whether it's um, a worker, whether it's you know a professor, whether it's a student, um, and really K through 12. But I think we often hear about it on in higher ed. But um, once Title IX passed, I think it became um, controversial because. The NCAA basically realized it was going to start affecting sports, and girls and women just absolutely rushed into new sport programs. 
So um, the NCAA lobbied against it in um, 1975, but they weren't successful at getting an amendment passed that exempted um, football and exempted men's revenue producing sport. And at the time, a kind of common catchphrase was there are three genders, you know, male, female, and football. So there was this very strong belief that men's revenue producing sports, especially like emotionally powerful sports, um, as like the Nebraska Cornhuskers, for example, there was a lot of lobbying around that team, um, that they should be sort of evaluated separately from all the other money on campuses, but that didn't happen. And by the 1980s, um, around 80% of Americans broadly supported Title IX. So um, really since then, it, during the Reagan administration, um, it was temporarily gutted, but then restored um, later in the decade. But um, other than that, I think off and on, sort of depending on the who's in charge, it's kind of waxed and waned in terms of how it's enforced, you know, who it's sort of especially, um, you know, framed around in the media, this kind of thing. And in the um, late 80s, Title IX started being used more in cases of students' personal safety on campus. And in the early 1990s, a law passed right around that same time called the Cleary Act to um, in response to a really um, brutal murder case at a college, which forces universities to disclose um, acts of violence on campus to, um, to people who may be looking at the school. So in concert with that Title IX, um, you know, in theory works to protect everyone on campus. So I think there's this protection aspect, there's this sports aspect, and certainly there's, you know, just the right of men to take arts and English programs and, you know, the right of women to get into computer science and engineering. So there are all these different ways that it works on campus. Um, something else, you know, the right of like pregnant women not to be fired on campus. Title IX touches all of these issues. And you, as you said, and quickly, it, it doesn't just involve women. No. Men approach you too, and they've been Title IX yes. victors. Um, we have a gift for you, and then we have announcements from our friend Chris. So thank you so much, Dr. Bosch. Thank you. That's my line. <laughs> that is my line. It is time for lunch. Uh, we're in the student center. Uh, for those of you who, like me, prefer not to do the stairs up, you just turn to the left here and go down the hall. There are golf carts here if you would like a ride down. Uh, we return in an hour, roughly. We'll, we'll be back right about 1 o'clock. There'll be more announcements later, which means there'll be more food. So we will see you then. Welcome back, everyone, to our symposium on the athlete in the arena, Theodore Roosevelt and the development of American sporting life. We're glad you're here. For those who are uh, watching us on streaming around the country and around the world, welcome back. We have an exciting afternoon. Uh, we're going to go for the next two hours here. And let me just explain. First, Ryan Swanson is going to give his lecture. Um, and I think you're going to find it really extraordinary based on his book, The Strenuous Life. But then um, we have a coaches panel. We have four local coaches. And, and here's why. We, when, we, when we created this theme, athletes, we thought, well, here's a chance to bring in people from the community from the university community, student athletes, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes, coaches in the community to talk about leadership, character building, coaching, possibly Roosevelt. Um, and so there'll be four of them, um, and that will be right after uh, Ryan's talk. But this is a, a chance to sort of see, you know, the, the, the phrase is quit ad nos. What does this have to do with us? So you saw this morning that uh, Roosevelt's view of sport has almost entirely been violated in every possible way by the commercialization of American sport and the professionalization of, of collegiate sport. You would think that a man of his stature uh, would have had more influence on the history of American sport than he has had. But, but those remarks that Simon Cordery um, put up in, from Roosevelt quotations on this were really chilling to me to think of how, how dramatically we have veered 
from that late 19th, early 20th century notion of the, the building of character through intramural sport or competitive but not obsessively competitive, uh, that sport was an interlude in one's life, um, lifelong avocation, but not something that you necessarily were going to professionalize. The belief that character and, and moral development are, are much more important uh, than just um, winning. And I think our coaches this afternoon will be able to put that into some really interesting perspectives. So stay tuned for that. For now, um, our uh, TR Honors Leadership Program Director, Niles Hike, is here to introduce Ryan Swanson. Niles. Thank you, everyone. I'm, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Ryan Swanson, and I'm also excited to have him sign this book. <laughs> On behalf of Dickinson State University, the TR Foundation, and uh, Dickinson, we'd like to welcome Dr. Ryan Swanson. Dr. Swanson was kind enough to offer his time to speak to my intro to the TRHLP course earlier this week. He spoke uh, to our newest group of TR scholars on how leadership programs, such as those he himself directs, can benefit students and communities everywhere. Dr. Swanson also helped me coordinate a meaningful class discussion on how people can use their hobbies to serve others. He piqued my students' curiosity on the subject of service learning. And I'm sure he'll do the same thing here as he speaks on the life of Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, just a quick bit about me uh, before we introduce Dr. Swanson. I am a proud North Dakotan, someone born and raised here in Dickinson. I grew up walking Medora and the Badlands. Hopefully you've had a chance to <laughs> take a look at the Badlands. I'm also a proud Blue Hawk and TR scholar. As a 2003 Theodore Roosevelt Honors graduate, I had the privilege as do all our current TR scholars, of drawing inspiration from Roosevelt. I often thought him to be a bulldozer kind of man. He attacked everything with such earnestness. This model taught me how to work and grow in life. I'm always thankful for Roosevelt's model on leading and living. My wish is that it will serve as a model for our next generation. We have heard so many wise words on Roosevelt this weekend. I hope you all have taken away a new message on life. That's one of the foremost values of attending these kinds of events. I hope the students especially have found a message on life that will help them continue their path of excellence. The message I took from this weekend's many great presentations on Roosevelt is not to waste a single moment in life. I want to specifically speak to our younger generation. Don't waste a single minute of your day. Attack life with the same spirit that Roosevelt did. You don't need to scroll mindlessly through social media and look at yet another silly video. Buy a Kindle and start reading. Roosevelt was himself an avid reader and writer, as well as a bulldozer kind of athlete. Undertake pursuits that matter and attack them with earnestness throughout your day. Now to best introduce Dr. Swanson, I, <laughs> I gave him some questions that he could answer. The first set of questions, why history? Where can people find value in their own lives from learning more about key figures such as Theodore Roosevelt? Dr. Swanson explains, I've always loved the stories. I started out pre-med in college, planning to pursue a practical degree, but I eventually just decided to go with my passion. I think people can definitely find comfort and perspective in studying the past. People are people. It's amazing how similar some of the anxieties and worries are to those of the similar to those of the past. As the saying goes, there is nothing new under the sun. The second set of questions, what's a fact about Theodore Roosevelt that speaks to you personally? Dr. Swanson shares my favorite TR antidote. <laughs> it's the fact that he tortured White House visitors with unexpected tennis matches, as we learned about last night, in the August heat. I appreciate his willingness to bend conventions and find fun in the midst of presidential, in the midst of a presidential schedule. Let's welcome Dr. Swanson.
Okay, well, thank you for that kind introduction, um, Niles. And let me start out with a couple of thank yous, if that's okay. Um, I'd like to thank, in no particular order, Clay and Sharon and Stacy and Mary and Chris and their team for allowing me the chance to speak with you today. Um, it was back in 2015, I think, when I came here to Dickinson, North Dakota with just the beginnings of a book in mind. Um, and I came to this conference and I sat here in the audience and I was overwhelmed by the situation. Um, for the first time I got to go to the Badlands and I listened to people talk about TR and how much they love TR and then Theodore Roosevelt himself got up and asked a question. Um, right? Um, and so it's, it's a dream come true for me to be back here today um, to, to speak with you. And so um, we just had lunch and these seats are warm. So to get your attention, I'd like to start off with a confession, uh, a scintillating, maybe, maybe scandalous confession. And here it is. I love sports documentaries. Like, love them, okay? Um, and my kids can attest to this. Uh, I love sports documentaries. And um, I love the stories that are told. I love um, the fact that we are in a golden age of sports documentaries right now. And you can ask my kids. Um, my oldest son came in not too long ago when I was watching part seven of the Derek Jeter documentary that's out right now. Um, <laughs> loved it. And I hate the Yankees. Um, and so, you know, I saw an opportunity. I said, Carter, he's, he's 17, he's a senior in high school, and I tried to draw him in, like, to get him to watch with me. And um, he held up his hand, said, Dad, let me guess. You're watching some show on some guy who played on some team in some game a long time ago. <laughs> you know? Um, what do high schoolers know anyway, right? Um, uh, and so we are living, I think, in the golden age of sports documentaries. And I think we're living in a time when people are telling stories about the past through sports better than they've ever done before. And so that's what I'd like to do today, tell you some stories about the past using sports. And so I think the golden age of sports documentaries really started in 2009 with ESPN's 30 for 30 series. Um, and let me pull the audience here for a second. How many of you have seen a 30 for 30 documentary? All right, call out some of the ones that you have seen, the, the topics, if you will. I hate Christian Leitner. I hate Christian Leitner. Um, I don't hate Christian Leitner, but I hear you. Um, what else? John Daly. John Daly, okay, yeah. Others? When the Garden Was Eaten. When the Garden Was Eaten, yeah. So these sports documentaries started out with what I see as a really interesting um, rhetorical device. They often start out with this question, or this, this phrase right here. What if I told you? And so if it's okay with you to get us kind of rolling today, I'd like to start out with some what if I told you's as we go forward. What if I told you that TR was never a champion, but he had a really interesting athletic odyssey? What if I told you that Theodore Roosevelt sometimes confused war and sports? What if I told you that TR had some of the same terrible tendencies as that crazy soccer mom or feisty t-ball dad that you've seen on the sidelines? What if I told you that Theodore Roosevelt didn't actually save football? What if I told you that Theodore Roosevelt was blinded while boxing in one eye at the White House? What if I told you, and you already know this one, that TR subjected his White House guests to tennis in the swampy heat of August? What if I told you that Theodore Roosevelt understood the political hazard that is golf? What if I told you that Theodore Roosevelt was not nearly good enough to play football at Harvard, but that he really wished he was? What if I told you that Theodore Roosevelt infuriate, was infuriated when sparring partners were brought into the White House and they refused to hit him with all of their strength? What if I told you that Theodore Roosevelt hated baseball? What if, right? So those are some sub-questions um, sub that I want, want you to think about, and I'm running hot today. Um, some sub-questions, but here's the big overall question that I'd like you to think about. What if one of Theodore Roosevelt's greatest contributions to American culture was his willingness to struggle publicly with his physical limitations? All right, what if? 
This is what I want to talk about today when we talk about Roosevelt and sports and the strenuous life. Because Theodore Roosevelt is a man who is good at so many things, right? Theodore Roosevelt is a man who wrote 38 books, 40 books. How many do we have? I don't know how you count. <laughs> 40. 40. Theodore Roosevelt wrote 40 books. He served as president of the United States. He won the Nobel Peace Prize. He married two beautiful women, not at the same time. Um, he had six children. All those things were going for him, but he really struggled with his physical limitations. Athletics were always a struggle. All right? Theodore Roosevelt couldn't see very well. He had terrible asthma, and he struggled with his weight for his whole life. As you can see, he was basically twice the man in adulthood that he was as a younger man. So that's what I want to talk about today. Theodore Roosevelt had every reason to avoid sports. He was, as he would tell several men, never a champion, but he always kept at it. From his teen years until his death, he participated in, he pontificated about, and he promoted sports. So let me ask you again this question. What if one of Theodore Roosevelt's greatest contributions was his willingness to struggle publicly with this weakness? All right? That's the strenuous life I'd like to talk about. To Theodore Roosevelt, the strenuous life was a call, among other things, for broad participation in athletics. All right, we've already heard this, right? It's not about going to watch sports. It's about um, participating in sports. Now, I'm a sports historian, so it would be remiss if I didn't stop here at the beginning and talk a little bit about the fact that during the Roosevelt era, many important firsts happen in the sports world. And as my colleagues have laid out, there's a lot going on here. This is not Roosevelt creating sports, but rather serving as an embodiment of an encouragement of sports development. So during the Roosevelt presidency, intercollegiate, uh, inter interscholastic athletics are really entrenched. The Pacific um, Schools Athletic League in New York City starts in 1903. And what happens in New York City tends to spread in other directions, right? Um, the first time the Olympics are held in the United States is 1904. Uh, the, and, and Roosevelt does play a role in the Olympics. He's the honorary chairman of the Olympic Games in 1904. He hosts the US Olympic team at his house in 1908. All right, so he plays a role there. Roosevelt is also president when the NCAA begins coming together. All right, it's not called that then, but he's the beginning of that as well. Roosevelt is also a purveyor of pedestrianism or jogging. I think we would think of it today as, as jogging or hiking, that kind of thing. So um, in addition to that, Roosevelt's also president when the first World Series hits in 1903. Um, he doesn't like baseball. He sees baseball as overly professional, connected to gambling, um, but nevertheless, he, he's president then. So these are all accomplishments and precedents and all of those things going on, but I don't think this is as important as the um, tone that he set. So I want to talk tone, I want to talk stories more than I want to talk particulars, because I think we've had the table set for us in that way. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Look at this cute little guy. All right, this is Roosevelt. Born, 19, or born 1858. The Civil War is coming at this time. He's born in New York City. The Roosevelt family has interests in all kinds of things. Um, he is born in New York City to a New York rich family. The family has interests in real estate and glass. And so, and don't, don't overhear me here on this point, Roosevelt has more in common probably with President Trump than he does with his hero, Abraham Lincoln, in terms of his beginnings, right? Starts from a position of wealth and privilege. The family travels extensively throughout Europe and the Middle East. They are politically connected, socially respected. Roosevelt has it all, um, for the most part. He would have had an ideal childhood except for the fact that around age three, and you probably have already heard this, um, he begins really struggling with asthma. And um, I won't ask how many of you have had asthma here. I have not. But what I would caution you to do is, is um, not think about Roosevelt's asthma necessarily in terms of the way maybe you saw it experienced with a friend um, in PE class. This is not you know, a, a discomfort where he's got to step aside, get his inhaler, and then he can go back and play. No, for Roosevelt, from about age 3 until 12 or 13, um, it is a crisis, a crisis on a daily basis. 
Okay? Um, so for Roosevelt, his asthma is so bad that he cannot participate in school. He cannot run around the neighborhood, if you will, with his friends. And, and maybe making things even worse is the fact that in, 1860, in the 1860s, when Roosevelt is struggling with asthma, asthma is viewed very much as something that, yes, is physical, but also is mental and is moral. And so for Roosevelt to suffer with um, asthma at this time, there are real questions about whether he's conjuring it up. And so one of the beliefs at the time is that children use asthma to get out of going to school, get out of going to church, get out of doing something like that. Um, interestingly enough, scholars, including Tweed Roosevelt, have really um, undertaken a, an analysis of, of asthma and what it did and didn't do in Roosevelt's life. Um, this is an article that was published in 2015, which takes on the idea of asthma being psychosomatic, um, conjured up mentally. And, and I think this is a really interesting article. And what it shows is the fact that Roosevelt's asthmatic um, episodes, the fact that they occurred primarily on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays, isn't a fact of him conjuring, up, conjuring them up over the weekend. It's actually the way that crises tend to happen. Um, and that's just kind of paraphrasing it. So if you look at the numbers here, this article points out that the fact that Roosevelt seems to have this propensity to have these attacks on, you know, Monday and, and, and Saturday and Sunday fits with the way that people go to emergency rooms, all right? And the, and the article is much more complicated than that and much more beneficial than that, but um, I just wanted to kind of point it out as an example of thinking about what asthma does in a child's life. Okay. So um, the family tries everything to help Roosevelt uh, with this asthmatic condition that he suffers from. They have him do things like ingest Ipecac. They have him do bloodletting. They have him subjected to shock treatment. And then think of that, that cute little guy right there. They have him smoking cigars. They have him going out in the winter night trying to, to get some relief from the icy cold air. And this makes sense. You know, there's an inflammation going on of the air pathways, right? And so they have him doing that. And interestingly, anybody know what they settle in on or Roosevelt kind of thinks is the best relief for asthma? Coffee. Yeah, his lifelong addiction, right? Um, Roosevelt thinks coffee's as good as anything. And so for Roosevelt, it is, it is the overriding issue of his childhood, asthma, physical inability to breathe. So this is the starting point for Roosevelt, the athlete. Now, um, as has already been laid out by, by a couple of our other scholars, um, at age about 13, 12 or 13, um, Roosevelt is called into the office by his father, Thee, and he calls him in for a heart to heart. And I'm going to paraphrase here. You've seen some of the words already. Basically, his dad says, though, enough, enough. Um, we can't continue to live like this anymore. I'm proud of you, son, he says, among other things. Um, you're smart, he says. You have the mind, but you have to make your body. All right? Now, is this fair? Not really. Not really. I'm a father, right? I rarely tell my kids to go fix their illness. Um, but according to Roosevelt's memory and his sister's memory of this occurrence, um, Roosevelt stops and thinks about it for a minute. The way I see it, he probably had these, these images flashing through his mind, remembering the embarrassment that came with having to cancel certain events and certain trips because he had an asthmatic attack. Um, that was embarrassing to him. Um, he probably remembers the panic of some of the times when he just can't breathe. So he thinks about all of that. His father's issued this challenge. And at that point, he kicks his head back and says, okay, okay, I'll do it. I'll make my body. And if we could, I would cue up the Rocky music. Um, because basically, this is the beginning of Roosevelt going on this athletic journey. I'm going to train. I'm going to become strong. I'm going to become an athlete. I'm going to cure myself. I'm going to make my body. So um, again, don't miss the starting point. Rose, uh, Roosevelt is a boy with asthma, poor vision, small stature, but he wants to become an athlete. He's been challenged by his father, who he respects immensely. So he does it in, in rich kid fashion to a certain extent. Uh, his father builds him something of a gymnasium in the family home. Uh, he brings in boxing tutors, champions. So this is not a kid just kind of doing it on his own. He's, he's got a lot of support. Um, and gradually things begin to pick up. He begins to get stronger. He begins to get um, some confidence. Mostly what he engages in is boxing, wrestling, riding, at one point, as he's getting to his mid-teen years, he decides, he, he establishes a plan to run one mile at full speed every day through the woods. 
Now, physiologically, not the best plan, um, but you've got to appreciate kind of what he's trying to do here, right? I'm going to go all out for a mile. I'm going to push my lungs. I'm going to do that. So gradually things start to, to get better for him. Um, that's not without some bumps on the in the road. Um, one of Roosevelt's famous uh, or favorite stories, excuse me, uh, he talks about being on a train when he's confronted by some bullies. And to, to tell you the short version of the story, Roosevelt is humiliated because not only do the bullies kind of take him on, but he doesn't even get beat up. He can't even get that far, basically, is what he says. Um, they just kind of suppress him, keep him in his place, and a fight doesn't even happen. So for him, he can't even kind of get to that, to that point. But um, he continues to train. He continues to work with these boxing tutors. He continues to get stronger. And gradually, Roosevelt um, begins even winning a few matches. Um, and he talks about one event where he is put in a small boxing tournament in his local gym. I don't know all the details, but the draw was super friendly. Um, he ends up with some pretty light competition, and what happens? He wins his trophy. <laughs> that is not Roosevelt. Um, we don't have a picture, but he wins. He wins. And he talks about this event in a really touching and honest way. Um, and I'll put the quote up here. He talks about how this trophy becomes one of his most prized possessions. I kept it and alluded to it, and I fear bragged about it for a number of years, and I only wish I knew where it was now. Years later, I read the account of a little man who once, in a fifth-rate handicap rate, won a worthless pewter medal and loved it, or um, enjoyed in it ever after. Well, as soon as I read that story, I felt that the little man and I were brothers. This was, as far as I remember, the only one of my exceedingly rare triumphs which would be worth relating. Okay? Um, this is Roosevelt the human, in my mind. Um, we recently moved, and I had to, I, I, I found a box of, of trophies, just of this ilk. You know, some medals I won, third place in a, in a 5K when I was nine years old, and those kinds of things. Intellectually, I knew I should throw these away, but some emotional part of me thought, ah, I, I want to keep these. I want to hold on to these. So Roosevelt had that experience as well. Um, and as he works his way through this, a miracle happens, okay? Roosevelt begins to cease being an asthmatic boy and begins to become a strong young man. Um, and he is convinced of the relationship of what's going on here. I exercised and challenged myself, therefore I cured myself of asthma. Now, that's the connection he makes in his brain. What we know is that it's very common for um, adolescents to age out of the worst effects of asthma. Okay, so, But for Roosevelt, it doesn't matter. The connection is in place by the time he's in his teen years. Athletics and effort equal development and health, okay? Um, what we have here, and, and statistical people could talk about this in greater detail, we have a difference probably in correlation and causation. But for our president moving forward of the United States at this era, he's convinced that there is a correlation. All right, you push yourself and you get better. And so this is why he becomes such an advocate of athletics, among other reasons. So, Roosevelt in 1876 goes off to Harvard. Many experiences while he's there. He arrives in 1876. Whatever your experience was in college, don't, don't equate it with Roosevelt's. Um, he got a beautiful room, put wallpaper on the wall, got furniture. It was not the cinder block you know, uh, kind of experience most of us had. Um, and he made up for lost time. Remember, he's the child who can't go out and play, can't go to school. And so what does he do? He joins everything. Um, I would say it's a, a classic case of FOMO. Um, for those of you who don't use this, uh, term FOMO means fear of missing out. It's popular with the, with the youth of the day, I hear. Um, my wife and I are convinced she has, she's a FOMO person, fear of missing out. She always wants to be engaged. I'm a phobie, fear of being invited. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but this is, I think Roosevelt, this is Roosevelt at this time. So he's joining everything, doing everything. Again, he's not good enough to play football. Not good enough to row on Harvard's crew team, which, as Simon pointed out, this is the top of the top, right? This is Division I athletics, if we think of it today. Um, but what he does do is he trains every day, for the most part, in the gymnasium, barbells, wrestling, sparring, boxing, and he works to become competent. And in typical Roosevelt fashion, this is actually from the year before he goes to college, Roosevelt doesn't do anything willy-nilly, right? So he's keeping records, keeping track of what he's doing. 
Um, and so here you see a measurement. He has one journal in particular in which he keeps track of his athletic achievements. Very Rooseveltian, right? He's not just going to do it. And so on the left here, you see him taking measurements right before he goes into Harvard. And you can see he is a small, fit, strong young man. And so by the time he leaves Harvard, Roosevelt is an athlete. He is up to par at the very least. Not a champion, not on the, you know, on the athletic teams, um, but he's come a long way. Uh, as he leaves Harvard, and this we've already, we've already met this gentleman in a previous talk. As he leaves Harvard, two people um, kind of shape his pathway out of that institution. First, there's Dudley Sargent, who we heard about before. Um, Dudley Sargent is a, a, you know, an assistant professor of physical education at Harvard for a time. He's involved with the YMCA. He is, according to himself and other people, um, kind of the father of physical ed education, uh, uh, one of the fathers, along with Luther Gulick and some other people. Um, so Dudley Sargent does a lot of things at Harvard, including manage the gymnasium. This is a time when Harvard doesn't really, isn't really sure it wants to be involved in PE kind of courses. Um, but the, the thing that I think is most important for Sar uh, Sargent in terms of Roosevelt is Sargent wants data. He wants data about the human body. And so he requires, you know, how do you get things included in the curriculum at a university? You know, today it requires seven committees and 17 forms. Um, Sargent maybe got it easier, but he decided that everyone who graduated from Harvard had to have a physical evaluation. And so this is what we heard about before. And so the image of people going through this process involves stripping down completely naked, waiting in the hall with other naked young men, and then going in to see Sargent and having him fill out a form with about 60 blanks where he measured you kind of in the way Roosevelt measured himself, you know, circumference and weight. And then he asked questions and looked into your, um, your past. And when Roosevelt was finished with this, he was given in some ways kind of a physical fitness death sentence. Um, Sargent told him no more as we've heard. Um, no more bounding up the stairs, no more going for long runs, no more tossing around the football in the yard. Um, anything you do at any moment might lead to a heart attack. All right. He's very much thinking of the, um, he does one kind of breathing um, measurement where he finds that the average college uh, man blows about a 30 in terms of lung, lung strength. Roosevelt blows about a 10. And so he's looking at all of this and thinking about his asthma history and saying, no more. All right. You can't do this. Um, so Sargent tells Roosevelt this as he's leaving the institution. Um, Roosevelt will have none of it. Doctor, I'm going to do all the things you tell me not to do. Um, if I've got to live the sort of life you have described, I don't care how short it is. Um, this is somewhat foreboding given the way that Roosevelt's life will play out. But you see kind of this spirit of overcoming still, right? Um, the second individual who's really important at the tail end of Roosevelt's time at Harvard and, and moving forward, of course, is Alice Lee. Um, they are married just as he is finishing up his time at Harvard. She tragically passes away early in their marriage during childbirth, only a couple of years. This is when Roosevelt comes out to North Dakota um, to assuage his grief and to find himself here. I do think it's interesting to think about how Roosevelt, the athletic president, might have been different. If Alice was his wife moving forward, she was a strong tennis player, um, a real advocate of physical fitness. She could have, this is rampant speculation here, she could have pushed forward a movement for girls' physical fitness alongside of her husband, perhaps. But we won't ever know. Um, she passes away and, and Roosevelt remarries Edith, a childhood friend. Um, but these are kind of the voices, the, the people with Roosevelt as he's finishing up at Harvard. After Harvard, Roosevelt begins rising like a rocket. He enters politics after thinking about law school for, for a minute. Um, he becomes the police commissioner of New York City, the assistant secretary of the Navy. I'm glossing over things that people write all kinds of books about. Um, he becomes a war hero in the Spanish-American War with the Rough Riders, San Juan Hill. All of those things, which are important, um, lead to a moment when he um, articulates the strenuous life. So again, this is, this is years in the coming, but I think um, is important to note, 1899, Roosevelt has been swept in, as, as someone else said, swept into the governorship of New York. He's invited to Chicago to give a speech in April. It's a blustery, cold day. And he gives a speech which is mostly about imperialism and foreign policy and American strength. But in it, 
he coins this term of the strenuous life. Words that we're perhaps familiar with. I wish to preach, not the doctrine of ignoble ease, but the doctrine of the strenuous life. This idea of the strenuous life ceases to be Roosevelt's once he puts it out into the public, right? And the strenuous life means many things, but given Roosevelt's past and development and kind of moving forward with the athletic development of the time, the strenuous life becomes very much linked to Roosevelt and his athletic development. The strenuous life becomes kind of a tagline for the athletic revolution. The strenuous life is... Powerful then and powerful now. Um, for those of you who drove here, there's still time. You can go to a strenuous life retreat starting that Saturday. Um, there are strenuous life medals that you can earn um, with different groups. A group called the Art of Manliness offers the strenuous life get your life together program. Um, as I was writing the book, I kept trying to join this as, as an academic exercise, but it fills up like the moment it opens. And so I would always miss it by like an hour and it would be full. So the strenuous life still reverberates and still means a lot of things to a lot of people, but I think it's tied into athletics. So Roosevelt becomes president, as we know, um, following an assassination in 1901. And he is a new type of president. One of the first things that Theodore Roosevelt does within the first couple of months in the White House in 1901 is he travels with almost all of his cabinet to the Army-Navy football game. And all kinds of questions surround this visit. People are asking, is it proper for a president to do this? Is it safe, given the assassination which just happened? Um, but he comes to Franklin Field in Philadelphia, which you can see on the right there. And with great pomp and circumstance, the president enters... He sits on the Navy side in the first half, and obviously Roosevelt has naval connections. And then with great ceremony, he gets up and walks across the field and sits on the Army side um, for the second half. Army wins, and the press, and there are all kinds of coverage of this, the press is not watching the game at all. All they are doing is watching Roosevelt in the stands. And they cannot get over how vigorous he is, how involved he is. He's yelling at the teams, he's yelling at the referees, at one point, he gets up, bounds down the stairs, jumps over a fence, and gets on the Navy sideline. And he's like slapping the guys on the back and telling him to go for it. Um, and people are just amazed at this new type of president and how, again, how close he kind of feels to athletics. Um, this is the footage of him crossing the field, which I'm going to try to play. We'll see if it works. It's not scintillating footage, but um, so this is halftime. Skip a little forward. This is the, from the Library of Congress. Perhaps we have this in the collection here. I'm not sure, but um, okay. So let's see. So apparently entourages were a thing back then too. <laughs> you can kind of pick them out there in the front. I don't know who these guys in the back are, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so um, this is a tradition which still stands in terms of the president attending the Army-Navy football game and switching sides at half, um, which I think is, is kind of interesting. Oops, let's see here. So Roosevelt embarks upon this presidency, which, um, again, you know, I, I rifled through kind of the things that are accomplished while Roosevelt is president. The first World Series happens. The Public Schools Athletic League is put in place. America hosts its first Olympic Games. Baseball becomes America's national pastime even more with the World Series. The NCAA rises. The tennis cabinet is established. Now, the question I think we should ask is how much does this have to do with Roosevelt, right? What I am not saying is that Roosevelt somehow created all of these things, started all of these things. But what I am saying is that Roosevelt throws his support behind a movement. He gets directly involved with football, which I'll talk about in a minute. And Roosevelt creates a culture in which these things make sense. Roosevelt talks and writes about making a stronger nation. He constantly shares his own experiences as an athlete. And again, the tennis court is very important to all of this. And we've heard some about this already. But Roosevelt um, oversees a, a, a renovation of the White House in 1902. And in that renovation, a tennis court is put in place. 
There's a bit of disagreement among historians about exactly how the tennis court got included, but I think it's fair to say that Edith had a hand in it, and whether she just wanted her husband to get more exercise or she thought he was getting a little bit too um, plump, uh, which she talked about from time to time, wanted to watch his weight, um, she had a role in getting this put in place. And I think what's important for us um, is the proximity, right? And we've seen these images before, but Roosevelt is mere feet from his you know, kind of place of, of, of play, his place of competition. The tennis court becomes a cultural touchstone for athletics, and stories are leaked out over and over again about Roosevelt the tennis player, Roosevelt the walker, Roosevelt the sparring partner. Although the press is never allowed to take photos, um, which is unfortunate for us as historians, we certainly know about these events, and the people of his time knew about these event events. Um, one point I make in my book is that Roosevelt is referred to in his first full year in the White House using the term strenuous more than 10,000 times. Uh, so what I did was start looking through databases and newspapers to figure out how often that term was used with Roosevelt, and it was used all the time. The press really just, if in doubt, uh, needing you know, some way to describe Roosevelt, talked about him strenuous. He was called a strenuous eater, a strenuous vacationer, a strenuous parent. And then they, they kind of mess with that word in all different directions, strenuosity and strenuosity and just all these kind of different ways. So that's how the word, uh, the, the ideas about Roosevelt came out. Um, Roosevelt mostly plays tennis in terms of the sport that he does, but while he's in the White House, he has this tennis cabinet, um, as, as Mike told us. He has these people coming and playing. Most of them are a bit younger than he is. Many of them, some of them are former college athletes. These men play tennis together, yes, but they also spar together at times. They enjoy playing, uh, competing with single stick, which is kind of like fencing, but with a much heavier implement uh, of fighting. They toss around the medicine ball. They go riding for long periods of time. Uh, Roosevelt likes to do that with Edith as well. Roosevelt also spends time using dumbbells. He practices jujitsu, as we saw. And so with this, Roosevelt's creating this image of an active president, which is very different. Now, one part of this whole equation is the fact that Roosevelt gets involved in college football. And so let me talk for a minute about that. Again, mostly I was trying to kind of tell the story of Roosevelt as athlete, but I want to kind of stop here for a minute. Um, college football is extraordinarily popular by the middle of, or by Roosevelt's time of his presidency. Um, in 1905, though, college football has a crisis. Um, it's called the Death Harvest. Uh, depending on who you ask, and sports historians get really into this stuff, somewhere around 20 people died on the football field during the 1905 season. Um, or from injuries sustained on the football field. So the game's not only violent and causing injuries, but it's literally leading to death, uh, to deaths. Um, as was mentioned, Roosevelt's own son is among this, this generation who's experiencing this, um, this violent game. Ted at Harvard experienced, um, and if you step back to Groton, the injuries he uh, experienced over a couple of years playing football. You know, he broke a couple of ribs. He had a concussion. At one point, he got a huge gash on his forehead. Um, his nose was busted up, and then he broke his ankle. Uh, and so Roosevelt not only knows about the, the kind of problems that football is, ha is having from a, a broad standpoint, but he knows about it as a father as well. And then, um, so at that point, um, an abolition movement is, is breaking out. There is a move to get rid of football altogether on the university campus, right? Um, and I think that there, you know, there's reason to think that this makes sense, right? These are places of education. You now have the maiming of young men, the killing of young men. Is this something universities really want to be involved with? Um, could be a question for today as well. Um, so Roosevelt gets involved. He believes that the game is a net positive. Interestingly enough, the main proponent of, a, of abolishing college football is the president at Roosevelt's own institution, Charles Eliot. Um, Charles Eliot is a very powerful, influential leader in higher education, and he wants Harvard to be done with the game altogether. So with that background, uh, Roosevelt gets pulled into the, the football debate. And Roosevelt calls for a meeting at the White House of the coaches and administrators, basically, of Harvard, Princeton, and Yale. And so think about this situation. The President of the United States, the Secretary of State, Ilhu Root, and football coaches from schools sit around the table. Kind of, kind of amazing, right? Um, and for the better part of two hours, Roosevelt and these coaches and Secretary of State have a conversation about the game. 
and they discuss a couple of things. They discuss the violence that's going on, they discuss the rules that are in place, and Roosevelt's actually really concerned about the enforcement of the rules. So one thing I think that Roosevelt's concerned about is not only is the game itself problematic, but is it just that maybe we're not enforcing what the way the game is supposed to be played? So he's kind of trying to figure those things out. Um, this is not well received by the, the people who are attending this. Um, one of them is Walter Camp. And Walter Camp is, a, is kind of the forefather of football in some ways. And Camp thinks that Roosevelt is really overstepping. We have built this game to its position of popularity. It's now something that serves institutions and, and students. And Camp is really put off that the president is, is getting involved at all. Um, and so after a two-hour period, more than two hours, um, these guys get back on a train and go home. And on that train, they basically have a, a, a discussion about what's the least amount that we can do and say that we haven't ignored the president. Okay, so it is, not, it is not a situation of trying to come to an agreement. It's how little can we do without getting in trouble with the president of the United States. And so basically they put out a statement saying that we will enforce the rules and we will continue to look at the game. But the presidential weight on that situation leads pretty quickly over the next couple of years to a series of meetings and a series of organizations which will lead to the NCAA. So I would argue that Roosevelt doesn't save football, but he is certainly an advocate of football, and he intervenes in one of football's crises, right? Football has a crisis every 10 years or so. Um, we are in the midst of one not too long ago, CTE, concussions. Is the game too dangerous? Should we still be playing it? Um, this is kind of the way that the game has, has evolved over the years. Okay, um, kind of moving towards the end here, let me finish up with kind of the rest of Roosevelt's story. Um, Roosevelt is one of the youngest presidents in American history, right? He's a young president, I should say, um, but he's still a middle-aged man. And so that affects the way that he is an athlete. And so I want to kind of close by looking at how he wraps up his own athletic journey in the White House. Um, and I think it's interesting to look at one of his birthdays. And so on October 27th, 1907, um, Theodore Roosevelt turns 49 years old. Uh, now, is 49 old or young? Young, right? He's feeling a lot younger than I used to think, uh, right? It depends on our perspective. Roosevelt, though, is, is kind of facing his mortality to a certain extent. Um, and he finds himself in the White House, turning 49 years old, and he's, he's alone-ish. Um, his daughter, Ethel, is in the hospital for um, a procedure on her ear. Edith is there as well. Um, and so he kind of wakes up to the White House by himself, and he goes to church. It's a Sunday. He comes back, and he writes some letters. Right? He's always writing letters, those 155,000 or whatever we're at. Um, a couple of them have to do with the panic of 1907, the Roosevelt panic. The economy is, is breaking down. Um, but then, at the end of the day, left by himself, turning 49 years old, he's left to celebrate his birthday on his own. Um, and that's kind of a tricky thing, right? Um, and so what he decides to do is to go for a walk. And so he heads out of the White House about, about dusk, 5 o'clock or so, um, on this October evening. Unlike most of his walks, and I'll talk about this in just a minute, unlike most of his walks, he walks alone. Uh, he's got some security giving him a berth of protection, um, but he walks. And as he starts walking around the White House, he doesn't head for Rock Creek Park where he does most of his walking. Instead, he kind of stays in the city. And an hour goes by, and he's still walking. Uh, the rain is getting worse. It's coming down. It's pretty much dark now. He continues walking. Two hours, still walking. Now it's dark, it's cold, it's wet. And um, in Roosevelt's recounting of this, it seems like there's a switch here from a, I'm going to go for a walk to I'm going to show myself I can still do it. Um, and so it rolls into hour three, and he keeps walking. And by the time he's done, he's done more than 10 miles to celebrate his 49th birthday by himself in the rain. And he comes back to the White House and, and kind of declares himself satisfied. You know, I can still do it for another year. And... He will tell the press as well. And so he'll kind of put this story out. And the next day, you can imagine what the stories are. What an amazing president we have. He walked 10 miles in the rain and the cold. And so Roosevelt liked both parts of this. He liked the personal achievement, but he also liked the acclaim and the attention, I think, that he got for it as well. However, with that walk and with the attention, there was a related story over the couple of days, if you look through the newspaper, when he turns 45 or 49, excuse me, which is not nearly as nice. Um, the press at this juncture, for some reason I can't quite figure out, centers in on the health of the president and particularly his weight. 
Um, and there is a question the day before and the day of his birthday and the day after about whether the, pro the president is really getting a double chin. Um, this is just mean, right? Um, and I, you know, I, I would, there's probably a hashtag it would be today, you know, TR and it, TR has a double chin or something, but, um, and Roosevelt is affected by this as well. Um, and, and Roosevelt very much throughout his adult life is dealing with his weight. Um, by the time he's in his late 40s, he is somewhere in the, the you know, range of probably 210 pounds. Um, and if we look back to his original kind of, and this is grossly unfair to compare somebody at 18 to later in life, I know. Um, but uh, you know, at, eight, at 18, he had been 124 pounds. So he is, like I said, almost twice the man um, and struggling with his weight. And so he, this too is part of his athletic journey. Um, and I think Roosevelt, one thing about Roosevelt, he continues to eat like a teenager long after he is a teenager. Um, and so he's got to figure that out as well. Um, coffee and calories are a big part of Roosevelt's athletic story. Now, just, just one thing um, that I've kind of mentioned as well, but, uh, but I want to talk about for a minute. My favorite and one of the most important, I would argue, um, athletic activities of, of Theodore Roosevelt is walking. Um, and not walking necessarily like we think of it, but point-to-point -point walks. Uh, so Roosevelt would pick a position um, and try to get from here to there on a straight line. Um, and so that's just what it sounds like. You know, he oftentimes would have someone drop him and his friends off, and they would head back as best they could through the creeks, up the rock walls, you know, over whatever they had to, and he really enjoyed this kind of exertion. Um, one of the most famous of these point-to-point -point walks, many of which included the tennis cabinet, um, occurred on a spring afternoon, sometime um, around this same age of 49 that I was mentioning just a minute ago. Um, and Roosevelt invited two of his really favorite workout partners, um, the ambassador of France, Jules Jusseron, and then the as assistant secretary of state, Robert Bacon. And he invited them over uh, to the White House, and they then were dropped off out in Virginia, somewhere along the Potomac River, and then they began walking their way back. So they're walking, it starts raining, um, and then the rain stops and it gets, you know, it's kind of hot, it's got this humid kind of Washington DC thing going on. Um, and at some point they come along with the Potomac River and Roosevelt has an idea. And he says, let's take a dip. Uh, and Jules Zusseron has realized whenever the president has, idea, has an idea, uh, he simply says, an excellent idea. He's always on board. Um, and so Roosevelt and the ambassador of France and the assistant secretary of state strip down to their birthday suits, um, walk into the water of the Potomac River. And at some point, and this is somewhat apocryphal, at some point, uh, Roosevelt says uh, to Jusseron, wait, you forgot to take your gloves off. So he's all naked except for his gloves. And Jusseron says, um, I can't take off my gloves, we might meet the ladies. Uh, so he's not gonna do that, you know, so. Um, and so that's, that is Roosevelt kind of exercising and engaging um, with this, with this uh, pursuit of sports. All right, in closing, and I know I'm, I'm out of time here. Oh, and this is the memorial to Jules Zusseron in Rock Creek Park, which I stumbled upon when I was uh, trying to do some of these walks at some point. One thing I would point out is living the strenuous life and testing yourself in terms of your limits is not easy. And if we want to do that, I would consider Jimmy Carter as a cautionary tale. Um, Jimmy Carter took up uh, running in the White House. Uh, this is Carter in 1979. He's 55 years old. Uh, for those of you who remember 1979, it wasn't going that well for Carter uh, politically. But he takes up running in the midst of the jogging boom. Uh, Sports, Illustrated, uh, Sports Illustrated calls him a typical born-again runner. And so he starts running, he, and after a, long, after a little while, he's running every day, somewhere between three and seven miles. He loses about 15 pounds. So it's going pretty well, and he decides to enter into a 10K in Maryland. And here you see him running well. The first mile goes pretty well. He runs about an 8.25 mile, second mile about 7.45, and then he hits a big hill. And it ceases going so well. Uh, Carter is forced to drop out of the race. And the reaction afterwards is really informative. 
Um, after you might think, what did people do? Wow, great for him for going after it. That's amazing that he gave it the try. He ran himself to exhaustion. No, none of that was said. Instead, the idea was same old Carter. Can't even finish. A couple of people said maybe he hyperventilated. Um, and this very much becomes part of the narrative about Carter not being able to get things done. Um, incidentally, this was raised again not too long ago with Biden and his bike incident, which I think is kind of interesting. Okay. All of this ends up in 1917 with Theodore Roosevelt, just to kind of wrap it up here, um, spending a couple of weeks at a health farm in Connecticut. And for two weeks, Theodore Roosevelt spends his time trying to exercise and get back to being healthy as a 58-year-old. And so he gets up in the morning and he runs three miles, and then he does some medicine ball, and then he gets a massage and kind of rub down, and then he goes out and does another couple of miles, and then he lifts some weights, and he did this all across the whole day for two weeks. And at the end of the time, and this, oh, I'm sorry, this is what he said kind of coming in. You know, he felt like he needed to do something to kind of get back on track. You can see how confident he is in, in Cooper's ability. Here he is at the end. At the end of the time of, at Jack Cooper's, he invited the press in to hear about how it went. This kind of keeps up with Roosevelt, too. He both does and talks about it. Uh, this is the mayor of, of New York City who came out uh, to run with him on the last day. It didn't go very well for the mayor. Uh, the mayor loses to Roosevelt in kind of an impromptu race at this, at this training farm. Um, then he loses election to New York, as the mayor of New York City. And then shortly thereafter, he falls out of a plane in a training exercise and dies. Um, so be careful when you compete against uh, Roosevelt, right? <laughs> okay. So lastly... Um, and you, you've been gracious to sit and listen and kind of hear some of these ideas about Roosevelt, the athlete. Lastly, I want us just to think about the way that we think about Roosevelt. We have a lot of images, beautiful images around here about Roosevelt. So I want to close by looking at a few um, images of Roosevelt. And this is a bit more of a participatory exercise. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to I'll take it off. I'm going to flash up an image. And I want you just to call out what you think that image says about Roosevelt, okay? Um, just so we can kind of uh, think of some of the words that we associate with Roosevelt. So let's start with this one. Scholar. Yeah. Pursuit. Yeah. Presidential. Okay. Visionary. Southern. Yeah. 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 Yeah, a politician maybe, you know, here. Accessible. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> I know, right? So, if, I mean, some people might say a fraud. Uh, you know, like, there's some, there's some criticism. Pensive. Yeah. So we have all these images and all these ideas about Roosevelt, right? It's a famous one. Yeah. Aggressive, decisive. PowerPoint. <laughs> of course, this one. <laughs> A lot of the way we think about Roosevelt is because of Joe and Robin. Uh, so we thank them for that. But to those ideas, I would add again this idea of Roosevelt the athlete who started from humble, a humble position physically, but continued to challenge himself. So I would add this image here. Um, look at this image. This is TR at work physically. I think he looks a bit goofy with that hat on, but he is trying, he's aging, he's pushing himself. He's not a, not a champion, but he's continuing the struggle. And so again, this kind of brings me back to the question we started with and one I'd like you to think about going forward. What if one of Roosevelt's greatest contributions to American culture was his willingness to struggle publicly with one of his weaknesses? So thanks for your time and attention, and that's it. This one? Yeah. Okay. So, we don't have a lot of time. It's all right. Um, but let me ask a question, just one, and then ask the audience. Um, so, first of all, I think you're saying 
that the myth that Roosevelt saved college football is a myth. That's correct. Yes, I think it is a myth. Um, I think, but I think it's a fine way to begin a discussion about Roosevelt being a supporter of football and being involved in that discussion. So I would imagine if a book was titled How TR Saved Football, that's a good starter to the conversation. Unless it's not true. Anyway, leaving that. Yes. Um, um, where I think it's a bit simplistic. How about that? This is a, um, it sounds like a simple question. I'm not sure that it is. What does Roosevelt mean by sport? We know what we mean by sport, I yes. think, but I'm not sure that's what he meant. No, I think Roosevelt means something which is competitive, whether that's with yourself or with others. For Roosevelt, sports only count if they are exhausting. Um, and so he wants a level of violence to the games that he plays, whether that's just your body pushing yourself over this hill or that hill, or whether it's butting up against another person in a boxing ring. And so I think if you kind of keep the idea that it's competitive, it's pushing yourself, it's strenuous, to use that term, those things are fine, but he's really open then to the particulars uh, beyond that. You know, So it doesn't matter if a ball's involved necessarily, doesn't matter these kinds of things, but it has to be exhausting. But remember the Boone and Crockett Club, 1887, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. hunting, if it's a sport hunting, it has to, there has to be sport. That means virtue, yeah. Yeah. Uh, rules, order, mm -hmm. um, ethical restraint, yeah. honorability. Yeah. These are key terms when he uses the word sport. For sure. And I think um, in a fashion which is helpful for us here in this place, I mean, Roosevelt and the frontier and sports really fit well for him. And so I think he sees it as something that is oftentimes connected to the landscape and the, the wildlife in a place. So yeah, so I think that his definition of, of sport is more expansive perhaps than ours is today. To that photograph, uh, so he goes to fat camp with Cooper and, um, and he knows it's not gonna work and we know it's not gonna work. But remember, he nearly died in South America before sure. this. It's not as if this is just an older man. Sure. He'd used himself up in many different ways. He'd broken most of the bones in his outer frame. Uh, he'd had concussions. Uh, he'd bled um, ridiculously. And in South America, he came as close to death as you can come because he said, you have to leave me here. And when Roosevelt says, you have to leave me here, mm -hmm. he means it. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty amazing that it, after all that, trying to get in shape maybe to run in 1920, mm -hmm. he undertakes that and, and it, we can forgive him for not bouncing back. For sure, and I think um, my favorite part of his journey is this final attempt in 1917. I find it noble and inspiring and given what he had gone through, rather amazing. Um, and it's still TR in that he would like to tell you about how hard it was too, um, but yeah, I mean, he's, he'll be dead 15 months after this, you know, and so this is a last push in some ways to, to challenge himself physically. You know, what he said in that, and when he, he's quoting his father, you must make your body that famous mm -hmm, moment. Mm -hmm. But I was, when Simon had it up there, the last part of it was what, what struck me as funny. He says, it's grim, hard work, mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. this is not something that you just do by jogging every afternoon, mm -hmm. that this is grim determination. Mm -hmm. And you think of how much of his life was was really characterized by that, that he once said, I'm not a brilliant man, I'm an average man, but I have a huge engine. Yeah. You know, I work hard at it, I'm, I'm, I've got more energy than other people, but I, he didn't see him as, himself as gifted in any way, mm -hmm. but that he had the right gumption. And for him, that kind of grim determination is a big part of his character, isn't it? Yeah, and I think I don't believe him when he says he's not gifted as a scholar, as a speaker, as a writer, as a thinker. But he meant it. He wasn't just he means playing it, a game. But I think it's hard to agree with that looking in from the outside, but I do agree on the physical side of things. I think that's where he really is dealt a, an average to less than average hand, and he pushes. Um, and I like the idea of engine. You know, they often talk about athletes now on this basketball team or that one. He's his engine. He just keeps running, he keeps going. Um, that was very much Roosevelt, the athlete. And I will admit, writing this book in my 40s, about somebody who was in their 40s in the White House, I always think, how, how did he have this much energy? Um, but he's always kind of pushing himself in those ways. So I think it's, maybe it's the gallons of coffee, but um, interesting. Do it. So uh, one last 
thought here. Um, we'd be really remiss if we didn't ask you to name a few of your favorite sports documentaries after that introduction. <laughs> That's true. Um, well, and again, I think sports documentaries are telling important stories about American history through sports. And so um, there is a 30 for 30 documentary that details the relationship between the Escobar drug family uh, and Latin American soccer, which I think is really uh, amazing and outstanding. And then probably my favorite as well is one that deals with the state of Alabama. It's called Roll Tide. Um, oh, I'm forgetting the Auburn. What's Auburn? War Eagle, sorry, Roll Tide uh, War Eagle. And so it delays, the, it talks about that rivalry between those two schools and what that is in the state of Alabama. So a couple of my favorites. And there's the one about the, I think it's the University of Alabama that refused to play in a bowl game because there were African Americans on the other team. Brilliant, 30 yeah. for 30. Yeah, yeah, the, about 1970 with Bear Bryant and USC. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's a different one, but, but good. Any quick question for our scholar? Yes, here. And we've got the trajectory during Roosevelt's time, and then we have what's today, this extreme uh, economy of sorts of youth sports. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the trajectory when Roosevelt, during Roosevelt's time, to where we are today with the organization and construction of youth sports. Youth sports then and now. Yeah, I mean, the idea during Roosevelt's time is to create opportunities for organized athletics through schools, primarily. I mean, that's the working idea that, that's beginning to expand. The idea now that those organizations are being replaced primarily by for pay club sport opportunities, um, I think Roosevelt would be unhappy uh, with that, with that uh, idea. Um, one of the things that we're seeing in youth sports right now is that they're becoming more serious at a younger age, more specialized than anything we could have conceived of during Roosevelt's time. Uh, Roosevelt considers the idea of sampling and trying different things to be really important athletically, and we are just moving exactly in the other direction. Um, one thing the Aspen Institute pointed out recently is that the average retirement age, that's not really a good term, but that's what they called it for children in sports, is now 11. Um, and so that's the situation we've created, which is very un-Rooseveltian. Ryan, I wish we had more time. People can. Um get you to sign your book at 3 o'clock, but for the moment, the President has a gift for you. Oh. Let's say our thanks to Ryan Swanson. This is going to be great fun. We have four, I'd say, player coaches here, but let's say coaches for the moment, and I'll just briefly introduce them. Let me start with Rich Wardner on the far end. Rich Wardner is, among other things, the majority leader uh, in the state of North Dakota's legislature, the Senate. He's a dear friend to Dickinson State. He's coached us through many a difficult situation. Uh, as you'll see when we go over to the Culver Hall remake, uh, we were there one day last year when things were stalled for a number of reasons. And he said, you know, I think I can coach you through this, but it isn't going to be easy. And uh, you did it with great panache and your usual generosity of spirit. Um, Rich has been a coach, among other things. Um, he uh, instructed and tra trained in Mohall, which is north of Minot, North Dakota. He had a top basketball teaching uh, gig on the native high school there. Uh, the group placed a third of the Class B state tournaments in the first 12 months on his helm. Uh, he later moved to Dickinson, where he coached for seven years of varsity basketball and 20 years of freshman soccer, etc. He entered the legislature in 1990 and in 1998 moved from the House over to the Senate. So, Rich, we're glad you're here. And next to you, Thad O'Donnell. Thad is a well-known figure here in Dickinson and Dickinson State. He's entering his 25th season as a coach here, and it's an amazing record. He's coached four different sports during his time for the Blue Hawks, head wrestling coach for 20 years, head cross-country coach for eight years, and men and women's golf coach for six years, assistant football coach for eight years, and in that time span, He's coached over 150 All-Americans, six national champions, 35 academic All-Americans, and was six-time Coach of the Year Award recipient. Amazing. And amazingly, he's from Baker, Montana, <laughs> which is the, you know, the lesser cousin to Marmoth, my favorite North Dakota town. So uh, we're glad you're here with that. Kelsey Bedeker. Uh, is the technology coordinator um, at the South Hart School District. That's just 15 miles west of here. Uh, she's served in that role for the past nine years. In 2020, 
you receive the Technology Teacher of the Year Award, and you say here you were not expecting it, um, which is usually the case, of course, uh, from Sheridan, Wyoming, um, women's golf, women's basketball, um, joined the Thousand Point Club during your senior season, and now she um, teaches business classes, Future Business Leaders of America, the FBLA program, and is assistant coach for girls' basketball team, the Cougars. That's South Arts Cougars, right? And finally, Michelle Orton, uh, who is a banker, among other things, at the Brevera Bank. She grew up in a tiny town in southeastern Colorado, so tiny that when she coached the women's basketball team, there were literally only five people who turned out. And in some of the games, one of them fouled out, in which case they played with four. But nevertheless, you had a very successful career doing that. She's now um, in Dickinson, a banker, serves on a variety of boards, um, and is part of the Dickinson Public Schools School Board, a thankless task these days, and among other things, is married to Ty Orton of the uh, DSU Foundation. Welcome, all of you. So you've been listening to some of this. Um, Theodore Roosevelt, loves sport, is an athlete, not a great one, um, big advocate for the strenuous life, believes in taking physical risks, believe that athletic training and team sports are not just about physical activity, they're about moral development and maturation and social skills and competitiveness and so on. So Michelle, I'll start with you. Pick it up anywhere you want about your own sense of what is the value of team sports and, and school sports. Thank you. Well, I can start by saying I participated in collegiate sports as well, and I think that's the time that I truly learned that team concept. And I was able to take that on when I became a coach myself. The hard part, you mentioned the small team that I coached. I tried to take that the way I was coached as a collegiate athlete to a small group of girls, a team in a small town community, and realized it took me a little bit to learn that you had to change the way you presented that coaching mentality. And so, one thing I learned working with these young ladies was the fact that they will do anything if they understand that the attitude, your attitude is the biggest component and your attitude will get you very far. And that's something that I tried to teach them. And when they picked that up, that's why when we only had five girls, they were able to win even when we ended the game with four. They were able to work hard, that grit. And when you mentioned TR, that's something I think about is I think he would have been a great coach. And I say that because his leadership skills embodies what a coach is and what that grit, you never give up, and what we teach our players and that character is big. And so I think that all around athlete is very important. And I think that's what he ex exemplified as well. Opinions vary on whether he'd be a great coach, but we'll take your word for it for the moment. <laughs> In my um, opinion, of course. Tough coach, let's say. Uh, but you mentioned uh, that attitude is everything then how as a coach do you handle that? Because that's not like how you dribble or how not to foul. This is a, a character issue. That is correct. And obviously skill is, especially at the collegiate level, but any level. And I worked with elementary, middle school, high school. I coached boys, girls. And you can't teach attitude. I think that is something that individuals have within themselves. And you can take that into any setting in life. But I believe that the more you practice that, the more you discuss it with your, your team members, I think it's something that they start to, they're, they're surrounded by it, and they start to believe that. And I think you can't take a player who maybe comes to practice with, let's say, 20% positive attitude. You're not going to turn that around by the end of practice to where they're going to be 80% positive attitude. But if you can even get 25 from a 20% positive attitude at the end of practice when you can see that change and they see that I think that makes a huge difference. So Thad let me ask you a question you know there are different types of coaches as you know you've been at it for a long time uh, some throw the chair out onto the court and slap their athletes around a little bit um, Phil Jackson prefers a Zen approach um, there are all different types of coaching so how did you identify your own coaching style and, and how do you evaluate the, the ones that are not just best for winning but best for the development of young people? I think all 
coaches, no matter what their style is, build a relationship with their athletes. Um, perception is reality. Obviously, when you see it on TV and they throw the chair across the floor and they throw a fit, he might be in the huddle telling them, I'm just doing this to get the other team upset or whatever. So there, there's some things that are done by certain coaches are just theatrics. Um, but the style of picking a style that works for that athlete is, is important. I think you have to build a culture. Um, for me, I'm not a screamer and a holler type of coach. Um, it's more of a one-on-one -on -one with the athlete building a relationship and you have to build that trust. Once you have that trust, you can call on them to get outside their comfort zone. Um, and that's how we become good athletes. Um, athletes is not just being talented in athletic ability. That's a gift that's given to you. Your ability to take that gift and push it past where you're at is, like Michelle said, it's attitude, it's a culture of wanting to do better than where you're at right now. And as a coach trying, trying to do that, um, they all come in at different levels. And they all come in with different attitudes, um, building a culture that is for a whole of a sport that makes it that team progress forward is, is, it's real hard to do sometimes. Sometimes you have great chemistry. As basketball coaches use chemistry a lot. They'll say, oh, I got great chemistry because they have to work together. A lot of the sports that I coach were individual sports, which is a little different because now you have chemistry with every one of those individual athletes. So as a coach, I pulled things from watching coaches that I've had coach me. I took good things and I took the things that I didn't appreciate and realized and focused on those because sometimes those would come out of myself as coaching. I said, that isn't how I want to handle this situation. So every coach I've had, I've learned something from positive, negative, what to do, what not to do. Um, and it's just basically a, a process of going through and figuring out what works. It's a big trial and error process. But you um, know, when you, when you look at, say, the NBA today, there are players, and I associate them often with the Lakers, but sometimes now with the Knicks that are, or Brooklyn, yeah, who are extremely talented. But they can't win on a team. They can't work the chemistry. They're so talented that they haven't figured out that only teams win these games. And you'd think at that level of sport, with that much scrutiny and that much money involved and the, and, and the amount of money you can spend on psychology and coaching and retreats and so on, you would think that this would be doable, but it isn't, is it? The team is a kind of a magical art. Yeah, and it, it, at that level, it becomes a me thing rather than a we thing. Um, at our level, we, I mean, obviously the finance is not going to be a thing. We're, they're in it for the love of the game more than anything else, and that's a lot better to coach than get to that professional level where it's all about the money aspect of it. So, Kelsey, um, not to dump on Southard, but it's a, it's a small gene pool, so you don't have 10,000 possibilities. You know, you deal with the, the group that's handed to you. What's, what's a graduating class in Southard? Around 30. Right. So... Uh, not ideal from the point of view of the, of the you know, most gifted young athletes. How do you turn people who are not necessarily that talented, say Theodore Roosevelt, into people who can succeed and win? You know, I think the first thing that I'd say to that is some of the best athletes, the student athletes that I have ever coached are not the ones that are the most talented. It's the ones that do all the little things. They'll do whatever you ask. Um, they'll do it with a smile on their face. And most importantly, they're the best teammates. So they're there, whether they're seeing the floor or not, they're encouraging their teammates, they're always excited for others. Um, those are the ones, especially in a small school class B atmosphere, that you need on your team to see that success. Um, how do you help them with their fundamentals? A lot of practice, a lot of repetitions, um, a lot of positive encouragement. We won't have the most talented kids across the state, um, but you know the teams that I coach, we will have the most uh, hard workers, the, the, the ones that work the hardest, and the ones that do so um, with a positive attitude. You know, I, go, I love to go to the Class B tournaments mm -hmm. because they're just sort of fundamentally different from the Class A tournaments. And when I was growing up long, long ago, when a when a student committed a foul, they raised their hand. There was a there was a still there was a level of all that the sportsmanship and the humility, and you still see it, don't you, in Class B in a way that you don't necessarily in, in as you go up. 
So talk a little bit about that, the character of rural life and how that informs student athletes. You know, I think a lot of it too has to come with uh, where our kids come from. You know, they maybe live on a ranch, they live on a farm, and in our part of the country, they those kids learn work ethic and they learn like they learn the hard parts of you know facing adversity and handling things and situations and more humble, more um, you know we're able to put maybe some of those things on display at smaller schools. Uh, because we don't have maybe that standout athlete. And so we're able to say, hey, even if we don't win a game, we're going to do all the little things right. We're going to make sure sportsmanship is always at the top of our list. We're going to play teams, and at the end of the day, we're going to hear from officials, and we're going to hear from opposing coaches, you know, how well-behaved, well-mannered all of our athletes are. I think if you continue to try to um, encourage that type of atmos atmosphere, you'll see your students uh, do the right things um, when they're in the spotlight. So for those of you who are not from here, North Dakota, um, is an extraordinary state for its rural culture. And although those towns are in some strain, uh, this is really the heart of the North Dakota character. It's what made us who we are, and it what, it's what makes us different in some respects from other places, and particularly urban places. And if you ever get a chance to come watch these young athletes, um, especially at the Class B level in these schools where the graduating class is 30, 40, 60, um, it's fun to watch and it's even more fun to watch their parents because the the parents of rage are less prevalent, not absent, but less prevalent at the class B level than in some other ways. Senator Warden, let me ask you the obvious um, question. Is coaching a bunch of 16-year-old kids better or worse than coaching the Senate? <laughs> To be honest with you, it is tough coaching the Senate. Uh, I think the, the kids are a lot easier to coach. And, you know, everything that I've heard here, I really agree with. But I'm going to bring it down to mental barriers. That I coached ninth grade football for 32 years. And uh, I was working with ninth graders. And you can mold those young people. And one of the things that you've got to teach is work ethic. And that's what you were talking about. You're talking about growing up on a farm. Some of those young people know how to work. And they know how to drive through the mental barrier. And when they're needed, they are there to continue to compete to the very end. In my coaching career, one of the worst things you, hate, you hated is you had to play a team that had individuals like that. They never quit. You never could put them away. And I would like to relate that to Theodore Roosevelt because I think that's exactly what he was doing from day one, try, practicing driving through the mental barrier to show people that he could, that he could do it. When you talked about, here just previous in the previous speaker talked about walking for, what is it, 10, 10 miles, 10 hours. Uh, that's what he was trying to prove. And I think about when he brought the two thieves back from up by the Long X Bridge back to Dickinson, and he was the only guy and the two crooks, and he didn't dare go to sleep, so he read books to stay awake. He was driving through the mental barrier. And that's what coaching is. And you can coach it. And you but you have to you have to work with your young people and you have to encourage, and I don't know if Theodore Roosevelt would have been a real good coach, <laughs> because I don't think he was ready to wait and develop. It was, you either dance now or get off the dancing floor. That's what I think. I mean, when he went out there and he took off, you follow or fall by the wayside. But anyway, I really think this boils down to the mental barrier and that's something in teaching kids to compete. And some kids you don't have to because they already have a work ethic. So I want to ask you feeling. a follow-up question on the mental barrier here. But as to that, uh, the boat thieves and, and so on, he wasn't just reading. He was reading Anna Karenina, a <laughs> thousand-page novel by Tolstoy. So there's, there's another kind of torture right there. Yeah, I think he drove them nuts. <laughs> and, he, and he actually ran out of book according to the story that he tells, that uh, he read the both thieves, the entire English translation of Anna Karenina, which is about a thousand pages, and then wasn't done yet, so he said to redheaded Mike Finnegan, the leader of the gang, I say, old chap, you don't have a book with you, do you? And it turns out that um, Finnegan did. He had a, 
a dime novel about Jesse James. And Roosevelt said, let me borrow it, and I'll give it back to you after your prison term. So there you go. <laughs> That's leadership. So, but, but you talked about mental gumption traps, mental getting over, me talk about that. What do you mean by a mental barrier? Well, I think that uh, in the case of Theodore Roosevelt, he went out and he didn't, you're right, he did not play to win. He played to finish the game. For example, I start track meets and I don't care if the kid comes in 35th in the uh, 1600 meter. Run through the tape. Don't stop 100 yards away from the finish line and then jog, but run through the tape. That's what I admire, and that's what he admired, and that's what he tried to develop in himself, that he would, he could do it. He could, no matter what. And remember what those two thieves, it was cold. He was not in good shape when he got back to Dickinson. He had to put up with a lot of things, but he got through it. And I'll tell you, we can all think of young people, athletes, that they're not very big, they're not very talented, you were talking about that, but they're tough. And it's mental, it's mental. And I, and I think that that's the, what Roosevelt was striving for, is that he could do it. And no matter how much it hurt or how uh, difficult it was, he was going to fight through that barrier. And when you find an athlete like that, you got a good one. So Michelle, let me ask you about that. So, you know, you, you look out on these young people and you, you can kind of assess talent levels, at least at the beginning. There must be moments when you go home and when you've seen a breakthrough that somebody who's basically mediocre or not great in talent, but has overcomes that becomes more, figures something out, or realizes that maybe I can't shoot, but I can pass. I can. There must be a great feeling for you when you see that growth. And I know you wouldn't say, oh, I did that. But of course, you, you partly did, right? So explain how you negotiate that. I think that is such a great feeling as a coach when you can see an athlete who, at the beginning of the season, you set goals uh, as a team, as individuals, they set their goals. And throughout the, the season, they may have their ups and downs, and there are times when they don't think they're going to accomplish that goal. But the more you work on that mental aspect, as uh, Rich was saying, and I think Thad had mentioned that there's more to an athlete than just the skills. When you can work on the team building, work on the mental aspect of the game, throughout the season, the more you hit on that, they start to realize what they can accomplish. And so at the end of the day, it, after a practice or a game, if we beat a team that was going to be very challenging, and maybe in my mind I thought, I don't know if we're going to be able to beat this team, and we accomplish that, it's so rewarding. And you can talk to the entire team about how that was a team effort, team effort. And you can point certain people out about, you know, you struggled with your rebounding the previous games, but look what you did tonight. You were able to contribute. You improved your rebounding. You improved your passing. Whatever that goal was, it comes together as a team. But we always did individual meetings as well. And that's where you can really build athletes up. One thing I noticed coaching girls at a very young age up to college women is specifically women, their mental game, sometimes they're very hard on themselves. Females are very hard on themselves. And so the more we can work on ways for them to develop that mental aspect of not just the game, everyday life, their relationships, they realize that it's their overall wellness that we can focus on, and that's what helps accomplish a lot of the goals that they set. So, Thad, we talk about bringing up people that are, are not naturally gifted. How about the athlete that thinks that he's LeBron, or thinks that he's Michael, or thinks that he's Jerry Rice, um, and, you, and they aren't, and, and that's going to get in the way. So how do you bring them down to a better sense of where they are? And I don't just mean men, but I, that, these are three just that come to my brain here, without breaking their spirit and without damaging them in the process. Uh, we had themed t-shirts for our wrestling team all the time. And the one year we put, don't tell me, show me. So that became our theme that year, because we did have some kids that you know, thought they were way better than they were. And that, you know, there's going to be a line that says, you know, they're hungry for winning, but there's not a big line for the ones that are hungry to do the process to win. And so when we started doing the steps 
to what do we want to be successful, and these guys talk about, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. They're always talking about the end part of it rather than the process. So to get with those guys, it's like you need to love to compete. Um, and I think Roosevelt was, I mean, he loved to compete. That's the bottom line. It, it wasn't about the win, and that's where we're, because you're going to run into somebody that's way better than you, no matter how good you are. So you have to truly love to compete. And that's what, like recruiting, that's one of the questions I ask to recruit. It's not how good you are or what you've done. It's do you love to compete? And when we have athletes that come in that have a, you know, a higher thought process than where they're at, um, it's we don't want to bring them down. But in the same token, these are the things that people have done in the past to succeed. Are you doing these things? And some of them, are, well, I'm just more talented. And that's what happens from high school to college is they come out of Marmoth, and they're pretty good, coming out of the class of five, and then they get to the college level, and all of a sudden, they're not the top dog anymore. Now, a lot of it just naturally happens, and we don't really have to say much. They get into practice. They get into that first competition. It's like, oh, everybody's just as good as I am. What's going to separate me from everybody else? And then it's that process. And that's where we're there to say, and they come in, sometimes with tears in their eyes, sometimes mad about where they're at, and then, all right, these are the steps that are going to help you get to where you want to be. And that was not a failed attack on Marmoth? No. No, no, never. Because never. I heard a little, but uh, <laughs> I know people in Marmoth. I bet you do, too. I had relatives in Marmoth. <laughs> yeah. They, they eat guys like you for breakfast. Um, so, Kelsey, talk about this, you know, that you're a coach, but in a certain sense, you're also a psychologist, right? Talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, honestly, we see it, the, the, the need for it more and more every year. You know, I think society is changing quite a bit for our student athletes, for everybody, but especially for our student athletes. And, you know, in my case, these girls come into practice and you immediately know. I mean, you spend a lot of time with these kids and you immediately know if they're off, if something's going on. And you do. You have to kind of open up. You have to build a relationship with your student athletes so they trust you. And once they trust you, then you kind of become a confidant, you know, and they can open up to you. And a lot of times, I mean, we all know it, you can't do your job well if you have other things on your mind. And getting those girls to be able to uh, maybe speak freely about things that are on your mind, all right, but now we are walking into that gym, we're stepping on that court, you've got to try to compartmentalize in a way and focus on something that might be an escape for whatever you're going through. Not downplaying anything that they might be going through, um, but we got to be able to find that escape. And I know for me personally as an athlete, you know, stepping on that court was always in a, a way for me to say, whatever's going on in my life, right now I get to do something that I love and I usually felt better after that. And so, you know, allowing those kids the opportunity to do that, um, and maybe they even learn something about them, maybe how they cope um, with, uh, you know, problems that they're seeing. Sports can teach you so much about life, and that's one of my favorite things about it, is if you um, can get those kids to understand, at the end of the day, we're just playing a game, but what we're learning from it is actually going to help you later on in life. Um, that's kind of why I think a lot of us do what we do, or have done what we've done. So you raise such an interesting point, you know, the, you're working with adolescents, and that's a torturous time in many young people's lives. Um, the pressures are always great. Pressures are extremely great now with social media, bullying, um, the craziness of our pop culture and so on. And you're saying, uh, Kelsey, that sport can be a relief from that and a way to transcend some of that. Yeah, I think it's, it's one of those things that might bring some of these kids back down to earth. You know, it's something that the roots are still there. You got to still come in, like uh, Coach O'Donnell said, you got to put in the work. And that hasn't changed regardless of what's out there on social media. You still have to step into the court or on the field or, you know, on the course, whatever. And you have to get your mental mindset right and focus on, on what you are trying to be good at. And that's whatever sport or activity that you are focusing on. Um, but it's hard. It's, it's hard for these kids to um, kind of close out that outside noise. And when they do have a device within five feet of them at all times, um, it's, it's becoming more and more challenging. And so I think Coach Orton said it earlier, but like 
being a good example, right? When I'm around them, I don't need to be on my phone. I don't need to be on social media because that's what they're seeing me do. On bus rides, I don't need to be doing that because then they kind of think it's okay. So instead, read a book. Instead, you know, do something else kind of to be a good mentor to those kids to get them away from that um, as much as we can. So you weren't all able to be with us all day, and, and, and I'm sorry for that, um, but you've heard some of this. And one of the things that Simon Cordery said, which was moved the audience pretty deeply, was that sport needs to be kept in its place, that we're talking about education here. We're talking about books and mathematics um, and maturation, um, meeting deadlines, um, learning to write, you know, learning basic skills, becoming a well-rounded, well-educated person. And in so much of our sport today, that gets subordinated, especially at the collegiate level, to the kind of mania that it, re it requires to be a competitive football team or a competitive volleyball team. Uh, how do you all handle this? Now, let's start with you because you're, you're working at the college level. How do you, how do you make sure that these are st student athletes, not just athletes who are students? Right, and I think the perception is backwards that is out there. I, we used to have some of our faculty come to a practice and see what these athletes go through. I mean, we have study table. They, we are constantly on them about schoolwork. Where are you, what are you going to do when you're done with school? We know at our level, they're not, there's no professional choice afterward. They're getting a job. They're moving forward. So, and at the same point, when we're competing, they're building connections. They're building a reputation for themselves and of hard work. And they're building a confidence level. Um, that's going to help them in whatever field that they're going to. And being able to be involved in that aspect of their education, learning a job nowadays is a lot of times, we'll hire you, we'll teach you on the job. That's the hard skill. The soft skills are the skills that we teach in athletics. The personality, you know, the hard work, the, your mannerism, your body language, your confidence level, that all comes from sports. It doesn't come from reading a book in mathematics. That is important, and we still we instill that. All our coaches are, I, I don't know a coach that doesn't put academics first, but the perception because of what they see out there is the other way around. And in, in reality, there is not a coach out there that does not want that athlete to be intellectual and to be smart and to work hard in the classroom, and we expect it because of the things that we put on them. Student athletes have a higher expectation than a normal student. Um, because of the pressures put on them. Now, obviously, like every other thing, we have some that are on the low end, too, that we have to try to put in. We, as coaches, probably spend 90% on our lower end athlete. Hey, you need to go to class. You think this is important. You need to get education. What are you going to do five years from now? What are you going to do 10 years from now? So that is a very important part of our process and our, and our programs, and I think we really push it. Um, to do that, and on the other side, we still need to compete. We still need to put a team out there that is going to be competitive. And so that takes a balancing act. And I think, I think uh, it, it, it's, it's a tough thing, and it puts a lot of pressure on the athlete. And sometimes they stumble, and we're there to say, hey, get your butt in there, get help. You know, what do we, what do we want to do? And they change their mind in their major twice before they graduate. So it's one of those things that it's a lot of academic stuff. Rich, I see you nodding. Well, I agree with him. And uh, when you talk about sports, another word is adversity, being able to get through adversity. Remember that all of these young people, whether they're in junior high, high school, or college, most of them are going to go out into the workforce. That's our main objective. And that's what Theodore Roosevelt was headed for, to be able to be good citizens, to be able to handle adversity in life. Now, Ryan Taylor is sitting in the back here. We served together in the Senate, and uh, he will agree. He was a leader, too. We have legislators, when they lose their first bill, they mope around for a couple of weeks, and you got to call them in and say, look, sometimes it takes two or three sessions before you get some of these things done. you got to pump them up. you got to motivate them a little bit and say, hey, the sun will come up tomorrow. But as we look at Theodore Roosevelt and what he was doing, he, was, he knew how to get through adversity. He knew how. 
And that's one of the things we need to teach our young people. It's not that as they're out there on the athletic field, they learn to drive through adversity, get through that <coughs> mental barrier. Because guess what? They're going to need it when they get out of school. Rich, you win the reference to Theodore Roosevelt Award here. This is great. Uh, we, we've, you, you've been coming to our events, and you've taken the lead in this, and we so appreciate your grounding of all this. Questions for any or all of our panel? Yes, here. Yeah, I talk about, about mental wellness, counseling, uh, especially gender distinctions and mental wellness and so on. Yeah, I, um, talking to our athletes, I mean, that one thing we talk about getting that trust and, and understanding your athletes. Um, we try to build a culture where our athletes feel like they can come to us, but we also have leaders within our teams that are people that they can go to. Because um, I coach both men and women, and a lot of times the women didn't feel comfortable until they got to be juniors or seniors. We had some freshmen that never spoke to me for the first semester, and, you know, and I coached them. And it was like after they completed a full sentence, it was like, all right, we're moving someplace. But <laughs> that, but we had older, we had some team leaders in those programs, and the ones that talked to me, I talked, all right, we need to make sure we're we're all on board here. And some that they've come to me, and then. I don't feel comfortable, find somebody that does feel comfortable with them. So it is, it, it's a huge thing. And, and in athletics, it, it becomes very evident very fast. Um, it is something that you, they can't hide very well. You can tell when something's going on. So it, it's definitely uh, just having that pulse on what's going on in your team. Others, please. I no longer coach, but I do have two teenage sons, plus being a part of the school board, very aware of what is going on as far as the mental wellness and providing that for our students. And so right now in our district, we are implementing some different initiatives and providing services so that our students feel comfortable reaching out to counselors, uh, their teachers, coaches. It's about those relationships. As that said, it's very important that we build those and make sure that it's a safe zone for our students, that they understand no matter what is happening, there are people you can talk to. And you know, it, it can become overwhelming. Uh, our oldest son is a freshman and he's just now understanding this year we have an A-B schedule at the high school. So they're traveling quite a bit for sports right now. So they may miss their classes from yesterday because they had to leave at noon. They won't have that class again t until Monday. So they're stressed out. A few of them will stress out because they didn't, they missed the lesson. They don't understand how to complete these assignments. And so now they're worried they're going to be ineligible and that they can't get help. And so those are all stressors along with being a teenager and it's homecoming and homecoming dance tonight. And, you know, so all of those things are, are worrisome to them. And so we try to teach them that have fun. You know, we will figure these things out. But the most important thing is that they are reaching out to those people that they trust. Tonight is homecoming? Tonight is homecoming. What are you doing here? I said yes to helping you out. <laughs> we so appreciate your sacrifice. You were going to say, Kelsey. Yeah, I just, I just want to add to it. You know, um, dealing with similar situations like this, I, I've learned one of the biggest parts is to find where all of the pressure is coming from. Because a lot of times when kids are struggling mental, it's because they're feeling an overwhelming amount of pressure. Well, where is that coming from? Is it coming from the home front? Is it coming from their teammates? Is it coming from coaches? Um, maybe a lot going on in the classroom, something going on at home. Find where that pressure is um, coming from and uh, break that level down first. And then they all of a sudden maybe become a little bit more vulnerable, are able to open up and talk about things. And it's not all building up inside. 
You know, because when you read things on the news, it's, wow, I never would have dreamt that so-and-so would have done something um, like that. But they might appear happy on the outside, but you know there's so much going on in that head. And so it's being diligent, um, like we've said, you know, a couple times, but building those relationships so they're not holding all of those feelings inside and have somewhere to go with them. And I'll also say from a small town, North Dakota school, the resources, the lack of resources right now is a bit of a problem. And so I know like um, uh, Coach Orton said, you know, DHS is doing a really good job of, of implementing some things. I, as coaches, we're, we're working with our administration too. To We have a school counselor, but is there anything else that we can do to get these kids um, the help that need that, that need it? We have about 10 minutes here. There was another question, yes? Are we doing something wrong if a young person retires from sport at 11? Uh, answer yes. I, I think there, there's become a lot of pressure from parents, obviously. Sometimes the parents are living their athletics through their, their kids. This is probably the majority of it. Um, and like growing up in a small town, it's a little different than in a, in a bigger town. The small town, you get all the kids out. If you build a culture that kids feel comfortable and safe in, they're going to do everything. Um, but nowadays, kids are specializing so young that, you know, somebody's saying, if you want to be a good athlete in baseball, then you need to play baseball all year round. Um, or basketball or wrestling or whatever it is and we've accommodated that by having events all year long where it used to be you played football and then you're done in November and then you had wrestling or whatever the the sport was and they had actual seasons and you in Wyoming they had their they had a four season four sports season and they went over and Football coaches were encouraging their athletes to go out for wrestling. The wrestling encouraged them to go out for track. And I think you see that in small towns. In big towns, they get a little more specialized where football coach is a football coach. And then that's what he, he wants him working drills and things or whatever sport it is. And that's where I think we've been derailed. Um, but then you look on social media where they'll bring up NFL players and what sports did they play. A lot of those real talented athletes played a lot of sports. Um, it's the ones that drop out that are focused and they burn out. If you're 11 years old and you've been doing it since you're two, and that's the only thing you're doing, you get bored with it. And question here. Go ahead. All of you, uh, I don't think the guys that went up Kettle Hill with Teddy, Wonder, Remington, once they got there, what's going on with young people today when they think they have to get a trophy? Is this true that we over trophyize, over reward young people? We got it. Go ahead. I, I think it's the parent. It comes back to the parent. The kids don't know any different when they're little. It's just how they have we brought up. And I think that culture, this uh, me culture right now, is, is that, you know, we're not, we're putting that that we want our kids to do well. We want our kids to feel good. We don't want to stress them. Um, and sometimes they knew, you know, we talk about our athletes, they need to be in an uncomfortable position to excel and to move forward. If we're always comfortable, nothing's going to change. So to put athletes into an uncomfortable position, it's tough as a parent. I had kids that went, were athletes, and it was tough to see my children in that stress situation but I knew it was better for them in the long run than to make myself feel better and then pat them on the back and say, oh, it's okay, you don't need to do that. No, it's better to kick in the butt. Yes, you need to do this, even though they want you to say you don't have to do this. So to put them in that uncomfortable position to be able to move forward, and it wasn't in athletics, but it was for them for life, for what they're doing now. Proud of what they're doing now, how hard they work. And some of it, mostly my wife, is the one that kicked him in the butt, told me to put him in uncomfortable positions. But it was, that's part of sports. And I think 
we're doing a disservice by giving him trophies when for showing up. Yeah, I can't answer to your question per se, but I'm going to add with what he said. You know, even looking back at when I was an athlete, I learned more from losing than I did from winning. And so I think we're doing, you know, the youth of today a disservice by always having in their minds the perception of, oh, well, even though I didn't win on the scoreboard, I still won. Well, now you're not learning all those important things that, that one can learn from losing. And so that's another thing that I think we all need to get better at. Go ahead. I think another issue that's facing Western North Dakota and Eastern Montana is the decline in the small schools. Uh, Weeble, Montana, seven seniors this year, uh, as you say, homecoming. Basically, the term I use is there's, there's a real lack of uh, manpower to cover all the bases that need to be done there in, uh, at the school. You know, not only the sport, but also the peripheral there. Uh, in that. Interesting fact, Terry, Montana, in the class of 22, seven graduates, five foreign exchange students, only two local students. Now you are like a chamber of commerce for Montana, I'll tell you that. Uh, so, rural, rural decline is a very serious issue. I want to ask two more questions before we go here. Um, first of all, and, and um, I want to tiptoe into this, uh, several people have said to me, you must bring up the question of transgender in sports. Now, this is not about yes, no, but how as coaches can you handle the very breathtaking range of gender identity questions and doubts and so on in a young person who is still trying to figure life out in a way that is fair to your work as a coach and that leaves judgment at the door? I, Go ahead, Thad. Uh, that's a tough one, but I, I think it still goes back to that trust issue. You need to get to know where they're coming from. What, 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 what do they want? What's their expectations? Um, and as a coach, you know, some of it is we're, if it's a sport that has a man, man, female, you know, cross country, for example, or whatever, then you're bound by however the the body feels it's going to be done, but um, individually is building that trust with the individual. Is where where are we going? What do we want to do? What are what is your expectations here? And um, it's it's going to be a tricky thing to navigate. And I don't I don't really have an answer for it. It's going to get tricky too. Anyone else want to jump in on quickly? All I was. I I agree with that, that it, it is a tough question to answer, and all I can say is that our number one concern should be that student athlete and just focusing on meeting their needs and understanding where they're coming from. So Michelle, um, is the Dow coming back? You're a banker. <laughs> I will not answer that. No, that's great, <laughs> but you will go to homecoming. Rich, you get the last word. So I want to maybe just say a word about Jesse White. So that was an extraordinary story, Jesse White, young Native American. Uh, one of the best Class B athletes, basketball athletes we've had in the last 20 years. Amazing to watch. Graduated from high school in White Shield, North Dakota, this tiny, tiny little Native American town. Uh, won all these awards, and then at some point you see a picture of him, and he's missing several fingers from one of his hands, and yet he was the top Class B boys basketball student in the state. This builds character. Well, well, it sure does, and in the Native American Excuse me. Culture, you know, sports is a is a big deal. Uh, it is it's one of the things that's going to help get them out of some of the uh, issues that are dealing with. Uh, I happen to been the chairman of the state and tribal relations this past interim, and we're working with those things. But in Jesse's case, uh, he had to drive through. He had to uh, through adversity. He continued on. Several he, types. Ser Pardon? Several types, his disability right. plus racism in right. North Dakota. And the thing about it is that he, he survived and he kept going. He is a tremendous role model for the Native Americans in North Dakota, and, uh, and they, they need that.
Yeah, not we just, all need that. Not they, just Native Americans. So, Senator Rich Wardner, thank you. Kelsey Bedecker, thank you. Michelle Orton, thank you. Thad O'Donnell, thank you. Let's give them a great round of applause. <laughs> all right. So, Mr. President. Chris has got, it's not food time, but it's move time. So a quick moment of your time. We're moving in a couple of different directions. First, there's an opportunity to have a book signing immediately out the door. The art gallery remains open if you'd like to roam through there. We are moving down the hill to the soon to be rededicated Pulver Hall. Uh, so just right off this way, we've got people to direct you or take you there in a cart if you would like. I have a couple of quick thank yous. I want to thank my, my team once again, so Eric and Kelly and William. And I would like to thank Mary Massad and Sharon Kilzer for all of the work that they put into this, which was amazing. I arrived late, as many of you know, so I get to take advantage of all the hard work they did. Uh, I would also like to thank once again the Robin Melanie Walton Foundation and Humanities North Dakota grants which support this year after year after year. Uh, without their graciousness, we would not be able to do what we do. So thank you all for being here. There is a rededication of the building down the hill, the opportunity to see the brand new exhibit space. It is, as Clay said earlier, absolutely amazing. It is stunning. You should come down and see it. Uh, it will start being open once we relocate the archives, which is a bigger process than I want to think about right at this moment. Uh, um, but uh, for the moment, come see the exhibits. The dinner begins at 5.30. Let's go with that. 5.30. Yep. Hold me to that. And then the evening's entertainment begins. We're relocating up the hill to Stickney Auditorium in May Hall because there's a stage large enough to hold a dozen young women playing basketball, folks wrestling and trick roping and other things. That is my piece. Thank you once again. Thank you for coming and thank you for what has so far been a lovely day. It will continue to be so. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Clay Jenkins, and I'm the moderator of our symposium. We're glad you're here participants in the symposium, students, friends of students, parents, grandparents, uh, people of the community. We're glad you're here this first time in one of our 17 symposia that I've shaken the hand of Buster the Blue Hawk. So we're on uncharted ground tonight uh, and delighted too. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to show you an exhibition of three sporting events of the era of Theodore Roosevelt. And We've been exploring yesterday evening and today what sport meant to Theodore Roosevelt in his own time, 1858 to 1919, how sport has evolved, uh, why sport, for example, basketball emerged at the end of the 19th century, how it's changed over time, and so on. So we wanted to show you a little bit about what it looked like then to give you a sense of how dramatically things have changed, particularly uh, in the sport of basketball. So I'm going to ask my friend Ryan Swanson to come on up. Ryan is one of our presenters. He's from the University of New Mexico. He is uh, the author of a really extraordinary book on Theodore Roosevelt called The Strenuous Life, which was a famous phrase and speech that Roosevelt gave in 1899. And if anyone was ever an advocate of vigor and strenuosity and taking physical risks and um, engaging even in a bit of physical violence, it was Theodore Roosevelt. So to begin, uh, we want to have uh, Brent Rogers and the Blue Hawk singers come up and they're going to behave like a glee club because no sporting event could start in Roosevelt's era without a glee club. So Brent, bring them on up and let's hear what will be the first of two songs and at the end of the evening we'll have a farewell song. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to see. All right, so as the singers are making their way up, I thought I'd give you a little bit of background. First of all, you may be wondering what on earth is a glee club. Uh, glee clubs actually originated in England in the 1750s, uh, and they were called glee clubs because there was this song for choirs that was called a glee. So they were a club that would get together to sing glees. Um, the, it became 
less of a thing in England around the 1850s, which is about the time that it started to become really popular here in the United States. And in the United States, well, in England, they were typically community groups, but in the United States, they were typically college groups. Um, and in fact, there are something like 30 to 35 glee clubs that are still active today that started up in the 1850s and the decades that followed. Um, they were primarily men's ensembles, uh, although there were some mixed ensembles as well, but primarily glee clubs. And, and the oldest, uh, the Harvard Glee Club, is still a strictly tenor-based ensemble. There are no sopranos and altos in that ensemble. So that's, that's where the glee club comes from historically. Uh, so we are a sort of modern glee club, although that's not really our name. This is the Blue Hawk Singers, which is the audition choir here at DSU. We're going to sing for you first a song from the period. A lot of what you're going to see tonight is comparing what things were like back then to what things are like now. So we're going to start off with a song that was written in 1910. It's called The School Where Lincoln Went. Uh, this is one when I first was asked to prepare a glee club for this event. I thought, well, I got to do something that's from that period and maybe something that a glee club would have sung. So I started searching through the archives in the Theodore Roosevelt Center, and they, uh, one of the collections that they have is the Danny O. Crew Theodore Roosevelt Sheet Music Collection. And I found this song in there, and as you'll hear as we sing this to you, uh, it's a song that's very appropriate for, for this symposium this weekend. Um, I, I have to admit that I have tweaked it a little bit. Uh, there are a few changes that I've made that make it work a little bit better, because it was originally just a solo song. Uh, I have a feeling it's the kind of song that people would sing together, maybe with a drink or two in their hands. Um, and, but we, we, I've added some parts so that it's a little bit more like what maybe a glee club would, would have sung in those days. Um, I, the, the composer of this song is named Will Hardy, and if you know anything about the composer, not the basketball coach, the composer, Will Hardy, uh, if you know anything about him, I'd be curious to know, because I've not been able to find any information about a composer named Will Hardy. Uh, there are two other songs by him in the Theodore Roosevelt Center archives, um, but I can't find any information on him. Um, the last thing I'll say, and then we'll sing for you, um, this is a song I don't want to give it away. I want you to listen. I want you to, to get the message as we sing through it. Uh, but listen carefully at the end, because there's a little tweak that you might notice that we, we're having a little bit of fun with. Um, the, the one song that we'll sing for you at the very end of tonight's event um, is one that's more representative of what a glee club might sing nowadays. It's one that I'm sure you'll recognize, and so it needs no introduction. So this is the DSU Blue Hawk Singers pretending to be a glee club singing the school where Lincoln went.
Well, I don't know about you, but I'm filled with glee now. <laughs> so Ryan Swanson, you're a sports historian. Yes, sir. That's your field, and you have a special interest in our man, Theodore Roosevelt, and have published this remarkable book on that, The Strenuous Life. We're going to be seeing a wrestling exhibition next, so the wrestlers should come on up. Uh, but tell us a little bit about some background that will help us understand. Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, if I haven't met you, I'm Ryan Swanson. I'm a sports historian. As I told my grandmother before she passed away, that is a real thing. Um, so uh, really glad to be here and, and talk about sports and TR. Uh, when we think about wrestling, wrestling is among the oldest sports known to humankind. Um, it's been around a long time. It was part of the ancient Olympic Games. Oh, I can see what you're looking at here. Okay. Um, <laughs> Actually, when it was first contested in the ancient Olympic Games, they would have been wearing even less than they're wearing right now. Um, indeed, it was done in the nude uh, in the original ancient games, so we're not doing that tonight. Um, but uh, wrestling carried on from those ancient games and then was included with the, uh, the, the modern Olympic Games beginning in 1896. And when Theodore Roosevelt was president in 1904 and they had an Olympic Games here in the United States, wrestling was a big part of that. And the idea that was often talked about with wrestling, and we'll turn it over to you here soon, um, is the idea of strength, endurance, tactical ability. And so it's kind of bringing together this, um, those, those skills to see who comes out on top. And so, gentlemen. So, and R Roosevelt himself was a wrestler. That's correct. Yeah, uh, yeah I, thank you. Uh, Roosevelt, as a young man, wrestles uh, as he's trying to kind of gain his strength in his teen years. Um, and he continues wrestling really through his, through into his 50s. Um, and so he would invite people to the White House to grapple and wrestle. Um, very interested in the rules. He tried many different kinds of wrestling. Uh, and so was uh, absolutely um, a fan, a participant in wrestling. So just one more question, Ryan. This seems a little risque. Would women have been allowed? Absolutely not. Uh, so please, ladies. <laughs> wrestling is among the sports, and there's a pretty strong tradition in sports generally that genders were segregated when competing, whether it's wrestling or basketball, as we'll talk about in a bit. So we shall see. This, um, and, and I would say wrestling uh, in the modern games uh, was often, or during the time of, say, the 20th century, was viewed very much as for the participants, not for the fans. Um, so, unfortunately, guys, wrestling has never been a huge spectator sport um, in modern America. Maybe still, uh, but that's kind of its background. Thanks so much. So, Justin Schlecht, you're the coach. Give us a little sense of what we're about to see. Yeah, first I'll introduce, uh, so the, the two bare-chested in our research is, this is Con Spielman and Kyle Anderson, two of our seniors. Uh, both uh, both uh, TR, HLP, um, um, gentlemen, and then we have uh, the other two representing kind of uh, some modern, the modern time frame of wrestling would be Dylan Marlowe and Jack Simons. One of the, okay, one, one of the, one of the biggest differences that in, in some of our research and just checking in some of just our general knowledge is um, in 1909 or during that time frame, there was no periods, there was no um, scorekeeping, the rules were actually stated multiple times that the rules were left up to the referee or official's discretion. He would make any final decisions if he was like, yeah, that eye gouge is not okay. <laughs> then that eye gouge wasn't okay. But if the next one was okay, then he got the final say and nobody really argued. So um, that's one of the, probably the biggest and most interesting things. The other big difference would be, and um, we'll just have these two demonstrate, uh, we did the best we could with uh, rehearsing or kind of practicing what 1909 wrestling would look like in a staged setting. So you guys can kind of go, go ahead and I'll, I'll kind of roll. It was very rigid and not, um, yeah, not, re not real refined. So one of the big differences too was in 1909, it was a 10 minute match and one individual might pin the other individual and you continued to wrestle until 10 minutes was up. Who, whichever individual had the most pins in the 10 minutes, um, that's, that's who the winner was. So even though like in, in uh, our modern time wrestling, uh, once a pin happens, match is over. Um, 
Back then, you continued to wrestle as, as many uh, matches as you could. Are you two going to like join in, or we, so we can see 2022-ish with some freshmen? Don't go off the stage. <laughs> OK? Right? Sure. Um, obviously, we can see there's a very big difference between the two um, attires, those kind of things. Um, I think that another interesting, there's no points for a takedown, there's no points for an escape, there's no points for a near fall, reversals, any of those things in, um, in Theodore Roosevelt's time frame. Um, another interesting fact that we found was in 1912, is that in 1912 was the longest wrestling match in the history. And it was actually 11 hours and 40 minutes. So there was no pin ever that happened in the first 10 minutes. So they continued to have their match until a pin happened. And it was 11 hours and 40 minutes. And that was documented. So um, uh, for, for, for what we found. Um, I may be wrong on that. I am not a sports historian. So... Uh, You're a wrestler, though. So you, you would Yeah. Um, so just some, some interesting differences. Um, I guess as, as they're kind of going, you two can stop. <laughs> I'm making a lot of noise up here. So, like, a big difference here, we'll come kind of back and forth, and I want to, like, steal time. We start with that, so Michael, we start in a neutral position, and then we'll just go through, like, a takedown, escape, reversal. So, big difference here in modern times. Um, maybe we will gain some fans. We'll see. So, we'd have a two takedown for the top wrestler. The bottom wrestler would get out. We'd have an escape, and those points would add up, and then as the period, just keep going. As that period would continue, then we'd have a change of position, um, we'd have different scores happening, and at the end of the seven minutes of the match, three minute first period, two minute second period, two minute third period, that determines the winner. Um, if it's tied, then you do go into an overtime. The most an overtime currently can go to is 10 minutes. So you could, the longest match you can have currently would be 10 minutes in a folk style or collegiate match. If he pins him here, and we'll call that a pin, match is over, no matter where we're at. Now we'll have these two step out and you two can Catch your breath, if you will. Coach, can I ask a question here? Yeah. Uh, can you catch us up? There was a bit of a debate over the past few years about the Olympics changing what was going to be included. Are you up kind of on that, that story yep. in terms of wrestling? And then a, kind of a backlash? Um, is that... Is, ha, yeah, so, that. yeah, so freestyle was dropped from the Olympic Games. Um, Guys, you're gonna have to help me with that year. Was it 16? No, 16. Yeah. It was Rio, 12. So in so in 12, it was gonna get dropped, and then it was reinstated, kind of last minute, as as uh, FILA, which would be the international group that kind of supports wrestling, um, kind of rallied and supported the re um, the reinstatement into the Olympic Games. And obviously, one of the big arguments was wrestling was one of the very, very, very first. Um, sports or athletic events in the Olympic yeah. Games. Um, yeah. Really where the Olympics began was with grappling and wrestling with Spartans. Yeah. So there's wrestling in the Iliad, for example, which is one of the oldest pieces of literature, yeah. dates to around 9th century BCE. Yeah. So question about safety. I see the headgear, of course. <laughs> um, is wrestling safer today than it was in Roosevelt's time? Um, <laughs> I can't. I, I can't answer that question because uh, I never talked to anybody who wrestled in 1909. <laughs> Sorry, Clay. I got nothing for you. Like I've never visited with anybody. I, I don't know how many ACLs they blow out. I don't know how many. Uh, yeah. You're new to this. Just say yes. <laughs> um, but like you said, there were no set time periods in early wrestling, no kind of barriers in that way, no equipment to protect. Um, we know that much, right? So, yes. Um, so they did, they did have a roped off canvas, um, and it was a canvas. They, you know, sometimes they would say, and some, some looking up and, and some um, literature would say, like the canvas is actually a little bit softer, mm. and has, a, has a rebound to it than our current mats. Mm. I would say the other difference is, uh, no offense, Theodore, but the skill set was very different, mm. and the tech, the techniques were very different, and so understand, you know, the lifts and and the carries and some of the physical advantages. Obviously, training has changed and those kind of things. So a lot of that being changed, I would say, could be, yeah. you know, difficult. And and stratified weight classes come along. Yes, weight classes have come along. Um, there was 
remind me guys, like five? Yeah, I was going to say it was five. So it was broken up. I think the, the largest weight class stopped at 165, and then it was like 160, 165 pounds and up. Oh, okay. Was it 165? And then it was pretty much like 20 pound increments-ish. 121. 138, yeah. 145. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so there was five weight classes and it was broken up in that way. Now, like for collegiate wrestling, we have 10 weight classes. Um, and it's all the way from 125 pounds up to heavyweight. But there's a 197 pound weight class, so it's 198 pounds to 285 pounds would be the weight class <laughs> increments. Um, and in uh, FILA wrestling or international wrestling, freestyle wrestling, Greco-Roman, or freestyle we'll just speak of, there are eight weight classes for the Olympic Games and 10 for the World Team Championships, which is happening actually literally right now. Oh. Like right now. Um, you guys should go. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jordan Burroughs just actually won his seventh uh, World Championship for the U.S., and that makes him the most winningest world uh, uh, championship wrestler in, like, the history of ever. <laughs> yeah, so a quick difference. We'll, yeah. we'll, show, we'll show some 1909, and I'll kind of commentate a little bit, so go ahead, guys. Um, we'll imagine we have a running clock. Again, no points scored. Um, there would have been a lot of standing and pushing because they have 10 minutes to stand and push on each other. Um, and any time now, you two. Okay. Um, no points scored in this scenario. Locking hands in this position in 1909 would have been completely allowed. Um, in hours, that would be a penalty point. Um, we'd have no change. Uh, we watched a couple, we found a couple random films and a ref would randomly just step in and just uh, separate them and say like, okay, fresh start. There's a uh, very interesting rules. Uh, the officials had a lot of freedom in, um, in that time period that we kind of really found the most of our research. So we'll simulate here, we're, we're at minute seven, we have one pin, so we start fresh, that's a pin, that gets one pin for, for Kyle, but we continue to wrestle the match until we are at the end of 10 minutes. We can, we can hurry up and demo this next pin, you two. <laughs> and we have another pin by Khan, now we are tied. Woo! Nobody expected that, right? Uh, <laughs> But we continue to wrestle, and if it's 1912, we could wrestle for 11 hours and 40 minutes or until, <laughs> until the tie is broken or until we are finished. So I, I guess uh, if we have any other questions or any comments from Clay or uh, anybody else. Are there penalties and can you be disqualified? In this time frame, um, the, the big rule is whatever the ref decides. So yes, you're out. <laughs> And you win. Good job. <laughs> like, that's a, the rule book. Uh, so was it 19, like it was like 1922 or 2024? 20, was it when the first rule book? 27. 27. First rule book for wrestling was like written. Okay. Um, yeah. Tell us again the names of our four participants. Jack Simonson, Dylan Marlowe, Kyle Anderson, and Con Steelman. Justin Schlecht and the VSU wrestling team, thank you. Roll up your mats. All right, I'm just going to take a minute so you ladies can calm down just a little. Look. So the, the robists, please join us. But Ryan, what did you see? Yeah, I saw a really physically uh, fatiguing sport, right? A lot of strategy, which I'm sure us novices didn't pick up. Um, but as Coach said, the rules were, especially during Roosevelt's time, really up for discussion. Um, and so I don't think wrestling is that different than many early sports at the turn of the 20th century, when one thing you always had to do was figure out which set of rules are we playing by. Um, and so I think uh, you kind of see that uh, with, this, with this wrestling exhibition here. So that's uh, the first of our three. So now roping, and we have with us uh, three ropists, Gavin Leppert, Clay Schmaltz, and Hannah Labrie. Uh, so Gavin, and by the way, from Gavin's from Edgeley, uh, Clay is from Bowman, and Hannah is from Ikalaka, one of the great places on the Great Plains. So 
Gavin, tell us what we're about to see here. We're going to put on a little bit of a roping demonstration, I guess. Uh, I guess the history of roping, I'm supposed to say, um, all started from ranching. Uh, a lot of places, especially in uh, Roosevelt's time, he was uh, really big in the ranching industry and influenced North Dakota quite a bit. There's a lot of history of his ranching and everything out in the Badlands, South of Medora. Um, so the roping comes into play in ranching. Back in the day, they didn't have uh, a lot of facilities. You're on an open range, and uh, if you had something sick or something you had to do to it, doctor them. You had to rope them, and then eventually that turned into cowboys getting bored and making a competition of it, and that's where team roping and calf roping comes from. Uh, in the go to our rodeo, you're going to see three different uh, roping events. You're going to see the team roping, the breakaway roping, and the calf roping. And the breakaway roping and the calf roping go hand in hand. Breakaway is more for women in the senior event, and that's what Hannah just did, right? That's Hannah LeBrie. She just demonstrated uh, breakaway roping to an extent. Um, if you see on the end of her rope, she's got like a ribbon or something on it, and you tie like a thin piece of string and it breaks away from the horn. But when the, in the men's calf roping, they would uh, have it tied off to their saddle horn and they would um, get off and then tie that calf down. But, so yeah. And misses happen a lot. Um, there's people who've won, you know, $500,000 a year and win a world championship and they still miss a bunch. We actually just taught her how to do it yesterday, so <laughs> round of applause for just being able to swing it that good. I think, uh, good job. So before we move on, thank, thank you, Anna. Uh, Gavin, so growing up on a ranch or farm, when do you start doing this? At what age do people, young people start doing this? I've seen little kids um, that can swing a rope pretty good before they can pee straight. Like, it's <laughs> young kids. There is no age limit to any of this. If they can swing a rope, they're good to go. What, what is the pee straight here? I've never had a child, I can <laughs> tell you. <laughs> I'd say, I mean, I've seen a two-year-old run around with a rope before. <laughs> I'm not saying they're any good at it, but. So what are we gonna see next? All right, so next we got Clay Schmals. He's actually on the DSU rodeo team here. Um, and he is a header. This is the team roping event. And uh, so you got two people. You got a, a header and a healer. Header needs to have a legal head catch, which is either around the horns or neck them. And um, we'll see what he does here. See, that's what you want, I guess. A good head catch. And then um, a healer would come in, and th their goal is to catch two feet. I'm actually not a roper. <laughs> You're not, not a roper. OK. Hey, hey, oh, how about that? Show that, show us that one again. <laughs> the fluke. you have to go then and do that triple thing and tie it? I'd be the cat from it. Okay. All right, so that was cool. Really nice. So what else you got? You're going to do tricks now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> One trick. We were, we were promised six tricks. <laughs> Show us some tricks.
Understand it. So this roping is, of course, part of the, the work. Right. You have to uh, you have a sick calf, or you have to separate something and get a branding. So, but during there's a lot of leisure time, and so then people are messing around with ropes and they learn tricks. Isn't that how it works? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> uh, thanks for that full answer. Uh, so, but. I mean, there are eight or nine different tricks that some people can do, and you know, Will Rogers was a famous trick ropist, and you've probably seen some at rodeos, and it's some pretty amazing art, isn't it? Yeah, there's a lot of different tricks. Um, yeah, like what he's doing, the butterfly, uh, you can do the wedding ring, which is where it's, I mean, I can kind of do that, but I'd probably mess it up three times before I got it right. Oh my God. <laughs> All right, we got that. <laughs> Just give it a shot, you know? Yeah. We're a very forgiving audience. Aren't these guys great? This is so yeah. cool, you know. Well, actually, let me say, while he's getting ready here, um, this really is helpful for me. My father talked, and still talks about getting lassoed out of the crowd by Lash LaRue. Um, and this is just helpful because this is giving me like an image to see what he was talking about. So, would you, would you be um, willing to be lassoed out of the crowd? I mean, whatever I need to do. I mean, I don't know. You know, you've already but, given your talk. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm on extra time. Here. All right, Gavin, let's see what you got here. Five, ten, whatever you need. <laughs> Look at this! Oh! Hey ho! Hey ho! Ho ho! Ho! I mean, you obviously no. have more tricks than we know. <laughs> That's pretty good. Did, did you want me to say something about frontier sports? Yes, please. Well, so yeah. um, while you're getting ready for your next uh, trick, one, um, one thing that was really common in the western part of the United States was to have state fairs or territorial fairs. And at those fairs, all kinds of things were happening, right? Including, you know, since we're talking sports in this symposium, baseball competitions, um, that kind of thing. Um, but alongside, almost always was rodeo and roping as well. So you could very well, you know, get your fair food, which wasn't quite the way we think of it now, go to a baseball match, and then go see some roping um, in these state fairs. And so that would have been common during the early Roosevelt era. And incidentally, I'm going to work in that young enough till he couldn't pee straight into my into my life at some point. Maybe my next faculty meeting or something. So thank you for that. I'm more at the can't still pee straight. You know? <laughs> one, more, one more shot. All right. Oh, you, you can't be nervous. There we go. Hey. Hey ho, hey ho. There we go. All right. Now, come on up. Come on back. So I want to ask you each a question. So you are from Bowman, and a, we have a rodeo program here. And what's your plan after you graduate? Uh, start my own business in pro rodeo. You're going to be in pro rodeo? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Team roping. Team roping. And you do that all the time. Yep. How long have you been at it? Uh, I started using a rope when I was four. and started roping off a horse when I was eight. Yeah. And you're Ikalaka. Uh, Roosevelt went to Ikalaka. He loved it. So what happens after you graduate? Um, I'll probably go home to the ranch and use these skills there. Be a rancher. Probably. Uh, Black Angus and Hereford. What year are you? I'm a junior. Yep. 
You've had great fun and a good sport, I think. Good sport. Um, so you're from Edgeley, which is not really in classical ranch country. What happens to you after this? Um, well, this is actually my last semester here at DSU. I kind of made that myself. I, um, this spring, I'll be moving to Oklahoma for farrier school. Yeah, to get certified in horseshoeing and blacksmithing. And Where do you want to live? I don't, I don't know yet. Actually, no. no. <laughs> well, hopefully not even in this state. Oh. Whoa. Maybe a little different. Not, they'd be in the western side, yeah. Where, western. Where did North Dakota, where would you be? Um, I like the grasslands north of Belfield. Wait, hold up. I didn't listen very well to that. <laughs> Restate your question. If you weren't, you said maybe not in North Dakota. Where other, what other states might you visit? Oh yeah, definitely like, like Wyoming, maybe Nevada. I like Nevada. New Mexico. Hey, hey. <laughs> From New Mexico. A round of applause for our great Ropers. Thank you, guys. That was cool. That was cool. Absolutely. That was really cool. I thought you were going to have me roped. I wanted, I wanted that. Yikes. All right, so uh, now we're going to do basketball. So, ladies, come on up. Come on up. So Clay and I are wearing what we thought referees might look like. Um, this came out of the costume bin here at DSU, so thank you for that. So, Eric, are you here? Hey. There he is. Eric Nelson, basketball coach. Tell us what we're going to see here. <laughs> okay, we're going to try our best um, to show you what women's basketball looked like in, in 1905. Um, what you'll notice is um, each team has six. So it's three on three half court. So you'll notice we'll have a, a red team going against the yellow team. So it's three on three half court. Um, a make or miss basket, you'll see the officials actually grab the basketball. After that, they'll hand it to the, um, the next team at half court and then obviously go the other direction. So you will see no transitional basketball um, in 1905. Um, defense was completely different back then. Um, now if you watch a game, obviously defense is very intense, it's physical, um, steal, uh, you go for steals, all those types of things. In 1905, um, defense was kind of like what we call it, it's a shadow. You couldn't touch the ball, um, there, you couldn't touch the, the opposing team, um, you're pretty much just shadowing them, which is obviously very, very different from um, what you would see today. Um, some of the different rules um, we talked about, depending on what time frame yeah. you're looking at, um, one or two dribbles max. Um, there was no bounce passing, it was all kind of underhand, kind of not, you won't see a two-handed chess pass in 1905, I'll put it to you that way. Um, so the, obviously the rules are very different, um, just, just from a, um, you know, a low-level part of it, um, lo lots of different things. Um, we also talked about their, their attire, um, just, we talked a little bit how, obviously right now you can kind of see some skin, back then um, there would be no skin whatsoever, it was kind of frowned upon as, as a female um, to show any skin at, at any point in time, so obviously You'll see a little bit about that here, um, but in that time, you would not see that. Um, obviously, it's today we wear jerseys, shorts, those types of things. Um, you can see that they're wearing um, bloomers. We're, we're underneath. Um, that's kind of what they're wearing here. And then obviously, like the um, color, long colored uh, sleeves here. So um, that's just kind of a brief things that are different and things that have changed. So this will be a relatively brief. We won't do a full game. but. You get one point per basket. We have Team Yellow and Team Red. And Daniel keeping score? Daniel's yeah. keeping score, so we'll, but the, we have to tell you when there's a point. You can't assume it. That's um, our job. There would be no men in this auditorium, and certainly oh. no men as the um, referees. No, no. Did, Daisy, do you want to? I think no. Well, yes. Here. <laughs> well, I think somebody should set the referees. Yes. Yes, yes, come on up. Oh. Good evening, everyone. So the only people who should really be up here on this stage besides the basketball players are me and Danielle. Because in 
Theodore Roosevelt's era, when women began to play basketball in elite women's colleges on the East Coast, women's sports were for women only. They were played before women, they were played by women, they were coached by women, there were no men allowed. So while it is true that you're seeing skin here, I hope you're not too shocked. Uh, in Roosevelt's era, they would have on black tights, and they were cotton, and there was no elastic then, so they'd have been held up by garters underneath the bloomers, which wouldn't look like this, because these are scandalous bloomers, because you can see their shapes. And in Roosevelt's era, the bloomers would have been poofed out much more, so that when they stood there, you would have looked like they were sort of like in a big, sort of shorter skirt. But this was so freeing for women who spent their days in corsets, laced up tightly to give them that hourglass shape. So one of the great things about women's sports when basketball became um, allowable for women was the freedom that women had to move about, to breathe deep to the bottom of their lungs, and to run, and to jump, and to play, and to, uh, in a sense, transgress by taking men's territory, uh, at least in their own. So, these women who look terrific tonight, and uh, if they were in 1905, their hair wouldn't have been down, wouldn't pile up on top of their heads, but I wasn't going to make these women do that. Um, <laughs> and their shirts are probably a little bit close too, but we're, we're, we're getting close. So these modern shoes they're wearing, we did have a last, um, we did have rubber in Roosevelt's era, but we didn't have it on the bottoms of shoes. They would have had on leather boots that would have um, come up like high top sneakers would have. So, they're looking really good, they know how to play the game. I just think it's important that you all know that men would not have been in the audience. So just like women would have to leave for the wrestling, men would have to leave for this. And you two... <clears throat> Absolutely out. ...who have volunteered kindly to uh, be referees for this game, they wouldn't be here either. It was all a woman's domain. Well, we'd let you do it if you'd rather. <laughs> <laughs> So just a couple more things. Thank you, Stacey. Um, thanks to Ty Orton and the foundation, we have an authentic period basketball. It does actually bounce a little, so we'll be playing with that. It has the same tie as um, a football. So this is authentic in its way. Um, you can only shoot with one hand. No jump shots, no two-handed shots, one hand only. At one point, you couldn't bounce at all, then you could bounce once, now you can bounce twice in this sport. The defenders have to stay on their end on each side. We are the referees, there are no fouls because there's no touching. But if we see some untoward behavior, we'll be escorting one of these young ladies off the court. And we have whistles. They did give us whistles. We're not afraid to use them. So let's, let's play basketball, shall we? All right, here we go. Oh, okay. You got it? All right, so the ball then would come up to the yellow. There's no rebound to give any sort. It would be brought to the other. You're on offense, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, just making sure. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so play. So there's no transition. The ball has to be brought by the referee in this version to half court to restart the game. Hey! One point for yellow. So the scoring for the first 20 years or so of basketball is one point for a field goal um, because when the foul shot is put in, when fouls start happening, then there starts to be the differentiation. So um, one point. <laughs> yeah. Oh, one point. Yeah. So 
I look back at some box scores the other night, uh, if you will, uh, and, and common score, seven to five, nine to three, um, so relatively difficult to score in some of the early games. And a box score would be, that's, that's the wrong term, but some scores I found. Ooh, ooh, ooh excuse me. It's all right, we'll say it went out of bounds, so it goes back to the other team. See why there was no TV contract. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so as the game is played, there's this tension between these athletes and it, it competing, but always a concern about being ladylike. Um, and so any physical play is seen as unladylike, um, being overly competitive. Uh, and so th there's this kind of really awkward dance that has to happen. Um, but the doors were often locked, uh, audience kept out, and so I do think it was a competitive game. Uh, as, as it developed uh, right from the start. And some of the rules are put in place because as girls begin playing the game in 1892, it gets very competitive, and so then um, reformers want to bring it back. This game could be played in a church, uh, you know, like a fellowship hall, a cafeteria, um, any space that could be controlled uh, would, would be used. Hopefully a little bigger than this. Sorry, I was, you were going to say something? I was going to say, and by the way, this was the girl. Oh! Oh! oh. And this. When Maysmith invented basketball, he used peach baskets. Oh, you need your mic. I'll use yours. <laughs> you want to lean in? Um, uh, there you go. All right. All right. There you go, you're Sorry in. Sorry about that. When Naismith invented the game, he was, as you, some of you heard this morning, trying to create an indoor game. And he thought, well, if I just hang a basket, like a peach basket up, the people will attempt to um, get it in that basket. And then he realized that every time a point was scored, somebody had to climb up and retrieve the ball, which Ryan has gracefully agreed to do. Well, I right, got somebody right, much coach. more qualified than me. Um, so can you close it up now? Yep. There's a, yeah. So he realized, oh, if you cut a hole in the bottom of the basket, this is going to be more fun. <laughs> and so that's how the game evolved. Progress. Right there. Progress. Well, and it went, from, it went from somebody doing what Coach just did, getting up on a ladder, and then the next step was, as you might guess, like find a broom and hit it out of the peach basket, and then it was cut the bottom out, and so they kind of realized this is not sustainable. And then they came to fiber or metal. Yeah, yeah. So let's go to five, shall we? Because okay. Because we want to end by midnight. Okay, whoa. <laughs> Trash talk. <laughs> Aren't you? So two to one, huh? Do you? It's yellow. Well done. Point yellow. They're kicking you. They're beating Three to you. one. Uh, the number of yeah. players on the court varied from five to 11. So sometimes you had 11 on 11 with all these different segmented court situations. Yeah. Ooh, she thought about it. Oh, the yellow ball. So yeah, you can play at full-ish yeah, ace for this way. size. Do something terrible. <laughs> oh. oh! That Sorry. cannot be allowed, <laughs> can it? Too much dribbling, too, too much rigorous, ball goes to the other side. Ball on both sides because there was, there was oh. an attack. Oh. <laughs> there was so we go assault. back to the wrestling coach's principle that we decide? Is that? I think, let's just say each side committed some errors here. Okay. Be better. Be better. <laughs> hey ho! Point red. All right, let's see some action. Uh, jump balls at center court were a way the basketball moved. So after a basket, you would see that sometimes as well. So we're playing kind of one version of an early game. Ooh. Oh, that was close. Yellow could rebound its own miss. 
uh, and, and continue playing just as a... As Notice a, that the referee cannot just throw it. It has to hand it to the young lady. <laughs> Scintillating. <laughs> No shot clock, needless to say. Oh, yeah. Going red. Going red. Right. Was there a layup? Yeah. Well, backboards were not a given. Right. So early on in the game, it was just the hoop itself. Then there was much discussion among rule makers about if a backboard was fair, um, how that should be. So a layup comes along when backboards are for sure. So it's, uh, what, three to three? Three to three. It's a nail biter. <laughs> My nails have been growing. <laughs> oh! All right. Incidentally, you sometimes hear basketball players referred to as cagers. It's because they would put something here when playing up elevated, so this would be a nice spot for that, you know? Something to think about, DSU. Oh! Point red! Next point wins. Next point wins. Did you tell them about the cash Next prize? Next point wins. It's all right. Oh, it was your own teammate. So no three seconds to the key uh, either, so no foul shooting yet. decided maybe at the beginning how long they were playing for, uh, for the teams. Uh-oh! Uh -oh. Oh. Infraction! <laughs> I forgot you had a win. Oh, there we go. This feels tense. <laughs> Okay, oh. Oh! oh! Thank you. A round of applause. The yellow team. All right, so. Thank you. So, so, I know we only have this small, but Eric, do you think that just for a couple of minutes they could sort of show us a little bit of what it looks like today? Yeah. All right, who's going to do this? Maybe like, do, do you think it's better to do like, how many... Oh no. Let's see what they can do. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to lose anybody off the side. Um, Our liability is up to date. Okay. Clay says. Play ball. So, should we say the first team to. Six. Six? But by two points. Two by points. two pointers. All right, so we're in the modern era. First, first team to two points. Other than the fact the ball doesn't bounce very well. All right, we'll see what they got. Oh, okay. Wow, this is nervous. Don't. Oh! Oh, jump ball. Jump ball. Jump ball. All right. Oh! Uh, 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 uh. Already blew the whistle. Off. All right, go ahead, Red. Oh, oh yeah. Thank you. 
for that? Two zero? She's down on the job. <laughs> Stuck in the 20th century. Oh, okay! That's legal! Oh, that was double dribble. Yeah, well. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That's right, so. Oh yeah. Oh! And a rebound. Oh! Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh! Oh yeah! Oh! Man, what's wrong with these hoops? Yes, sir. Oh! Sub in! I think they were better in 1905. <laughs> All right, game in, game on. Game on. It's a little crowded on this court, that's for sure. Oh yeah. Oh. Oh. Tremendous sports yes. to do this. Thanks for being willing to do this. Tell us a little bit about these young women and your team. Yeah, um, obviously we have a, a great group of girls. Um, when we talked to them uh, a couple weeks ago about what they were going to do, I think they were a little skeptical about <laughs> a performance and being on stage, but um, they came for the practice on Tuesday night, did a great job, um, had fun with it. Um, and I think it's sometimes it's it's nice to know how your the game is involved. I don't think most of them even knew that it was six on six. So just learning about basketball and learning about how far we've came um, since since obviously 1905. And obviously this is uh, the 50th year anniversary of Title IX. So obviously um, you've seen a lot of the women's uh, sports have been in the news this past uh, couple months because of that. Um, but no, we have a we have a great group of girls and they did awesome and I'm I'm proud of them. So thank you. They were great. So, when's your first game? Uh, October 28th. Where? Uh, in, in Omaha, Nebraska. So our first home game, November 18th. Okay, so here's my, you know, you could take this or leave this. But what if you appeared like this in Omaha? <laughs> and then, like, beat the living daylights out of them. This, this would get national attention. Might be the end of your career, but <laughs> thanks. I do. Thanks, everyone. You were terrific. Yeah. We appreciate it. Thanks to Stacey, too. All right, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, thank you. as we close the evening, hasn't thank this you. been fun? You probably haven't noticed that this is completely unrehearsed. So, um, so Brent, one more time with the DSU Glee Club.
Everyone, we'll see you tomorrow. What a great day. Thanks to all of you. You were fantastic.